Section One of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Introduction Considering the great antiquity and the unfading popularity of the magic art, it seems at first sight a matter of wonder that its literature should be so extremely scanty. In England, in particular, this is the case. Until within the last few years it would have been difficult to name a single book worth reading upon this subject. The whole literature of the art consisting of single chapters in books written for the amusement of youth, which were chiefly remarkable for the unanimity with which each copied without acknowledgment from its predecessors, and handbooks sold at the entertainments of various public performers, who took care not to reveal therein any trick which they deemed worthy of performance by themselves. Upon a little consideration, however, the scarcity of treatises on white magic is easily accounted for. The more important secrets of the art have been known but to few, and those few have jealously guarded them knowing that the more closely they concealed the clue to their mysteries, the more would those mysteries be valued. Indeed, the more noted conjurers of fifty years ago strove to keep the secret of their best tricks not only from the outside world, but from their confrères. At the present day the secrets of the art are not so well kept, and there is hardly a trick performed upon the stage which the amateur may not, at a sufficient expenditure of shillings or guineas, procure at the conjuring depots. There being, therefore, no longer the same strict secrecy, the literature of magic has improved a little, though it leaves much to be desired. The general ambition of compilers seems to be to produce books containing nominally some fabulous number of tricks. In order to do this, they occupy two-thirds of their space with chemical and arithmetical recreations, and as a necessary result, the portion devoted to conjuring tricks properly so called, is treated so briefly and scantily as to be practically useless. There is a vast difference between telling how a trick is done and teaching how to do it. The existing treatises, with few exceptions, do the former only. The intention of the present work is to do the latter also, to teach sleight of hand generally, as well as particular tricks and to conduct the neophyte from the very a b c of the magic art gradually up to those marvels which are exhibited on the public stage the student may rest assured that if he will diligently follow the instructions here given he will be able in due time not merely to astonish his friends extempore with a borrowed coin or a pack of cards but to roll two rabbits into one compel chosen cards to rise spontaneously from the pack, produce lighted lanterns from empty hats, and bowls of goldfish from empty pocket-handkerchiefs. In a word, to execute all those wonders which he has hitherto deemed the exclusive property of the public performer. There are, of course, different degrees of natural aptitude. Non quivis ominum contigit adir corinthum. It is not every one that can be a Robert Houdin or Bautier. But given the usual number of fingers and thumbs, fair intelligence, and a sufficiency of perseverance, any one, who will, may become at least a tolerable conjurer. Be it remembered that we especially stipulate for perseverance. A wizard is not to be made in a day, and he who would attain excellence must be content to proceed as he would with music, drawing, or any other accomplishment, viz. begin at the beginning and practice diligently until he attains the coveted dexterity. The student need not, however, wait the termination of the somewhat formidable course of study we have indicated before he begins to astonish his friends. On the contrary, there are numerous tricks requiring very little manual dexterity, which are yet, if neatly performed, brilliant in effect. These simpler tricks, for which we shall give full instructions, will supply the beginner, even at the outset, with a fair program, which he may, from time to time, enlarge as he feels able to undertake more elaborate illusions. The first rule to be borne in mind by the aspirant is this. Never tell your audience beforehand what you are going to do. If you do so, you at once give their vigilance the direction which it is most necessary to avoid, 
and increase tenfold the chances of detection. We will give an illustration. There is a very good trick, which will be described at length hereafter, in which the performer, after borrowing a handkerchief, gives it to someone to hold. When it is returned it proves to be torn into small pieces. It is again handed to the holder, who is instructed, in order to restore it, to rub it in a particular manner, but when again unfolded it is found in a long strip. These effects are produced by successive adroit substitutions, and the whole magic of the trick consists in the concealment of the particular moment at which each substitution is effected. Now if you were to announce to the audience beforehand that you were about to cause the handkerchief to appear in several pieces, or in a long strip, they would at once conjecture that the trick depended on an exchange, and their whole vigilance being directed to discover the moment of that exchange, you would find it all but impossible to perform the trick without detection. If, on the other hand, you merely roll up the handkerchief and ask someone to hold it, the audience, not knowing what you are about to do, have no reason to suspect that you have handed him a substitute, and when the transformation is exhibited, the opportunity of detection will have already passed away. It follows, as a practical consequence of this first rule, that you should never perform the same trick twice on the same evening. The best trick loses half its effect on repetition, but besides this the audience know precisely what is coming, and have all their faculties directed to find out at what point you cheated their eyes on the first occasion. It is sometimes hard to resist an encore, but a little tact will get you out of the difficulty, especially if you have studied as every conjurer should do, the variation and combination of tricks. There are a score of different ways of vanishing a given article, and as many of reproducing it, and either one of the first may be used in conjunction with either of the second. Thus by varying either the beginning or the end, you make the trick to some extent a new one. The power of doing this readily is very useful and among other advantages will enable you to meet an encore by performing some other trick having some element of similarity to that which you have just completed, but terminating in a different and therefore unexpected manner. The student must cultivate from the outset the art of talking, and especially the power of using his eyes and his tongue independently of the movement of his hands. To do this it will be necessary to prepare beforehand not only what he intends to do, but what he intends to say, and to rehearse frequently and carefully even the simplest trick before attempting it in public. It is surprising how many little difficulties are discovered on first attempting to carry into effect even the clearest written directions, and nothing but practice will overcome these difficulties. The novice may be encouraged by assuming, as he safely may, that the most finished of popular performers was once as awkward as himself and were he to attempt any unfamiliar feat, would probably be as awkward still. Before proceeding to the practice of the magic art, it will be well to give a short description of two or three appliances, which are of such constant use that they may be said to form the primary stock in trade of every conjurer. These are a short wand, a specially adapted table, and certain secret pockets in the magician's dress. There are numerous other appliances of very general use, which will be explained in due course, but those we have named are so indispensable that we could hardly complete the description of half a dozen tricks of any pretension without a reference to one or other of them. First in order comes the magic wand. This is a light rod of twelve to fifteen inches in length and about three-quarters of an inch in diameter. It may be of any material and decorated in any manner which the fancy of the owner may dictate. To the uninitiated its use may appear a mere affectation, but such is by no means the case. Apart from the prestige derived from the traditional properties of the wand, and its use by the wizards of all ages, it affords a plausible pretext for many necessary movements, which would otherwise appear awkward and unnatural and would thereby arouse the vigilance of the audience at possibly the most critical period of the trick. Thus, if the performer desires to hold anything concealed in his hand, by holding the wand in the same hand he is able to keep it closed without exciting suspicion. If it is necessary, as frequently happens, to turn his back upon the audience for an instant, 
the momentary turn to the table in order to take up or lay down the wand affords the required opportunity we most strongly advise the would-be magician to cultivate from the outset the habitual use of the wand even where its employment is not absolutely necessary for the purpose of the trick its use is in strict accordance with the character he professes to fill and the dainty touch of the wand for the supposed purpose of operating a magical transformation assists materially in leading the audience to believe that such transformation did actually take place at that particular moment instead of having been as is really the case secretly effected at an earlier period the next appliance to which we must draw the student's attention is the magician's table there are plenty of good minor tricks which may be performed anywhere and with little or no previous preparation but as soon as the student has outgrown these humbler feats and aspires to amuse his friends or the public with a prearranged seance his first necessity will be a proper table we do not now refer to the elaborate combination of traps pistons etc which is used for stage performances this will be duly described in its proper place the table necessary for an average drawing-room exhibition differs from an ordinary table in two points only its height which should be six or eight inches greater than that of an ordinary table and the addition of a hidden shelf or ledge at the back its form and dimensions are very much a matter of fancy and convenience for most purposes nothing is better than a plain oblong deal table it should have turned legs of some harder wood stained and polished and these if it is desired to make the table portable should be screwed into the four corners so as to be readily taken off and put on again as may be required in length the table may be three to four feet and in breadth eighteen inches to two feet three feet by twenty inches is a very convenient size at the back should be placed about six inches below the level of the top of the table a projecting shelf six to eight inches in width and extending nearly from end to end this shelf which is technically known as the servante should be covered with thick woolen cloth in order to deaden the sound of any object falling on it some performers have a rim about half an inch high running along the outer edge of this shelf while others in place of the shelf use a wooden tray fixed in the same position and one to two inches in depth the manner of fixing the shelf is optional in some tables it is made to slide in and out like a drawer in others to fold up on hinges against the back of the table or itself to form the back this latter is the most convenient mode as the opening made by the flap when let down gives access to the interior of the table which forms a convenient receptacle for necessary articles in this case the upper part of the table is made box fashion in other words is bottomed throughout with wood on a level with the hinges of the servante giving an enclosed space under the whole extent of the table over the table should be thrown an ordinary cloth table cover of such a size as to hang down about ten or fifteen inches at the front and sides but not more than an inch or so on the side away from the audience to prevent its slipping the cloth may be fastened on this side with a couple of drawing pins where traps are used and the cloth is therefore to be cut the hanging cloth is dispensed with and the table is covered with cloth glued on the top with a margin round it after the fashion of a card table and this may be done if preferred even where the table is without mechanism the adoption of this plan allows of the introduction of gold mouldings or other ornamentation on the front and sides in our own opinion unless there is some special reason to the contrary in the mechanical arrangements of the table the plain hanging cover is preferable as being least suggestive of apparatus or preparation the precise height of the table is best determined by the stature of the performer the servante or hidden shelf should be just so high from the ground as to be level with the knuckles of the performer as his arm hangs by his side and the top of the table should as already stated be about six inches higher than this it will be found that this height will enable the performer secretly to take up or lay down any article thereon without stooping or bending the arm either of which movements would suggest to the spectators that his hand was occupied in some manner behind the table one of the first tasks of the novice should be to acquire the power of readily picking up 
or laying down any article on the savant, without making any corresponding movement of the body, and especially without looking down at his hands. If the performer is uncertain as to the precise whereabouts of a given article, he must ascertain it by a quick glance as he approaches his table, and not after he has placed himself behind it. From this moment he must not again look down, as if once the audience suspect that he has a secret receptacle behind his table, half the magic of his tricks is thenceforth destroyed. An oblong box, twelve or fourteen inches in length by three in depth, well padded with wadding, and placed on the servante, will be found very useful in getting rid of small articles, such as coin, oranges, etc., as such articles may be dropped into the box without causing any sound, and therefore without attracting attention. In default of a table regularly made for the purpose, the amateur may, with little difficulty, adapt an ordinary table for use as a makeshift. A common library or kitchen table having a drawer on one side, and raised on four bricks or blocks of wood to the requisite height, will answer the purpose very fairly. The table must be covered with a cloth, and should have the drawer pulled out about six inches, the drawer side being, of course, away from the audience, to form the servant. A still better extempore conjuring table may be manufactured in a few minutes with the aid of a good-sized folding bagatelle board. Place the shut-up board on a card or writing table, which should be six or eight inches shorter than the board, in such manner that there may be left behind it, on the side which is intended to be farthest from the audience, a strip of table six or seven inches in width. This will form the servant. Throw an ordinary cloth table cover over the bagatelle board, letting it hang down a foot or eighteen inches in front, and tucking its opposite edge under the hinder edge of the board, whose weight will prevent it from slipping. If the cloth is too large, it must be folded accordingly before placing it on the table. The table thus extemporized will be of a convenient height, and will answer very fairly for the purposes of an ordinary drawing-room performance. The conjurer, however, may be called upon to give a sample of his art when neither regular nor extemporized table is available, and even where he is sufficiently provided in this respect, he will frequently have occasion to produce or get rid of a given article without retiring behind his table to do so. The wizards of a century ago met this necessity by wearing openly in front of them a sort of bag or apron, called in the parlance of the French conjurers a uh, gibissière, from its supposed resemblance to a game-bag. This was used not only to carry the cups and balls, and other minor paraphernalia of the art, but for the purpose of procuring, exchanging, or getting rid of any small article at the pleasure of the performer. In fact, this bag supplied the place of the servant, which was not then known. It is hardly necessary to observe that the gibissière has been long since disused, and a performer who should now appear in a pocketed apron would run much risk of being taken for a hairdresser. Although, however, the gibissière is not now, as of old, worn openly, the conjurer of the present day is provided with certain secret substitutes, to explain which it is necessary to say a few words as to the magician's dress. It is not very many years since the orthodox dress of the conjurer was a long and flowing robe, embroidered more or less with hieroglyphic characters, and giving ample space for the concealment of any reasonable-sized article, say from a warming-pan downwards. The very last specimen of such a garment, to the best of our belief, is or was worn by the magician attached to the Crystal Palace. We do not know whether he is compelled by the regulations of the establishment to wear such a robe, but if so it ought to be liberally considered in his salary. The costume de rigueur of the magician of the present day is ordinary evening dress. The effect of the feats performed is greatly heightened by the close fit and comparative scantiness of such a costume, which appears to allow no space for secret pockets or other place of concealment. In reality, however, the magician is provided with two special pockets, known as profonde, placed in the tails of his dress coat. Each is from four to six inches in depth and seven in width, and the opening, which is across the inside of the coat tail, slanting slightly downwards from the centre to the side, is, like the servant, so placed as to be just level with the knuckles of the performer, as his hand hangs by his side, 
he can thus by the mere action of dropping either hand to his side let fall any article instantly into the profond on that side or take anything from thence in like manner the action is so natural that it may be used under the very eyes of the audience at very small risk of their observing it and if the performer at the same moment slightly turns his other side to the spectators he may be perfectly secure from detection some performers have also a couple of pochettes small pockets made in the trousers one behind each thigh these are generally used for purposes of production only the profonde being still employed for getting rid of any article which indeed is their primary purpose for they were originally made too deep profonde whence their name to get articles easily out of them many professors in addition to the pockets above mentioned have also a spacious pocket opening perpendicularly inside the breast of the coat under each arm for the purpose of what is called loading in other words bringing a rabbit or other article into a hat etc other pockets may be added as the fancy or invention of the performer may dictate but the above are those generally used it will also be found a great convenience to have an elastic band about an inch in width stitched around the lower edge of the waistcoat on the inside when the waistcoat is in wear the band makes it pressed tightly round the waist and any object of moderate size a card or pack of cards a handkerchief etc may be slipped under it without the least risk of falling used in conjunction with the pockets before described this elastic waistband offers a means of instantaneously effecting changes of articles too large to be palmed with safety one hand dropping the genuine article into the profond on that side while the other draws the prepared substitute from under the waistband a very slight turn of the body towards the table or otherwise sufficing to cover the movement with these few preliminary observations we proceed to the practice of the art commencing with the ever popular class of illusions performed by the aid of playing cards end of section one Section two of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Little T. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring, by Professor Louis Hoffman. General principles of sleight of hand applicable to card tricks. Part one. Among the various branches of the conjurer's art, none will better repay the labor of the student, whether artist or amateur, than the magic of cards. It has the special advantage of being, in a great measure, independent of time and place. The materials for half its mysteries are procurable at five minutes' notice in every home circle and even in the case of those tricks for which specially prepared cards etc are requisite the necessary appliances cost little and are easily portable two virtues not too common in magical apparatus further the majority of card tricks are dependent mainly on personal address and dexterity and as such will always be highly esteemed by connoisseurs in the art before very large audiences indeed the spectators being at a distance from the performer much of the effect of a card trick is lost which is probably the reason that of late years tricks of this class with a few exceptions have been rather neglected by professors and that many feats which in the times of conus and comment were numbered among the sensations of the day are now almost entirely forgotten we shall endeavor in the following pages after explaining the principles of sleight of hand applicable to cards and giving instructions for some of the best of the more commonplace feats to revive the recollection and we hope the practice of some of these brilliant performances the cards the adept inside of hand should accustom himself 
to the use of every description of cards as frequently none but the ordinary full-sized playing cards may be available where however the choice is open to him he should use in the actual performance of tricks cards of a smaller and thinner make the common french cards answer the purpose very well among cards of english make some of the best for the purpose are the small cards of the french pattern made by de la rue and company for use in france and those known as the tankerville cards both imported by peck and snyder one two four nassau street new york city which are thin well made and of small size but of the english pattern in any case it is well to use only the pocket pack of thirty-two cards the twos threes fours fives and sixes being removed the complete whist pack being inconveniently bulky for sleight of hand purposes to make the pass sauter le coupe the effect of this sight which is the very backbone of card conjuring is to reverse the respective positions of the top and bottom halves of the pack that is to make those cards which are first formed the lower half of the pack come uppermost when those cards which are first formed the upper half will of course be undermost it is used by card shoppers immediately after the cards have been cut to replace them in the position which they occupied before the cut and from this circumstance derives its french name there are various methods of producing this effect some requiring the use of both hands some of one hand only these we shall describe in due order first method with both hands hold the pack in the left hand lengthwise with the face downwards as if about to deal at any game in this position the thumb will naturally be on the left side of the pack and the four fingers on the other insert the top joint of the little finger immediately above those cards which are to be brought to the top of the pack and which are now undermost and let the remaining three fingers close naturally on the remaining cards which are now uppermost see figure one in this position you will find that the uppermost part of the pack is held between the little finger which is underneath and the remaining fingers which are upon it now advance the right hand and cover the pack with it grasp the lower portion of the pack lengthwise between the second finger at the upper and the thumb at the lower end the left thumb lying slightly bent across the pack press the inner edge of the lower packet into the fork of the left thumb so that the two packets will be as sewn in figure two next draw away the upper packet by slightly extending the fingers of the left hand at the same time lifting up the other edge of the lower packet till the edge of the two packets just clear each other see figure three when by the mere act of closing the left hand they will be brought together as at first save that they will have changed places do this at first very slowly aiming only at neatness and noiselessness of execution at the outset the task will be found somewhat difficult but gradually the hands will be found to acquire a sort of sympathetic action the different movements which we have above described will melt as it were into one and the two packets will change places with such lightness and rapidity that they will seem to actually pass through each other a slight momentary depression and elevation of the hands apparently a mere careless gesture in the act of making the pass will completely cover the transposition of the cards which in the hands of an adept is invisible even to the most watchful spectator the above is the most orthodox and the most perfect method of making the pass and if the student be proficient in this he need trouble himself very little about the remaining methods which are inserted safely for the sake of completeness 
being very inferior in all respects. Whenever in the course of this book the student is directed to make the pass, this first method will be considered to be referred to unless otherwise specially expressed. Before quitting the subject of this method, we should mention that it is sometimes necessary to cause the two halves of the pack to kiss, that is, to bring them face to face. This is effected by turning the original upper packet face upwards in the act of bringing the transposed packets together. When the pass, in the ordinary form, is fairly mastered, this slight variation will occasion no additional difficulty. In this, as in all other branches of prestidigitation, the student will find it of the greatest possible advantage to practice before looking glass. By this means, better than any other, he will be enabled to judge how far his movements succeed in deceiving the eyes of a spectator. One caution may here be given with advantage. The student of legerdemain must learn to perform all necessary movements without looking at his hands, unless for some special reason he desires the spectators to look at them also. In every case, wherever the performer desires his audience to look, his own eyes must take that particular direction, and wherever he desires his audience not to look, he himself must carefully abstain from looking. Let us suppose, for instance, that a person has drawn a card and has replaced it in the middle of the pack. The performer desires to bring it to the top. For Rick's purpose, it is necessary to introduce the little finger above the card in question and to make the pass, as above described. When the card is replaced in the pack, the eyes of the drawer are naturally directed towards it, and if the performer were himself to look downward at the cards, it would multiply tenfold the chance of detection. He should pause for a moment, and looking full at the person who drew the card, ask, You are certain that you will know that card again, or make any similar observation. As he speaks, a natural impulse will draw the eyes of the audience to his own face, and he may then make the pass without the slight necessary movement attracting the least attention. It is hard to believe, until tested by actual experience, what apparently obvious movements may be executed under the very noses of an audience, if only their attention is diverted at the right moment by a dexterous use of the eye and voice of the operator. Second method, with both hands. Holding the pack in the left hand, as directed for the first method, grasp as before the lower portion of the pack lengthways between the second finger at the upper end and the thumb at the lower end. Move the left thumb, which now takes no part in the operation, a little below the pack to be out of the way. Then slide the lower half of the pack a little to the left and the upper half to the right till they just clear each other. See figure four. When you will be enabled to place what was originally the upper half undermost and vice versa, this is the theory of the process, but in practice the necessary motions are not nearly so distinct. As you grow more and more expert, the necessary movement from right to left should become gradually smaller and smaller, until at last it is almost imperceptible. You must study to reduce this movement to the very minimum, and in order to do this, endeavor after you have once seen clearly what it is you have to do, to keep the hands together as much as possible. Let the edge of the palm of the white hand rest gently but firmly on the first three fingers of the left hand, and let the contact thus made form a kind of hinge or fulcrum for the movement of the hands. When you become expert, you will find that the mere outward movement of the two hands upon this imaginary hinge, the cards being held lightly and allowed to accommodate themselves to the movement, is sufficient to produce the effect. We have above recommended you to keep the hands together as much as possible, but there are circumstances under which an ostentatious separation of the hands is equally effective. 
Thus, holding the cards as above directed, you may make the pass by apparently merely cutting the cards, lifting in truth the under instead of the upper half, the latter making way by a slight and momentary extension of the left hand to allow it to pass. You may also, when holding the cards as just cut, that is half the pack in each hand, make the pass in the act of bringing them together. To do this, you should hold the right hand packet in such manner that the thumb and second finger may project a full inch beyond the face of the cards. At the moment of bringing the two packets together, which should be done with a sidelong motion of the right hand from right to left, this thumb and finger grip the other packet and slide it out towards the left shoulder, leaving what was originally the right hand packet in the left hand. If this is done neatly, the movement is so subtle that the keenest eye cannot detect that the two packets have changed hands. Having effected the change, you may take your own time as to placing the new uppermost packet on the other. The circumstances of each trick will indicate the cases in which it may be desirable to adapt either of these variations. Third method with both hands. This is very similar to the first method, but much less neat. Take the cards, as in the former case, face downwards in the left hand, but instead of the little finger, insert the second and third fingers immediately above those cards which are to be brought to the top of the pack, and draw the first and fourth fingers below the pack. See figure five. In this position, the lower half of the pack is held as in a forceps between the second and third and the first and fourth fingers. Now cover the pack with the right hand as directed for making the pass by the first method. But in this instance, grasp therewith between the first and second fingers at top and the thumb at bottom, the upper half of the pack. Raise this upper half slightly to allow room for the movement of the lower half and at the same moment slightly extend the fingers of the left hand. See figure 6. This will make the lower packet describe a quarter of a circle. As soon as it is clear of the upper packet by reversing the motion, that is, closing the fingers of the left hand and at the same time lowering the right hand, the two halves of the pack will be again brought together, but that half which was originally undermost will now be uppermost. The movement will be understood more clearly on an inspection of the diagrams A and B, figure 6. A representing an in view of the two portions of the pack in their original position, and B of the same in their transposed position. The original lower portion being an ink case indicated by the darker shade. Fourth method, with the left hand. This is almost the same as the method last described, save that the left hand only is used. The upper packet, instead of being held in the right hand, is in this case clipped between the ball of the left thumb and the point where the thumb joins the hand. In other respects, the movement is the same. Fifth method, with the left hand. Take the cards in the left hand as before. Insert the third finger above the cards which are to be brought to the top and which now form the lower half of the pack and close the remaining three fingers on the top of the pack. See figure one, but suppose the third finger inserted in place of the fourth. Now extend the fingers which will make the upper part of the pack describe a semicircle. See figure 7. And at the same moment press downward with the thumb the left top corner of the lower packet. This will tilt up the opposite end of the lower packet and give room as you again close the fingers for the upper packet to pass into the lower place. See figure 8. To bring the original upper packet that is the one with the six of hearts at the bottom from the position indicated in figure seven to that which it occupies in figure eight 
it is pressed slightly forward with the middle finger and is thereby made to perform a semi revolution the third finger acting as pivot the packet is by this means turned over in ways that is the end of the packet which was originally nearest to the performer is now farthest from him and vice versa the movement is by no means easy to describe but if followed step by step with the cards will be readily understood this method of making the pass has a peculiarity which renders it specially useful in certain cases when the upper half of the pack describes a semicircle as above mentioned the bottom card of such half is in full view of the performer though the spectators see only the back of the cards the performer thus becomes acquainted unknown to his audience with that card which after the pass becomes the bottom card of the pack which knowledge may occasionally be very useful the movement of the cards in this mode of making the pass is very noticeable but the circular sweep taken by the upper packet so confuses the eye that the audience must be extremely keen-sighted to detect the effect of the movement which if neatly executed has the appearance of a mere flourish a quick sweep of the arm from left to right as the pass is made will greatly assist in covering the transposition of the cards some perform the pass last described without causing the upper packet to make the semi revolution above mentioned the first finger in this case does not participate in the operation but is left extended beyond the upper end of the pack sixth method with either hand take the pack in either hand as if you were about to stand it on end on the table the backs of the cards being next to the palm insert the third finger between the two halves of the pack and draw the second and fourth fingers behind the pack in this position the uppermost half of the pack is held between the third finger and the second and fourth fingers clip the lower or front half of the pack at its two top corners between the thumb and the first finger see figure nine now extend the second third and fourth fingers which will carry with them the upper half of the pack as soon as it is clear of the lower half again close the fingers thereby bringing the upper packet to the bottom see figure ten this mode of making the pass may be employed as you place the pack on the table the movement for that purpose serving to cover that by which the cards are transposed if no table is at hand a quick movement of the hand and arm from right to left at the moment when the pass is made will be found to answer equally well seventh method with the right hand this is a mere makeshift for the pass proper though its effect is the same it is performed in picking up the cards from the table after they have been cut and left as is usual in two heaps the performer picks up as in the ordinary course the bottom half of the pack which should properly be placed uppermost after the cut but instead of picking them up in the usual way he picks them up with the second third and fourth fingers under and the first finger above the cards in placing them apparently upon the upper heap he tilts up the right hand edge of that heap with the tip of the first finger and with the remaining fingers slides the heap he already holds underneath see figure eleven so that the cards are again precisely as they were before the cut this sham mode of making the pass is rarely used by conjurers but is said to be frequently employed by card choppers to force a card by this phrase it is signified the compelling a person to draw such card as you desire though he is apparently allowed absolute freedom of choice your first step is to get sight of the bottom card or if you want to force a predetermined card to get that card to the bottom having done this take the pack in the left hand and insert the little finger halfway down in readiness to make the pass 
make the pass by the first method, but before uniting the two halves of the pack in their new position, again slip the little finger of the left hand between them. The two halves will now be united at the end which is towards the spectators, but divided by the little finger at the end nearest to yourself, and the original bottom card, which is the one you desire to force, is now the bottom of the top heap, resting on the little finger. Using both hands, with the thumbs above and the fingers below the pack, spread out the cards fanwise from left to right, at the same time offering them to a person who is to draw, and requesting him to select a card. Keep the little finger of the left hand still on the face of the card to be chosen, or you may now use, if more convenient, the same finger of the white hand, both being underneath the cards. As the person advances his hand to draw, move the cards onward with the thumb so that the particular card shall reach his fingers just at the moment when he closes them in order to draw. And if you have followed these directions, Properly, it is ten to one that he will draw the card you wish. It may possibly be imagined that forcing is a very difficult matter and requires an extraordinary degree of dexterity, but this is by no means the case. The principal thing against which a beginner must guard is a tendency to offer the particular card a little too soon. When the cards are first presented to the drawer, the pack should be barely spread at all, and the card in question should be ten or fifteen cards off. The momentary hesitation of the drawer in making his choice will give time. By moving the cards quicker or slower, as may be necessary, to bring that card opposite his fingers at the white right moment. Should the performer, however, miscalculate his time, and the card pass the drawer's fingers before the choice is made, he need not be embarrassed. Still keeping the little finger on the card, he should sharply close the cards, and making some remark as to the drawer being difficult to please, or the like. Again, spread them as before, and offer them for the choice. A moderate degree of practice will make the student so proficient that even a person acquainted with the secret of forcing will have to be very wide awake in order not to take the desired card. You will, however, sometimes find a person, suspecting your design and wishing to embarrass you, suddenly jerk his hand away from the card which he was apparently about to take, and draw another from a different part of the pack. In the great majority of tricks, this is of little consequence inasmuch as there are numerous ways which will be hereafter explained as attaining what the drawn card was but there are some illusions which depend upon the drawer taking a card similar in suit and number to one already prepared elsewhere for the purpose of the trick in this case it is of course absolutely necessary that the card drawn should be the right one and as even the most accomplished performer cannot always be certain of forcing a single card, another expedient must be used in order to ensure success. This is made absolutely certain by the use of what is called a forcing pack, that is, a pack in which all the cards are alike. Thus, if the knave of hearts is the card to be drawn, the whole pack will consist of names of hearts, and the drawer may therefore do his utmost to exercise a free choice, but the cards which he draws will certainly be the knave of hearts, and no other. Where more than one card is to be drawn, as for instance in the well-known trick of the raising cards, the pack must consist instead of similar cards throughout of groups of two or more particular cards. Thus, one-third may be knaves of hearts, one-third aces of diamonds, and the remaining third sevens of clubs, the cards of each kind being together. With the aid of such a pack, it will require very little skill to ensure one of each short being drawn. End of Part 1 of Chapter 2 End of section 2
Recording by Little T. Section 3 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Modern Magic. A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman General Principles of Sleight of Hand Applicable to Card Tricks Part 2 To Make a False Shuffle False shuffles are of two kinds, according to the object with which they are made. Those of the first kind are designed simply to keep in view a particular card or cards, the remainder of the pack being really shuffled. The second kind are designed to keep the pack in a prearranged order and are shuffled in appearance only, all the cards being brought back to the same relative positions which they occupied before the shuffle. First method, to keep a particular card or cards in view. Take the pack in the left hand. If the card to be kept in view is not already on the top of the pack, insert the little finger of the left hand immediately above that card and make the pass in order to bring it to the top transfer this card to the right hand and slide the remaining cards upon it by little successive parcels of six or eight cards one above the other the known card will now be at the bottom return the pack to the left hand slide off three or four of the top cards into the right hand and place the remaining cards by parcels of six or eight as before alternately above and below these top cards until you come to the last card which is the special one and which you will place above or below as occasion may require if there are three or four cards to be kept in view it makes no difference in the mode of operation save that you must treat those cards throughout as the single card and keep them together accordingly second method to keep a particular card in view bring the card in question as before directed to the top of the pack take the pack in the left hand holding it upright on its side the edges of the cards resting on the palm the four fingers which should be slightly moistened being at the back or top and the thumb on the face of the pack now with the thumb and middle finger of the right hand lift out edgeways that portion of the cards which now forms the middle of the pack and drop them by packets of five or six at a time upon the face of the cards remaining in the left hand moving aside the left thumb to allow of their passage the pressure of the fingers will always keep the top card in place however many of the remaining cards you lift out with the right hand and as you only shuffle onto the face of the pack however often you repeat the process this card will still remain at the top third method to retain the whole pack in a pre-arranged order take the pack in the left hand slide off with the left thumb five or six of the top cards into the right hand and place the remaining cards by parcels of five or six at a time apparently alternately above and below these first cards as in the ordinary mode of shuffling we say apparently for in reality although you go through the motion of placing every alternate packet above the cards in the right hand you do not leave it there but draw it back again with the thumb onto the top of the cards in the left hand and then place it by your next movement under the cards in the right hand the result is that the cards in the left hand instead of being placed alternately above and below the cards in the right hand are really all placed below and in precisely the same order which they occupied at first some persons are in the habit of making the genuine shuffle of which the above is an imitation from the right hand to the left instead of from the left hand to the right as above described it may be stated once for all that wherever it is found more easy by the student to do with the right hand that which he is here instructed to do with the left and vice versa there is not the least objection to his doing so 
though the mode here indicated is that which it is believed will be found most convenient by the generality of persons fourth method to retain the whole pack in a prearranged order take the upper half of the pack in the right hand and the lower half in the left the thumb in each case being above and the fingers below the cards place the two portions edge to edge and work in the edges of the cards in the right hand half an inch or so between the edges of those in the left spreading the cards in the meanwhile to facilitate the introduction but let the right hand cards project about an inch above the top edges of those in the left hand if you were to close up the cards in the relative positions they now occupy they would be really shuffled to prevent their being so in fact as well as in appearance you clip lengthways between the thumb and second finger of the right hand the cards of the packet on that side and bend them sharply downwards and outwards this again disengages them from the other packet on the top of which you quickly slide them and press the whole square fifth method to retain the whole pack in a prearranged order make the pass so as to bring the lower half of the pack uppermost take the pack in the right hand keeping the two portions of the pack separated by the little finger of that hand hold the cards face downwards a few inches from the table and let fall by five or six at a time those cards which now form the lower half of the pack you should so arrange that these cards form four little heaps falling in order indicated by the accompanying figure thus the bottom cards must fall at one the next lowest at two the next comprising all that remain of the lower packet at three and the remaining cards being the whole of the upper part at four now with the left hand quickly place packet one on packet four and with the right hand packet two on packet one and finally with the left hand packet three on top of all when the cards will occupy precisely the same relative positions as at first the use of the two hands alternately coupled with the rapidity of the performer gives to his motions an appearance of carelessness which effectually baffles the spectators and prevents their suspecting that the heaps are prearranged in any determined order sixth method this also retains the cards in their prearranged order with this qualification that an indefinite number are transferred from the top to the bottom of the pack the effect being as if the cards had been cut without being shuffled holding the cards as directed for the last method you drop them in four heaps as before first beginning from the left and proceeding straight onwards in regular succession now place the first heap on the fourth or right hand heap and the second heap on the first heap finally placing the third heap either above or below the pile thus made where it is necessary after using this shuffle to bring back the cards to the precise condition in which they were at first this object may be effected by the use of the bridge hereafter described to palm a card bring the card which you desire to palm by the pass or otherwise to the top of the pack hold the pack face downwards in the left hand covering it lengthways with the right with the left thumb push the top card till it projects about an inch beyond the edge of the pack with the third finger of the left hand which is now immediately below the card press it upwards into the right hand which should half close over it you must not mind about bending the card which will lie curled up against the inside of the hand you may either let the hand drop negligently to your side or still better take the pack between the fingers and thumbs of the same hand and offer it to be shuffled this will give you the opportunity often very valuable of seeing what the card in question is when it becomes necessary to return the card to the pack the mere motion of taking the pack in the right hand whether from the left hand or from the table will effect that object in the most natural manner if the card retains a curve from its bent position in the hand you may readily straighten it by ruffling the cards as described in the next paragraph if the performer is fortunate enough to have a large hand 
a complete pack of cards may be palmed in this manner without difficulty to ruffle the cards hold the pack tightly by the lower end between the fingers and thumbs of the left hand the thumb being above and the fingers below the cards cover the pack lengthways with the right hand and clip the cards between the fingers and thumb as if you were about to make the pass by the first method Keep the thumb unmoved, but draw the fingers smartly upwards so as to bend the cards slightly The springing of the cards as they escape one by one from the pressure of the fingers and again straighten themselves Causes a peculiar sharp sound The ruffle may also be executed with one hand only Take the pack between the middle finger at top and the thumb at bottom the first finger resting in a bent position on the back of the cards press strongly with the thumb so as to bend the two ends of the cards smartly outwards allowing them one by one to escape from the middle finger and simultaneously straighten the first finger so as to clip the lower end of the cards between that finger and the thumb the ruffle is a mere flourish but it is by no means without its value we have indicated in the last paragraph one of its uses that is to straighten a card which has been palmed apart from this there are many tricks in which it is desirable to mislead the spectator as to the particular movement by which or the point of time at which a particular effect was produced this may be effected by a judicious use of the ruffle suppose for instance that the trick consists in magically bringing a given card to a particular position in the pack and that the performer has already without the knowledge of his audience placed the card in the required position if before showing that it is so placed he ostentatiously ruffles the cards nine out of ten of the audience will be persuaded that this noisy movement is in some way the cause of the transposition and will be proportionately the less likely to discover the true explanation of the feat to change a card filet la carte some of the most brilliant effects in card conjuring are produced by the aid of this sleight by means of which a card fairly exhibited is forthwith apparently transformed to a different one there are several modes of producing this effect first method hold the pack in the left hand as though about to deal the cards hold the card to be changed in the right hand between the first and second forefingers the card into which it is to be changed should have been previously placed secretly of course on the top of the pack push this card a little forward with the left thumb so as to make it project about three quarters of an inch beyond the remaining cards Bring the hands close together for an instant and in that instant Place the card held in the right hand under the pack the second third and fourth fingers of the left hand opening to receive it and The remaining finger making way for it as soon as it reaches the pack Simultaneously with this movement the thumb and first finger of the right hand must close upon the card projecting from the top of the pack and as the hand separates carry with them that card in place of the one which the right hand originally held a half turn of the body to the left or right a quick downward sweep of the right hand or any other rapid gesture will assist in covering the momentary bringing together of the hands in some cases it is better that the right hand alone should move the left hand being held stationary in other cases the left hand the one holding the pack should make the movement the hand holding the single card being motionless it will be well to practice both these modes of making the change the direction in which the performer turns in order to place the card on his table or the like will indicate which is the best mode to use in any given case second method this is a very inferior mode of performing the change but may be useful as a makeshift while the student is acquiring the greater dexterity required for the former method hold the pack upright towards the audience with the card to be changed at the bottom and therefore in full view and the card for which it is to be changed at the top 
the pack should be supported by both hands and the two cards named should project about half an inch to the right beyond the remainder of the pack the front or bottom card being between the first and second fingers and the back or top card between the thumb and first finger of the right hand call attention to the bottom card make a downward sweep with the pack so as to turn the faces of the cards towards the ground and at the same moment draw off with the right hand the top card which the audience will imagine to be the one they have just seen at the bottom third method hold the card to be changed face downwards between the thumb and first and second fingers of the right hand the thumb being above and the two fingers below the card hold the pack in the left hand as if about to deal the cards the card for which that first mentioned is to be changed being on the top bring the hands rapidly together pushing the top card with the left thumb about an inch beyond the rest of the pack and at the same moment place the card held in the right hand with a sliding motion upon the top of the pack both this card and the original top card which is now second will now be between the two fingers and thumb of the right hand press lightly on the top card with the left thumb to keep it back and quickly draw away the right hand pressing gently upwards with the two fingers on the face of the second card which you will thereby draw away in place of the top card if neatly done the keenest eyesight cannot detect the substitution of the second card your only difficulty will be to find a colorable pretext for placing the card you hold on the top of the pack this achieved the rest is easy the nature of the trick you are performing will frequently suggest a plausible excuse a very successful plan is to boldly request the company to observe that you do not do that which you at the same moment actually do you will observe ladies and gentlemen you remark that i do not even for one moment replace the card in the pack but simply etc etc at the words replace the card in the pack the hands are brought together and make the change the action suiting the words is taken by the audience as an indicative gesture only and thus the change is effected under their very eyes without exciting the least suspicion in this mode of making the exchange you should aim at being easy and natural rather than very rapid the main movement that which brings the hands together is undisguised but attributed to a fictitious motive and the subsidiary movement of the fingers which actually affects the change is so slight as to be practically imperceptible fourth method with one hand only take the pack face downwards in the left hand as if about to deal place the card to be changed at the top and the card for which it is to be changed next below it with the left thumb push forward the top card to the extent of half its width letting it rest on the tips of the fingers this will leave one half of the second card exposed by the reverse movement of the thumb draw back this second card till its outer edge is just clear of the inner edge of the top card now press the second card downwards with the thumb so as to bring its opposite edge just above the level of the top card then push it back into its place but this time above instead of below the top card fifth method to change a given card without the aid of the pack a card having been chosen and returned to the pack make the pass to bring it to the top and palm it give the pack to be shuffled and when it is returned pick out haphazard any card you please and holding it up between the first finger and thumb of the right hand in which is the palmed card announce boldly that that was the card chosen you will of course be contradicted whereupon you pretend to be disconcerted and ask if the person is quite certain that that is not the card he drew and so on meanwhile you take the card face downwards between the first finger and thumb of the left hand whence you immediately take it again in the right hand taking it so as to bring the palmed card immediately over it when the two will at a little distance appear to be only one card you then say 
well if you seriously assure me that it is not the right card i must endeavor to change it to the right one may i ask what your card was when you are told you continue it is a very simple process i have merely to lay the card upon my hand so or if you prefer it i will change it in your own hands oblige me by holding the card face downwards i think you said your card was say the ace of spades change as you say the words lay the card upon my hand you place the two cards for an instant on the palm of the left hand and draw off rapidly the top card which is the right one leaving the other palmed in the left hand which then drops to your side the audience do not suspect that the change is already effected or that you have more than one card in your hand throughout and if you have performed the trick neatly will be utterly nonplussed when the transformation is revealed you may if you please conclude by asking what card the audience imagine that they first saw and when told remarking that they must have been mistaken in their impression as that card has been in mr. So-and-so's tail pocket all evening as you prove by plunging your left hand in which the card remains palmed into the pocket and producing it accordingly sixth method to change several cards at once this sleight is extremely useful in cases where you desire without the knowledge of the audience to gain possession of a given number of selected cards palm in the left hand face downwards a number of cards equal to that which you desire to abstract take the cards which you desire to gain possession of between the second finger and thumb of the left hand after the manner of the single card cover these cards lengthways with the right hand and palm them in that hand at the same moment seizing crossways with the fingers and thumbs of the same hand the cards already palmed in the left hand which to the eyes of the spectators will be the same they have just seen and throw them face downwards on the table end of section three section four of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by k hand modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman general principles of sleight of hand applicable to card tricks part three to get sight of a drawn card the power of doing this is a sine qua non for the conjurer as already mentioned even the most expert operator cannot be absolutely certain of forcing the card which he desires and a novice is very likely indeed to find a wrong card occasionally drawn it is therefore necessary to be provided with a remedy for such a contretemps one mode of meeting the difficulty is to allow the card to be returned to the pack make the pass to bring it to the top and palm it immediately giving the pack to be shuffled and in so doing to get sight of the card which remains in your own hand and can in due time be reproduced in any way you please see figure fifteen for the present purpose we assume that you do not desire to retain possession of the card but merely wish to know its suit and value this may be ascertained as follows first method ask the drawer to return his card to the pack which you offer for that purpose in the left hand spreading the pack fanwise in order that he may insert the card where he pleases as he replaces the card slip the little finger of the left hand below it and close the fan you now have the pack held in the palm of the left hand but divided just below the chosen card by the little finger the three remaining fingers being on the top offer the cards to be shuffled or make any gesture you like with the pack at the same moment slightly straightening the fingers the effect of this movement will be to lift the upper packet and thus open the pack bookwise the opening being towards yourself and the lowest card of the top heap which is the card you desire to ascertain being for the moment in full view see figure twenty two second method proceed as above but instead of opening the pack to get sight of the card bring it secretly to the bottom by the pass and offer the cards to be shuffled holding them at the upper end between the thumb and first and second finger of the right hand and slanting from you at an angle of forty five degrees as in figure fifteen as the faces are towards you you have a full view of the card 
even if it should suggest itself to the audience that you are able to see the bottom card as they are not aware that the chosen card is now in that position there is nothing to excite their suspicion you may by way of variety instead of offering the cards to be shuffled hold them in the right hand and make the single-handed ruffle above discovered at the same time turning their faces slightly towards yourself you may effect the same object and even more simply by the mere act of passing the pack from the one hand to the other keeping the bottom card turned inward as above to slip a card hold the pack in the left hand having first slightly moistened the fingers which should rest upon the back of the cards open the pack bookwise at an angle of about forty five degrees holding the upper packet lengthways between the thumb and second finger of the right hand draw this upper packet smartly upwards to a distance of two or three inches from the lower packet see figure twenty three the top card of the upper packet being held back by the pressure of the fingers upon it will not move upwards with the rest of the packet but immediately the remaining cards are clear will fold itself down on the top of the lower packet if the top card of the lower packet to be examined before and after the slip the card will appear to have changed the fact being that the original top card becomes the second after the slip the slip card covering it to draw back a card glisser la carte the performer shows the bottom card, then dropping the pack into a horizontal position, face downwards, he draws out, with the thumb and second finger of the other hand, apparently that card, but really the next above it. This is effected as follows. Hold the pack upright in the left hand between the first finger and thumb, the back of the cards towards the palm, and the thumb and finger about the middle of each side of the pack. Let the third finger, which should be previously moistened, rest on the face of the cards. See figure 24 you will find that in this position by moving the third finger you can draw back the bottom card about an inch below the remaining cards and thereby leave exposed a corresponding portion of the next card see figure twenty five this is the whole mechanism of the operation you must of course take care after showing the bottom card to turn the pack downward before you slide back that card in order to draw the next card in its place to turn over the pack there are certain tricks as for instance where you have undertaken to produce a given card at a particular number in the pack for which it is necessary to deal a certain number of cards from the top and then without the spectator's knowledge continue the deal from the opposite end of the pack as a necessary preliminary you must face the cards i e bring the upper and lower portions face to face this you have already been taught to do by means of the pass whichever way the pack is turned it will now of course show backs only Take the pack flat in the left hand, the fingers clipping it rather tightly, but without the aid of the thumb. Pass the thumb underneath, and with the ball of the thumb press the pack smartly upwards. See figure 26. When it will describe a semi-revolution on its longest axis, the lower face of the pack being thereby brought uppermost. If performed with the hand at rest, the movement is very perceptible, but if you at the same time make a semicircular sweep of the hand and arm from the left to right, the smaller movement of the pack in the hand is much less likely to attract notice. To spring the cards from one hand to the other. This is a mere flourish and belongs rather to the art of the juggler than to that of the magician, but it is so frequently exhibited by conjurers that a work on magic could hardly be complete without some notice of it. The cards are held in the right hand between the tips of the second and third finger at the top and the thumb at the bottom. If the thumb and fingers are now brought slowly nearer together so as to bend the cards slightly, they will, one by one, in quick succession, beginning with the bottom card, spring away from the pack. And if the pressure be continued, the whole of the cards will spring away one after the other in this manner. If the left hand be ten or twelve inches distance from the right, with the finger slightly bent, the released cards will be shot into the left hand, which, as the last cards reach it, should be rapidly brought palm to palm with the right and square up the pack to repeat the process. By giving the body a quick half-turn to the right as the cards are sprung from one hand to the other, you may make the hands, and with them the moving cards, describe an arc of about two feet and so deceive the eye of the spectator into the belief that the hands are that distance apart, though in reality, as they both move together in the same direction, they retain their original relative distance of ten to twelve inches. To throw a card. This slight also belongs rather to the ornamental than to the practical part of conjuring, but it is by no means to be despised. It is a decided addition to a card trick for the performer to be able to say, you observe, ladies and gentlemen, that the cards I use are all of perfectly ordinary character, and by way of offering them for examination, to send half a dozen in succession flying into the remotest corners of the hall or theatre. The card should be held lightly between the first and second fingers in the position shown in figure 27. 
The hand should be curved inward toward the wrist, and then straightened with a sudden jerk, the arm being at the same time shot sharply forward. The effect of this movement is that the card, as it leaves the hand, revolves in the plane of its surface in the direction indicated by the dotted line, and during the rest of its course maintains such revolution. This spinning motion gives the flight of the card a strength and directness which it would seem impossible to impart to so small and light an object. A skilled performer will propel cards in this way to a distance of sixty or eighty feet, each card traveling with the precision and well nigh the speed of an arrow shot from a bow. The movement, though perfectly simple in theory, is by no means easy to acquire in practice. Indeed, we know no slight which, as a rule, it give more trouble at the outset, but after a certain amount of labor, with little or no result, the student suddenly acquires the desired knack, and thenceforward finds no difficulty in the matter. The Bridge The object of the bridge is to enable the performer, with ease and certainty, to cut or otherwise divide the pack at a given card. It is made as follows. Holding the cards in the left hand, with the thumb across the pack, the performer covers them for an instant with his right hand, as if about to make a pass. Grasping the pack between the thumb and second finger of this hand, he bends the whole of the cards slightly inwards over the first finger of the left hand, immediately afterwards bending the upper or outward portion of the pack backward in the opposite direction. The effect of the double movement is that the two halves of the pack are bent in a double concave form, though in a much less degree. If the cards be now cut, the concave portions, instead of being, as at first, back to back, will be face to face, leaving in the center of the pack an elliptical opening, of a maximum width of about an eighth of an inch. This slight hiatus in the middle will generally cause a person who is invited to cut to do so at that particular point, and will in any case enable the performer either to cut or to make the pass at that point with the greatest ease. The cases in which the bridge may be employed with advantage will be more particularly indicated when we come to practically apply the processes already described, but it has a special use which may be at once mentioned. It will be remembered that some of the false shuffles already described leave the cards as if cut, though they in other respects retain their prearranged order, and it therefore becomes necessary to again cut them at a particular point in order to bring them back to their original condition. This point is ascertained by the use of the bridge. The cards are first bent in the manner described above, the false shuffle is then made, leaving the cards in effect cut, but by again cutting or making the pass at the bridge, they are once more precisely as at first. We have endeavored to be as explicit as possible in the foregoing description of the different sleight of hand processes, so that the reader may, by following our instructions closely, be able to teach himself, unassisted, to perform the various movements described. We have done our best to make our descriptions intelligible, and trust that we have fairly succeeded. We should, however, strongly advise any student who desires to make rapid progress to take, if possible, a few preliminary lessons under the personal guidance of a competent performer, professional, or amateur. It is an old saying that an ounce of example is worth a pound of precept, and a reader who has once or twice seen the processes we have described practically illustrated by skillful hands will not only avoid the difficulties which are sure to be at first found in even the clearest written instructions, but will escape the formation of bad habits, which it may take much time and trouble to eradicate. Should the novice seek such assistance, he must not expect to find that any one performer uses indifferently all the processes we have described. Every professor has his own favorite methods of procedure, and generally speaking, pours scorn and contumely upon all others, or, in the words of Byron, a little altered, compounds for slights he has a mind to, by damning those he's not inclined to. The student who commences his labors without such assistance must make his own selection. In the pass, we should recommend him to stick to the first method, the remaining passes being rather curious than useful. Among the false shuffles, the first, third, fifth, and sixth will be found the most effective. For the remaining processes he may be guided by his own taste and the greater or less facility with which his fingers adapt themselves to one or the other of them. The various slights above described will cost the student some time and perseverance before they are fairly mastered, and until they are so it is hopeless to attempt any of the more brilliant feats. For his amusement in the meantime we subjoin a few tricks for which sleight of hand is not necessary, but which, if performed with neatness and tact, will cause considerable astonishment to the uninitiated. End of section 4 Section 5 of Modern Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. 
Card Tricks with Ordinary Cards and Not Requiring Sleight of Hand Part 1 there is a large class of tricks which may be described as consisting of two elements, the discovery of a chosen card by the performer and the revelation of his knowledge in a more or less striking manner. We propose to give, in the first place, three or four methods of discovering a given card, and then a similar variety of methods of concluding the trick. It must be remembered that for our present purpose we exclude all tricks for which any special dexterity is requisite. There will be little that is absolutely novel in this chapter, but it will be for the student to supply the want of freshness in his materials by the ingenuity of his combinations. Simple Modes of Discovering a Given Card First Method Hold the pack face downwards in the left hand, having previously noticed the bottom card. Secretly draw down this card about three-quarters of an inch and hold the part so drawn down between the thumb and fourth finger of the right hand, the palm of the right hand being above the cards. Now, with the tip of the first or second finger of the right hand, draw down the cards one by one about half an inch, beginning with the top card, and so on, inviting your audience to stop you at any card they may choose. When they do so, draw down all the cards, as far as you have gone, completely away from the remaining cards but with them draw down at the same time the bottom card. This card, coalescing with the upper portion, will be, to the eyes of the spectators, that at which you were directed to stop. Holding the cards with their backs towards you, request them to observe what the card is. The pack may now be shuffled to any extent, but being acquainted with the card you can find or name it at pleasure. The above may be employed as a means of forcing, where it is essential to force a given card and you are not sufficiently proficient to feel certain of effecting that object by the regular method. Thus, suppose that the card which you desire to force is the seven of diamonds. You place that card at the bottom of the pack, and proceed as above directed. When the audience desire you to stop, you draw off the upper packet, and with it the seven of diamonds, which will thereby become the bottom card of that packet. You request them to note the card, and at once hand the pack to be shuffled. This is a very simple and easy mode of forcing, but it is very generally known, and it would not therefore be safe to use it before a large or very acute audience. Second Method Deal the cards into three packs face upwards, and request a spectator to note a card and remember in which heap it is. When you have dealt twenty-one cards, throw the rest aside, these not being employed in the trick. Ask in which heap the chosen card is, and place that heap between the other two, and deal again as before. Again ask the question, place the heap indicated in the middle, and deal again a third time. Note particularly the fourth or middle card of each heap, as one or other of those three cards will be the card thought of. Ask for the last time in which heap the chosen card now is, when you may be certain that it was the card which you noted as being the middle card of that heap. This same effect will be produced with any number of cards, so long as such number is odd, and a multiple of three. The process and result will be the same, save that if fifteen cards are used, each heap will consist of five cards, and the third card of each will be the middle one. If twenty-seven cards, each heap will consist of nine cards, and the fifth will be the selected one, and so on. Third Method Take any number of the cards, and deal them face upwards upon the table, noting in your own mind the first card dealt. Ask any number of persons each to note a card, and to remember at what number it falls. When you have dealt all the cards you first took in your hand, take them up again, without disturbing their order, and turn them face downwards. In order to show that the trick is not performed by any arithmetical calculation, you should lay great stress upon this, the fact being precisely the reverse, Invite the company to take any number they choose of the remaining cards, such number being unknown to you, and place them either above or below the cards you have dealt. Allow the cards to be cut, not shuffled, as many times as the audience please. You now, for the first time, ask each person what was the number of his card, and on being informed, again deal the cards, turning them face upwards. When the original first card appears, Count on, silently, from this as number one to the number mentioned, at which number the noted card will again appear. 
Should the whole of the cards be dealt out without reaching the required number, turn the cards over again and continue from the top of the pack until that number is reached. Having indicated how a card may be discovered, we proceed to describe various modes of disclosing the card thus ascertained. First method. Get the card to the top of the pack. Give the pack to some person to hold. The cards should be face upwards so that the chosen card will be undermost, with the thumb of the holder above and the fingers below the pack. The fingers should extend under the pack for about an inch, but the thumb above not more than half an inch. Request the person to nip the cards tightly, and as he does so, give them a smart downward rap with your forefinger, which will knock all the cards out of his hand with the exception of the lowest card, which will be retained by the greater friction of the fingers, and will remain staring him in the face. This is a very old and simple finish, but it appears marvellous to those who witness it for the first time. You may, if you prefer it, hold the cards yourself as above directed, and allow another person to strike them downwards. It is well to moisten the fingers, not the thumb, slightly, as you thereby increase the hold on the chosen card. Second method. Get the card to the top of the pack, and hold the pack lightly between the thumb and fingers of the right hand, the thumb being on the face, and the fingers, which should be previously slightly moistened, on the back of the cards. Give a sharp downward jerk of the hand and arm. When, as in the last case, all the cards will fall save the top card, which is retained by the greater friction of the moistened fingers. Third method. Get the chosen card to the top and hold the pack in the right hand, lengthways and face downwards, about two feet above the floor or table. Push the top card a little off the pack sideways so as to make it project throughout the whole length about an inch beyond the rest of the cards. Now let fall the pack, when the resistance of the air will cause the top card to turn over in its fall, and to appear face upwards, all the other cards remaining face downwards. Fourth method. Place the card in question, and seven other indifferent cards in two rows, face downwards, on the table. Keep in your own mind which is the chosen card, but do not let the audience see the face of either of the cards. Ask the drawer if he is sure that he will know his card again. He will, of course, answer yes. Now ask either the same or another person to touch four of the eight cards upon the table. Necessarily the four which he touches will either include or not include the chosen card. In either case you take up, whether he touches them or not, the four which do not include the chosen card, remarking, I will return these to the pack. Invite the same person to touch two out of the four which remain. Again, take up the two, whether touched or not touched, which do not include the chosen card, saying, I return these also to the pack. You have now only two cards left on the table, one of which is the chosen card. Invite one of the spectators to touch one of these cards. As before, whichever he touches, you pick up and return to the pack the non-chosen card, remarking, We have now only one card left. You have all seen that I dealt out eight cards on the table, and that I have withdrawn seven, you yourselves choosing which I should withdraw. Now, sir, be kind enough to name the card you drew. The card having been named, you turn over the card left on the table, and show that it is the right one. This trick is based upon a kind of double entendre, which, though apparently obvious, is rarely seen through by the audience if performed in a quick and lively manner. The secret lies in the performer interpreting the touching of the cards in two different senses, as may best suit his purpose. If the chosen card is not among the cards touched, he interprets the touching as meaning that the cards touched are rejected, and to be returned to the pack. If the card is among those touched, he interprets the touching in the opposite sense, namely that the cards touched are to be retained, and the others rejected. If he is lucky in the cards touched, it may happen that he is able to interpret the touching in the same sense throughout the trick, in which case there will be no clue whatever to the secret. But even in the opposite case, where he is compelled to put aside first the cards touched, and then the cards not touched, the difference generally passes unnoticed by the spectators, or, or, if noticed, is put down as a slip on the part of the performer, rather than as being, as it really is, the key to the trick. 
Where the performer is proficient in sleight of hand, the above may be worked up into a really brilliant trick. Any indifferent card being drawn and returned is brought to the top by the pass, palmed, and the pack shuffled. Eight cards are laid out, and the drawn card revealed as above. Having described these few commencements and terminations, we will next proceed to the discussion of some complete tricks. To make a card vanish from the pack, and be found in a person's pocket. Slightly moisten the back of your left hand, offer the pack to be shuffled, place it face downwards on the table, and request one of the company to look at the top card. Request him to place the back of his left hand upon the cards and press heavily upon it with his right. In order that he may the better comprehend your meaning, place your own hands as described, and request him to imitate you. When you remove your left hand, the back being moistened, the card will stick to it. Put your hands carelessly behind you, and with the right hand remove the card. All will crowd around to see the trick. Pretend to be very particular that the person who places his hand on the card shall do so in precisely the right position. This will not only give you time, but draw all eyes to his hands. Meanwhile, watch your opportunity, and slip the card into the tail pocket of one or other of the spectators. Now announce that you are about to order the top card, which all have seen, and which Mr. A is holding down so exceedingly tight, to fly away from the pack and into the pocket of Mr. B, making the choice apparently haphazard. On examination your commands will be found to have been fulfilled. It has a good effect, when practicable, to slip the card into the pocket of the same person who is pressing upon the pack. To place the four kings in different parts of the pack, and to bring them together by a simple cut. Take the four kings, or any other four cards at pleasure, and exhibit them fan-wise, but secretly place behind the second one, the king of diamonds in the figure, two other court cards of any description which being thus hidden behind the king, will not be visible. The audience, being satisfied that the four cards are really the four kings, and none other, fold them together, and place them at the top of the pack. Draw attention to the fact that you are about to distribute these four kings in different parts of the pack. Take up the top card, which, being really a king, you may exhibit without apparent intention, and place it at the bottom. Take the next card, which the spectators suppose to be also a king, and place it about half-way down the pack, and the next on, in like manner, a little higher. Take the fourth card, which, being actually a king, you may show carelessly, and replace it on the top of the pack. You have now really three kings at the top, and one at the bottom, though the audience imagine that they have seen them distributed in different parts of the pack, and are proportionately surprised, when the cards are cut, to find that all the kings are again together. It is best to use knaves or queens for the two extra cards as being less distinguishable from the kings, should a spectator catch a chance glimpse of their faces. There are other and better modes of bringing together four apparently separated cards by the aid of sleight of hand, which will be explained in due course, but we have thought it well to give also this simpler method as it is always an advantage to possess two different modes of performing the same feat. The four kings being placed under the hand of one person, and the four sevens under the hand of another, to make them change places at command. Exhibit fanwise, in one hand the four kings, and in the other the four eights. Behind the hindmost of the kings, and so as not to be noticeable by the audience, secretly place beforehand the four sevens. Hold the four eights in the other hand in such a manner that the lower of the two center pips of the foremost is concealed by the first and second fingers. The same pip on each of the other cards will be concealed by the card immediately before it, so that the four cards will to the spectators appear equally like the sevens. Place the pack face downwards on the table. Draw attention to the fact that you hold in one hand the four kings, and in the other the four sevens, really the disguised eights. Fold up the supposed sevens and place them on the pack. Fold up the kings and place them on the top of the supposed sevens. As the real sevens were behind the last of the kings, they are now on the top, with the kings next, though the audience are persuaded that the kings are uppermost and the sevens next following. 
deal off, slowly and carefully, the four top cards, saying, I take off these four kings, and lay them on the table, requesting one of the spectators to place his hand firmly upon them. Do the same with the next four cards, which are really the kings. Ask if the persons in charge of the cards are quite sure that they are still under their hands, and upon receiving their assurance to that effect, command the cards they hold to change places, which they will be found to have done. Four packets of cards having been formed face downwards on the table, to discover the total value of the undermost cards. This trick must be performed with the bouquet pack of thirty-two cards. Invite one of the spectators to privately select any four cards, and to place them separately and face downwards on the table. Then, counting an ace as eleven, a court card as ten, and any other card according to the number of its pips, to place upon each of these four so many cards as, added to its value thus estimated, shall make fifteen. It must be remembered that value is only to be taken into consideration as to the original four cards, those placed on them counting as one each, whatever they may happen to be. You meanwhile retire. When the four heaps are complete, advance to the table and observe how many cards are left over and above the four heaps. To this number mentally add thirty-two. The total will give you the aggregate value of the four lowest cards, calculated as above mentioned. You should not let your audience perceive that you count the remaining cards, or they will readily conjecture that the trick depends on some arithmetical principle. You may say, You will observe that I do not look even at one single card, and, so saying, throw down the surplus cards with apparent carelessness upon the table, when they are sure to fall sufficiently scattered to enable you to count them without attracting observation. To name all the cards in the pack in succession. This is an old trick, but a very good one. To perform it, you must arrange the cards of a whist pack beforehand, according to a given formula, which forms a sort of memoria technica. There are several used, but all are similar in effect. The following is one of the simplest. Eight kings threatened to save, ninety-five ladies for one sick knave. These words suggest, as you will readily see, eight, king, three, ten, two, seven, nine, five, queen, four, ace, six, knave. You must also have a determinate order for the suits, which should be red and black alternately, say diamonds, clubs, hearts, spades. Sort the pack for convenience into the four suits, and then arrange the cards as follows. Take in your left hand, face upwards, the eight of diamonds, on this place the king of clubs, on this the three of hearts, then the ten of spades, then the two of diamonds, and so on, till the whole of the cards are exhausted. This arrangement must be made privately beforehand, and you must either make this the first of your series of tricks, or which is better, as it negatives the idea of arrangement, have two packs of the same pattern, and secretly exchange the prepared pack at a suitable opportunity for that with which you have already been performing. Spread the cards, which may previously be cut any number of times, and offer them to a person to draw one. While he is looking at the card, glance quickly at the card next above that which he has drawn, which we will suppose is the five of diamonds. You will remember that in your memoria technica five is followed by ladies, queen. You know then that the next card, the one drawn, was a queen. You know also that clubs follow diamonds, ergo the card drawn is the queen of clubs. Name it, and request the drawer to replace it. Ask someone again to cut. Ask someone again to cut the cards, and repeat the trick in the same form with another person, but this time pass all the cards which were above the card drawn below the remainder of the pack. This is equivalent to cutting the pack at that particular card. After naming the card drawn, ask if the company would like to know any more. Name the cards next following the card already drawn, taking them one by one from the pack and laying them face upwards on the table, to show that you have named them correctly. After a little practice it will cost you but a very slight effort of memory to name in succession all the cards in the pack. The cards being cut, 
to tell whether the number cut is odd or even. This is another trick performed by the aid of the prepared pack last described, and has the advantage of being little known even to those who are acquainted with other uses of the arranged pack. Notice whether the bottom card for the time being is red or black. Place the pack on the table and invite any person to cut, announcing that you will tell by the weight of the cards cut whether the number is odd or even. Take the cut cards, in other words the cards which before the cut were at the top of the pack, and poising them carefully in your hand as though testing their weight, glance slyly at the bottom card. If it is of the same color as the bottom card of the other or lowest portion, the cards cut are an even number. If of a different color, they are odd. End of section 5— Section 6 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic — A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Card Tricks with Ordinary Cards and Not Requiring Sleight of Hand Part 2 The Whist Trick — To Deal Yourself All the Trumps the cards being arranged as above mentioned, you may challenge any of the company to play a hand at whist with you. The cards are cut in the ordinary way, not shuffled. You yourself deal when, of course, the turn-up card falls to you. On taking up the cards, it will be found that each person has all the cards of one suit. But your own suit being that of the turn-up card is, of course, trumps, and having the whole thirteen, you must necessarily win every trick. The weak point of the feat is, that the cards being regularly sorted into the four suits, the audience can hardly help suspecting that the pack was prearranged beforehand. There is another and better mode of performing the trick by which you still hold all the trumps, but the three remaining players have the ordinary mixed hands. This method, however, involves sleight of hand, and would therefore be out of place in the present chapter. To allow a person to think of a card, and to make that card appear at such a number in the pack, as another person shall name. Allow the pack to be shuffled and cut as freely as the company please. When they are fully satisfied that the cards are well mixed, offer the pack to any of the spectators, and request him to look over the cards, and think of any one, and to remember the number at which it stands in the pack, reckoning from the bottom card upwards. You then remark, ladies and gentlemen, you will take particular notice that I have not asked a single question and yet I already know the card, and if anyone will kindly indicate the place in the pack at which you desire it to appear, I will at once cause it to take that position. I must only ask that, by arrangement between yourselves, you will make the number at which the card is to appear higher than that which it originally held. We will suppose that the audience decide that the card shall appear at number 22. Carelessly remark, it is not even necessary for me to see the cards. So saying, hold the pack under the table, and rapidly count off twenty-two cards from the bottom of the pack, and place them on the top. Footnote. When the number named is more than half the total number of the pack, in other words more than sixteen in a piquet pack, or more than twenty-six in a whist pack, it is quicker, and has precisely the same effect, to count off the difference between that and the total number from the top, and place them at the bottom. Thus, in a piquet pack, if the number called be twelve, you would count off twelve from the bottom, and place them on the top, but if the number called were twenty-four, you would achieve the same object by counting eight from the top, and passing them to the bottom. End of footnote. You then continue. Having already placed the card thought of in the desired position, I may now, without suspicion, ask for the original number of the card as I shall commence my counting with that number. We will suppose you are told the card was originally number ten. You begin to count from the top of the pack, calling the first card ten, the next eleven, and so on. When you come to twenty-two, the number appointed, you say, If I have kept my promise, this should be the card you thought of. To avoid the suspicion of confederacy, will you please say, before I turn it over, what your card was? The card being named, you turn it up and show that it is the right one. 
In all tricks which depend on the naming of a card drawn or thought of, it adds greatly to the effect to have the card named before you turn it up. This trick, unlike most, will bear repetition, but it is well on a second performance to vary it a little. Thus you may on the second occasion say, when the card has been thought of, I will choose for myself this time. Your card will appear at number thirty. It is desirable to name a number very near the total number of the pack, which we are now supposing to be a piquet pack, as the difference between that and the total number being very small, it is easy to see at a glance the number of cards representing such difference, and pass them to the bottom of the pack. You take in this instance two cards only, that being the difference between thirty and thirty-two, and pass them to the bottom, when the card will, as you have announced, be the thirtieth. If you are able to make the pass, you will, of course, avail yourself of it to transfer the requisite number of cards to the top or bottom of the pack. THE CARDS REVEALED BY THE LOOKING-GLASS This is rather a joke than a feat of magic, but it will create some fun, and may often be kept up for some time without being discovered. Take up your position on one side of the room, facing a good-sized mirror or chimney-glass. Make your audience stand or sit facing you, when they will, of course, have their backs to the glass. Offer the cards to be shuffled and cut. Take the top card and hold it high up, with its back to you and its face to the audience. As it will be reflected in the mirror opposite you, you will have no difficulty in naming it, or any other card in like manner, till your audience either find you out, or have had enough of the trick. To guess four cards thought of by different persons. Offer the pack to be shuffled. Place it on the table, and taking off the four top cards with the right hand, offer them to any person, and ask him to notice one of them, shuffle them, and return them to you. When they are returned, place them face downwards in your left hand. Take the next four cards and offer them to another person in like manner. Proceed in like manner with the third and fourth group of four. When all the sixteen cards are returned, deal them out in four heaps face upwards. Ask each person in which heap his card now is. That of the first person will be the uppermost of his heap. That of the second person second in his heap, and so on. It will sometimes occur that two of the cards chosen are in the same heap, but the rule will still apply. Should there be three persons only to choose, you should give them three cards each, and deal in three heaps. THE PAIRS REPAIRED after performing the last trick, you may continue, As you have not yet found me out, I will repeat the experiment, but in a slightly altered form. This time I will invite you to think of two cards each, and all present may join if they please. After giving the pack to be shuffled, you deal out twenty cards face upwards, but placing them in couples. Invite as many of the company as please to note any particular couple they think fit, and to remember those two cards. When they have done so, gather up the cards, picking them up here and there in any order you please, taking care, however, that none of the pairs are separated. You now deal them out again, face upwards, in rows of five, according to the following formula, mutus dedit nomen cosis, which being interpreted signifies, mutus gave a name to the cosi, a people as yet undiscovered. On examining the sentence closely, you will observe that it consists of ten letters only, M-U-T-S-D-E-I-N-O-C, each twice repeated. This gives you the clue to the arrangement of the cards, which will be as follows. M-1, U-2, T-3, U-2, S-4, D-5. E6, D5, I7, T3, N8, O9, M1, E6, N8, C10, O9, C10, I7, S4. You must imagine the four words printed as above upon your table. You must deal your first card upon the imaginary M in Mutus, and the second on the imaginary M in Nomen, the two next cards on the two imaginary U's, the two next on the two T's, and so on. 
You have now only to ask each person in which row his two cards now appear, and you will at once know which they are. Thus, if a person says his two cards are now in the second and fourth rows, you will know that they must be the two cards representing the two eyes, that being the only letter common to those two rows. If a person indicates the first and fourth rows, you will know that his cards are those representing the two S's, and so on. THE MAGIC TRIPLETS This trick is precisely similar in principle to the last, but twenty-four instead of twenty cards are used, and they are dealt in triplets instead of pairs. After the spectators have made their selection, you take up the cards as directed for the last trick, taking care to keep the respective triplets together. You then deal them in rows of six, the formula in this case being Levini Lanata Levetti Novoto. Another mode of discovering a card thought of. Have the pack well shuffled. Then deal twenty-five cards in five rows of five cards each, face upwards. Invite a person to think of a card and to tell you in which row it is. Note in your own mind the first or left-hand card of that row. Now pick up the cards in vertical rows, in other words beginning from the last card of the last row, placing that card face upwards on the last of the next row, those two on the last of the next row, and so on. When you have picked up all the cards in this manner, deal them out again in the same way as at first. You will observe that those cards which at first formed the first cards of each row now themselves form the first row. Ask the person in which row his card now is. When he has told you, look to the top row for the first card of the original row, when the card thought of will be found in a direct line below it. As you have just been told in which lateral row it is, you will not have the least difficulty in discovering it, and by a slight effort of memory you may even allow several persons each to think of a card and name it. A comparison of the subjoined tables, showing the original and subsequent order of the cards, will explain the principle of the trick. First order. Horizontally. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. Second order. Vertically. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. Thus we will suppose you are told that the card thought of is originally in the third line. Remember the first or key card of that line, designated in the table as eleven. If the card is in the fourth line after the second deal, you look to the top line for the key card, and on finding it you have only to observe which card in the fourth row is immediately beneath it to be sure that the card, in this instance designated by number 14, is the card thought of. You may perform the trick with either 16, 25, 36, or 49 cards, either of those being a square number, and thus making the number of cards in a row equal to the number of rows, which is essential to the success of the trick. To guess, by the aid of a passage of poetry or prose, such one of sixteen cards as, in the performer's absence, has been touched or selected by the company. This feat is performed by confederacy, the assistance of the confederate being open and avowed, but the mode in which the clue is given constituting the mystery. You allow the pack to be shuffled, and then deal sixteen cards, the first that come to hand, either face upwards or face downwards, in four rows on the table. The sole preparation on the part of yourself and your confederate is to commit to memory the following simple formula. Animal, vegetable, mineral, verb. Signifying, respectively, one, two, three, and four. You retire from the room while the card is chosen, your confederate remaining. Upon your return, your confederate selects and hands for your perusal a passage in any book which the audience may select only taking care that the first word in such passage 
which comes within either of the four categories above mentioned, shall be such as to represent the number of the row in which the card is, and that the second word, which comes within either of those categories, shall represent the number at which the card stands in that row. We will suppose, for instance, that the passage handed to the performer is that portion of Hamlet's soliloquy commencing, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Here the first word which comes within either of the four categories is flesh, which, being clearly animal, one, indicates that the chosen card is in the first row. The second word coming within either of the categories is melt, which, being a verb, four, indicates that the chosen card is the fourth of its row. Had the passage been to be or not to be, that is the question, the two verbs would have indicated that the card was the fourth of the fourth row. How doth the little busy be, etc., would have indicated the first of the fourth row, and so on. With a little tact and ingenuity on the part of the operators, this may be made an admirable trick, and unlike most others, will bear being repeated, the mystery becoming deeper as passages of varying character and different length are employed. To detect, without confederacy, which of four cards has been turned round in your absence. It will be found upon examining a pack of cards that the white margin round the court cards almost invariably differs in width at the opposite ends. The difference is frequently very trifling, but is still sufficiently noticeable when pointed out, and may be made available for a trick which, though absurdly simple, has puzzled many. You place four court cards of the same rank, say four queens, in a row, face upwards, taking care that the wider margins of the cards are all one way. You then leave the room and invite the company to turn round, lengthways, during your absence, any one or more of the cards. On your return you can readily distinguish which card has been so turned, as the wider margin of such card will now be where the narrower margin was originally, and vice versa. There is so little chance of the trick being discovered, that you may, contrary to the general rule, repeat it if desired. Should you do so, it is better not to replace the cards already turned, as this might give a clue to the secret, but carefully note in your own mind their present position, by remembering which you can discover any card turned just as easily as at first. To arrange twelve cards in rows in such a manner that they will count four in every direction. This is rather a puzzle than a conjuring trick, but may sometimes serve as an interlude to occupy the minds of your audience while you are preparing some other feat. The secret is to place nine of the twelve cards in three rows, so as to form a square. Then place the remaining three cards as follows, the first on the first card of the first row, the second on the second card of the second row, and the last on the third card of the last row. To place the aces and court cards in four rows in such a manner that neither horizontally nor perpendicularly shall there be in either row two cards alike either in suit or value. This also is a puzzle, and a very good one. The key to it is to begin by placing four cards of like value, say four kings, in a diagonal line from corner to corner of the intended square, then four other cards of like value, say the four aces, to form the opposite diagonal. It must be borne in mind that of whatever suit the two center kings are, the two aces must be of the opposite suits. Thus, if the two center kings are those of diamonds and hearts, the two center aces must be those of clubs and spades and in adding the two end aces, you must be careful not to place at either end of the line an ace of the same suit as the king at the corresponding end of the opposite diagonal. Having got so far, you will find it a very easy matter to fill the remaining cards in accordance with the conditions of the puzzle. The sixteen cards when complete will be as in figure thirty-two, subject, of course, to variation according to the particular cards with which you commence your task. The Congress of Court Cards Take the kings, queens, and knaves from the pack, and place them face upwards on the table in three rows of four each, avoiding as much as possible the appearance of arrangement, but really taking care to place them in the following order. In the first row you have only to remember not to have two of the same suit. 
begin the second row with a card of the same suit with which you ended the first. Let the second card be of the same suit as the first of the first row, the third of the same suit as the second of the first row, and so on. The third row will now begin with the suit with which the second left off. The second card will be of the same suit as the first of the second row, and so on. Now pick up the cards in vertical rows, beginning with the last card of the bottom row. The cards may now be cut, not shuffled, any number of times. But if dealt in four heaps, the king, queen, and knave of each suit will come together. End of section 6「Section 7 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Tricks Involving Sleight of Hand, or the Use of Specially Prepared Cards, Part 1. We have already explained the nature and use of the forcing pack of cards. It may be well, before we go further, to give a short account of one or two other species of prepared cards. The Long Card This is the technical name for a card longer or wider by about the thickness of a sixpence than the rest of the pack. This card will naturally project to that extent beyond the general length or width of the other cards, and the performer is thereby enabled to cut the pack at that particular card whenever he chooses to do so. With the aid of such a card, and a tolerable proficiency in forcing and making the pass, many excellent tricks can be performed. Packs with a long card can be obtained at any of the conjuring depots. The best plan, however, is to purchase two ordinary packs precisely alike, and to have the edges of one of them shaved down by a bookbinder to the requisite extent, when you can insert any card of the other pack at pleasure to form your long card and thus avoid the suspicion which would naturally arise from the performance of several tricks with the same card. A still greater improvement upon the ordinary long card pack is the bisote, or tapering pack, in which, though only one pack is used, any card may in turn become the long card. A bisote pack consists of cards all of which are a shade wider, say the thickness of a shilling, at one end than the other. See figure 33, in which, however, the actual difference of width is exaggerated in order to make the shape of the card clear to the eye. When two cards, shaped as above, are placed one upon another, but in opposite directions, the effect is as in figure 34. If the whole pack is at the outset placed with all the cards alike, in other words their ends tapering in the same direction, by reversing any card and returning it to the pack, its wide end is made to correspond with the narrow ends of the remaining cards, thereby making it for the time being a long card. By offering the pack for a person to draw a card, and turning the pack round before the card is replaced, the position of that card will thus be reversed, and you will be able to find it again in an instant, however thoroughly the cards may be shuffled. By prearranging the pack beforehand, with the narrow ends of all the red cards in one direction and those of the black cards in the other direction, you may, by grasping the pack between the finger and thumb at each end, see figure 35, and drawing the hands apart, separate the black cards from the red at a single stroke, or by preparing the pack accordingly, you may divide the court cards from the playing cards in like manner. Many other recreations may be performed with a pack of this kind, which will be noticed in due course. The long card and the bisote pack have each their special advantages and disadvantages. The long card is the more reliable, as it can always be distinguished with certainty from the rest of the pack. But it is very generally known, and after having made use of it for one trick it is clear that you cannot immediately venture upon another with the same card. It is further comparatively useless unless you are proficient in forcing. The bisote pack may be used without any knowledge of forcing and has the advantage that any card may in turn become the key card, but it is treacherous. The necessary turning of the pack is likely to attract observation, and any little mistake, such as allowing the card to be replaced in its original direction, or a few of the cards getting turned round in the shuffling, will cause a breakdown. Notwithstanding these disadvantages, both the long card and the basote pack will be found very useful to the amateur. 
but it should be borne in mind that both these appliances are in reality only makeshifts or substitutes for sleight of hand. Professionals of the highest class discard them altogether, and rely wholly upon the more subtle magic of their own fingers. We subjoin a few of the best of the feats which specially depend upon the use of a long card or the basso de pack. A card having been chosen and returned, and the pack shuffled, to produce the chosen card instantly in various ways. Request some person to draw a card, spreading them before him for that purpose. If you use a long card pack, you must force the long card. If you are using a basote pack, any card may be drawn, the pack being reversed before the card is replaced. The card being returned, the pack may be shuffled to any extent, but you will always be able to cut by feel at the card chosen. You may vary the trick by taking the cards upright between the second finger and thumb of the right hand, and requesting someone to say, one, two, three. At the word three drop all the cards save the card chosen, which its projecting edge will enable you to retain when you relax the pressure upon the other cards. Another mode of finishing the trick is to request any one present to put the pack, previously well shuffled, in his pocket, when you proceed with his permission to pick his pocket of the chosen card. This is an effective trick, and, if you are proficient in sleight of hand, may also be performed with an unprepared pack of cards. In the latter case, when the chosen card is returned to the pack, you make the pass to bring it to the top, palm it, and immediately offer the cards to be shuffled. See figure 15. The pack being returned, you replace the chosen card on the top, and when the pack is placed in the pocket you have only to draw out the top card. The feat of cutting at the chosen card may also by similar means be performed with an ordinary pack. For this purpose you must follow the directions last above given up to the time when, the pack having been shuffled, you replace the palmed card on the top. Then transfer the pack to the left hand and apparently cut with the right. We say apparently, for though to the eye of the spectator you merely cut the cards, you really make the pass by sliding the lower half of the pack to the left the fingers of the left hand at the same moment opening a little to lift the upper packet, and so give room for the upward passage of the lower packet. The cards remaining after the pass in the left hand, which the spectators take to be the bottom half of the pack, are in reality the original upper half, and on the uppermost of such cards being turned up, it is found to be the one which was chosen. Another good mode of finishing the trick is to fling the pack in the air and catch the chosen card. For this purpose, after forcing the long card, and after giving the pack to be shuffled, you cut the pack at the long card as before, but without showing it, and place the original lower half of the pack on the top. The chosen card will now be at the bottom. Take the pack face downwards upon the right hand, and quickly transfer it to the left, at the same time palming with the right hand the bottom card. Spread the cards a little, and fling them into the air, clutching at them with the right hand as they descend and at the same moment bring the chosen card to the tips of the fingers. The effect to the spectators will be as if you actually caught it among the falling cards. This feat also may be performed without the aid of a long card, and without the necessity of forcing a card. In this case, as in the pocket-picking trick, you make the pass as soon as the card is returned to the pack, in order to bring it to the top, and palm it. Then offer the pack to be shuffled. When the cards are handed back, Place the chosen card for a moment on the top of the pack, and endeavor to call attention, indirectly if possible, to the fact that you have no card concealed in your hand. Then again palming the card, you may either yourself fling up the cards or request some other person to do so, and terminate the trick as before. A still more effective form of this trick, in which the chosen card is caught upon the point of a sword, will be found among the card tricks performed by the aid of special apparatus. The following is a good long card trick, but demands considerable proficiency in sleight of hand. You force the long card, allowing it to be returned to any part of the pack, and the whole to be well shuffled. You then say, you must be by this time pretty certain that even if I knew your card in the first instance I must have quite lost sight of it now. If you do not feel quite certain, please shuffle the cards once more. Everyone being fully satisfied that the card is completely lost in the pack, you continue, let me assure you that I do not know any more than yourselves whereabouts in the pack your card is at this moment. You can all see that I have no duplicate card concealed in my hands. 
I will now take the top card, whatever it may be, or, if you prefer it, any one may draw a card from any part of the pack, and I will at once change it to the card originally chosen. The audience will probably prefer to draw a card, which, when they have done, you continue. I presume the card you have just drawn is not the one originally chosen. Will the gentleman who drew the first card look at it and see if it is his card? The reply is pretty certain to be in the negative. During the discussion you have taken the opportunity to slip the little finger of the left hand immediately above the long card, which it will be remembered was that first drawn, and to make the pass, thereby bringing it to the top and enabling you to palm it. You now ask the person holding the second card to place it on the top of the pack, which you immediately transfer to the right hand, thus bringing the palmed card upon it. You then say, to show you that this trick is not performed by sleight of hand or by any manipulation of the cards I will not even touch them, but will place them here on the table in sight of all. Will the gentleman who drew the first card please to say what his card was? The card being named, you slowly and deliberately turn over the top card, which will be found to be transformed into that first chosen. The other card is now the next card on the top of the pack, and as somebody may suspect this, and by examining the pack gain a partial clue to the trick, it will be well to take an early opportunity of removing this card, either by shuffling or by making the pass to bring it to the center of the pack. If you make use of a bisote pack, there is of course no necessity for forcing the card in the first instance. You may also reveal a chosen card with very good effect in the following manner. A card having been freely drawn, open the pack in such a manner that it may be placed when returned immediately under the long card, which, by the way, should in this instance really be a wide card, though the term long card applies, as already mentioned, to both kinds of card. The pack may be moderately shuffled, with very little risk of the two cards being separated, the greater width of the long card tending to shelter the card beneath it, and making it very unlikely that that card will be displaced. If after the shuffle the long card does not happen to be tolerably high up in the pack, you should cut the cards in such a manner as to make it so. Holding the cards in a horizontal position, face downwards, above the table, the thumb being on one side and the fingers on the other side of the pack, you say, Ladies and gentlemen, I am now about to drop the cards, a few at a time, in a number of little heaps upon the table, stopping when you tell me to do so. It will be equally open to you to stop me when I have made one or two heaps only, or not until I have made seven or eight, but whenever it is, the card at the top of the heap last made will be the identical card which was just now drawn, and which has since, as you have seen, been thoroughly shuffled in the pack. You now drop the cards, four or five at a time, on various parts of the table. When the word stop is pronounced, you let go all the remaining cards below the long card, which from its greater width a very slight pressure suffices to retain. The card chosen having been next below the long card is now at the top of the last heap. You ask the person who drew to name his card, and touching the back of the top card with your wand, turn it over to show that it is the right one. If you are tolerably expert in sleight of hand, you may repeat the trick in a yet more striking manner. Proceed as before up to the moment when the word stop is pronounced. Having let fall as before all the cards below the long card, lay down the remainder of the pack, and take in the left hand the heap which you last dealt. Cover it with the right hand for an instant, and sliding away the hand gently to the right, palm the top card, and immediately take by one corner the next card, holding it face downwards, until the drawer has named his card, which was, we will suppose, the Queen of Hearts. As soon as the card is named, you turn towards the audience, the face of the card you hold, saying, Here is the card, as before. Do not look at it yourself, but at once replace it on the pack, and covering the pack with the right hand, leave the palmed card upon it. You are by this time made aware by a murmur, if not a more decided manifestation on the part of the audience, that something is wrong. You ask what is the matter, and are told that, so far from showing the Queen of Hearts, the card you produced was a totally different one, say, the Seven of Spades. You pretend to look embarrassed, and ask if they are quite sure. It is very strange, you remark. I never failed in this trick before. Will you allow me to try again? then appearing to recollect yourself. Oh, of course, you exclaim, I forgot to touch the card with the magic wand. You do so. Will someone be kind enough to look at the card now? The card is examined, and proves to be, as it ought to have been originally, the Queen of Hearts. 
to teach the company a trick which they learn without difficulty, then to allow them to succeed or to cause them to fail at your pleasure. This surprising trick is performed with the piquet pack of thirty-two cards, from which you must beforehand take away, and secretly pocket, one card of each suit, the spectators, however, believing that you use the whole thirty-two cards. You announce to the company that you will teach them a trick. You deal the cards face upward, in rows of four, according to the rules set forth in the trick already described under the title of the Congress of Court Cards. In other words, you place a card of each suit in the top row. You commence each row with a card of the suit with which the row above ended. You make the second of each row the same suit as the first of the row above, and the third the same suit as the second of the row above, and so on. Thus, if your top row be club, diamond, heart, spade, your second will be spade, club, diamond, heart, your third heart, spade, club, diamond, your fourth diamond, heart, spade, club, your fifth club, diamond, heart, spade your sixth spade club diamond heart, and your seventh heart spade club diamond. You now gather up the cards, as directed in the trick already mentioned, in other words, in vertical rows from the bottom upwards, commencing at the right-hand bottom corner. The pack thus arranged may be cut any number of times, but if dealt in four heaps, all the cards of each suit will be found together. So far, the trick is ingenious rather than astonishing, although the arrangement of the cards having reference only to the suits, and not to individual cards, the cards do not at first sight appear to be specially arranged. And if you are rapid and apparently careless in placing them, the spectators will in all probability believe that they are placed haphazard. If you can induce this belief, you will greatly heighten their surprise at finding the different suits regularly sorted after the deal. But the trick is not yet finished. You again place the cards as before, remarking that the trick is simplicity itself when once the principle is known, and on this occasion you draw special attention to the necessary arrangement of the cards. Having completed the trick for the second time, you invite some of the audience to try their hands, which they do, and of course succeed, there being really no difficulty in the matter. When one or two have tried and succeeded, they will probably disparage the trick as being absurdly easy. Pardon me, you say. You have succeeded so far because it was my will and pleasure that you should do so. You seem incredulous, but I am perfectly serious. To prove that I am so, I give you warning that the next person who attempts the trick will fail. Come, who accepts the challenge? Someone is sure to respond, and in all probability to offer you a bet that he will succeed. Sir, you reply, I never bet on certainties, or your money would be already lost. I have said that you shall fail and you cannot therefore possibly succeed. You have meanwhile secretly palmed the four cards which you pocketed before beginning the trick, and have watched your opportunity to replace them on the table with the rest of the pack. Your opponent may now try as much as he pleases, but he cannot possibly succeed, the fact being that the process above described produces the desired effect with twenty-eight cards, but will not do so with thirty-two. The first thought of your audience is sure to be that you have abstracted some of the cards in order to make the trick fail, but on counting they find the number correct. Not one in a hundred will suspect that the reverse is the case, and that when you performed the trick the pack was incomplete. By the time three or four of the company have tried and failed, you will probably have found an opportunity of again pocketing a card of each suit, and you may announce that, having sufficiently proved your power, you will now graciously condescend to remove the prohibition and allow the next person who tries to succeed. This, of course, he will do, and the trick may very well end here, with the satisfaction on your part that you have kept your secret, and that, even when removed from the sphere of your adverse influence, your pupils will fail in performing the trick, making the attempt as they naturally will with the full piquet pack. But it is just possible that a contretemps may arise, for which it will be well to be prepared. Some one of the audience, more acute than the generality, may suggest again counting the cards, to see if all are there when the trick succeeds. Even in this case you need not be discomfited. At once offer yourself to count the cards, and gathering them up for that purpose, add to them the four which you removed which you should again have palmed in readiness. Count them deliberately on to the table, and when every one is satisfied that the pack is complete, 
announce that you will once more perform the trick in order to let everyone see that you actually use no more and no less than thirty-two cards. Place the cards as before, counting aloud as you do so, till the whole thirty-two cards are placed. So far you have not varied your method of proceeding, but to succeed with the whole thirty-two cards, you must secretly make a slight variation in the manner of picking up. You will remember that the cards were picked up face upwards, beginning from the bottom of the right-hand row, placing the cards of that row on those of the next row, and so on. Now, to perform the trick with thirty-two cards, the bottom cards of each row must be gathered up all together, and placed on the face of the pack. Thus, if the bottom card of the first or left-hand row be the knave of spades, that of the second row the ten of diamonds, that of the third row the ace of hearts, and that of the fourth row the seven of clubs, those four cards must be picked up as follows. The knave of spades must be placed face upwards on the ten of diamonds, the ten of diamonds on the ace of hearts, and the ace of hearts on the seven of clubs, which will occupy its own place on the face of the cards of the last or right-hand row. For convenience of picking up, it will be well to place the four rows very near together, slightly converging on the bottom, when it will be tolerably easy by a bold, quick sweep of the left hand, from left to right, to slide the three other cards in due order on the bottom card of the last row, while the performer, looking not at the cards but at his audience, diverts their attention by any observations which may occur to him. The trick in this form requires considerable address, and the performer should not therefore venture upon it until by frequent practice he can be certain of placing the four cards neatly with his left hand, and without looking at his hands, which would infallibly draw the eyes of the audience in the same direction, and thereby spoil the trick. To distinguish the court cards by touch. This trick is performed by means of a preliminary preparation of the court cards, to be made as follows. Take each court card separately, edge upwards, and draw a tolerably sharp knife, the blade held sloping backwards at an angle of about forty-five degrees, once or twice along the edge from left to right. This will be found to turn the edge of the card, so to speak, and to leave on each side a minute ridge, not noticeable by the eye, but immediately perceptible if sought for to the touch. Prepare the opposite edge of the card in the same way, and again mix the court cards with the pack, which is now ready for use. Offer the prepared pack to be shuffled. When the pack is returned to you, you may either hold it above your head and, showing the cards in succession, call court card or plain card, as the case may be, or you may offer to deal the cards into two heaps, consisting of court cards in one heap and plain cards in the other, every now and then offering the cards to be again shuffled. You can, of course, perform the trick blindfold with equal facility. You should endeavor to conceal as much as possible the fact that you distinguish the court cards by the sense of touch, and rather seek to make your audience believe that the trick is performed by means of some mathematical principle, or by any other means remote from the true explanation. This advice, indeed, applies more or less to all tricks. Thus your knowledge of a forced card depends, of course, on sleight of hand, but you should by no means let this be suspected, but rather claim credit for some clairvoyant faculty and vice versa. When you perform a trick depending on a mathematical combination, endeavor to lead your audience to believe that it is performed by means of some impossible piece of sleight of hand. Further, endeavor to vary your modus operandi. If you have just performed a trick depending purely on sleight of hand, do not let the next be of the same character, but rather one based on a mathematical principle, or on the use of special apparatus. End of section 7 Section 8 of Modern Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman Tricks Involving Sleight of Hand or the Use of Specially Prepared Cards Part two. To name any number of cards in succession without seeing them. First method. This trick, in its original form, is so well known that it is really not worth performing. But we describe it for the sake of completeness, 
and for the better comprehension of the improved method. The performer takes the pack, and secretly notices the bottom card. He then announces that he will name all the cards of the pack in succession, without seeing them. Holding the pack behind him for an instant, he turns the top card face outwards on the top of the pack. Then holding the pack with the bottom card towards the audience, he names that card. From the position in which he holds the pack, the top card, which he has turned, is towards him, and in full view. Again placing his hands behind him, he transfers the last named to the bottom, and turns the next, and so on in like manner. Even in an audience of half a dozen only, it is very likely that there will be some one acquainted with this form of the trick, who will proclaim aloud his knowledge of how it is done. We will suppose that you have performed the trick with this result. Passing your hands again behind you, but this time merely passing the top card to the bottom, without turning any other card, you reply that you doubt his pretended knowledge, and name the card as before. He will naturally justify his assertion by explaining the mode of performing the trick. You reply, according to your theory, there should be an exposed card at each end of the pack. Pray observe that there is nothing of the kind in this case. Here you show the opposite side of the pack. But to give a still more conclusive proof, I will for the future keep the whole of the pack behind me, and name each card before I bring it forward. Perhaps to preclude any idea of arrangement of the cards, someone will kindly shuffle them. When the cards are returned, you give them a slight additional shuffle yourself, and remarking, They are pretty well shuffled now, I think. Continue the trick by the second method. Glance as before at the bottom card. Place the cards behind you, and name the card you have just seen. Passing the right hand behind you, palm the top card, and then taking hold of the bottom card, the one you have just named, face outwards, with the two first fingers and thumb of the same hand, bring it forward, and throw it on the table. Pause for a moment before you throw it down, as if asking the company to verify the correctness of your assertion, and glance secretly at the card which is curled up in your palm. Again place your hands behind you, call the name of the card you last palmed, and palm another. You can, of course, continue the trick as long as you please, each time naming the card which you palmed at the last call. You should take care to have a tolerably wide space between yourself and your audience in which case, with a very little management on your part, there is little fear of their discovering the secret of the palmed card. You should not be in too great a hurry to name the card you have just seen, or the audience may suspect that you gained your knowledge in the act of bringing forward the card you last named. To negative this idea, you should take care first to bring forward again the right hand, manifestly empty, and do your best to simulate thought and mental exertion before naming the next card. To make four cards change from eights to twos, from black to red, etc. For this trick you require three specially prepared cards. The backs should be similar to those of the pack which you have in ordinary use, the faces being as depicted in figure 36. They may be purchased at any of the conjuring depots. You place these three cards privately at the bottom of the pack. You begin by remarking that you will show the company a good trick with the four eights and the two of diamonds. If you use a piquet pack, you must provide yourself with a special two of diamonds of similar pattern to the rest of the pack. You take the pack, and picking out the four genuine eights, hand them for examination. While they are being inspected, you insert the little finger of your left hand between the three bottom cards, the prepared cards, and the rest of the pack. When the eights are returned, you place them with apparent carelessness on the top of the pack, taking care, however, to have the eight of clubs uppermost, and hand the two of diamonds for examination. While this card is being examined, you make the pass to bring the three prepared cards to the top. The two of diamonds being returned, you lay it on the table, and taking off the top four cards, which are now the three prepared cards, and the eight of clubs, you spread them fan-wise when they will appear to be the four eights, as in figure 37. The eight of clubs is alone completely visible, one half of each of the cards being covered by the card next preceding it. 
The spectators naturally take the four cards to be the four ordinary eights which they have just examined. Insert the two of diamonds behind the eight of clubs, and lay that card in turn on the table. Close the cards, and again spread them, but this time with the opposite ends outward, when they will appear to be the four twos, as in figure thirty-eight. Again take in the eight of clubs in place of the two of diamonds, and turn round the supposed two of hearts. This you may do easily and naturally by remarking, I must now touch something black, my coat sleeve will do. I gently pass either card along it, thus, and replace it as before. The cards are now all black cards, which they actually appear to be. See figure 39. Again substitute the two of diamonds for the eight of clubs, touch any red object, and again turn and spread out the cards, when they will appear to be all red cards, as in figure 40. Once more take in the eight of clubs in place of the two of diamonds, and replace the four cards on the pack, again making the pass in order to bring the three prepared cards to the bottom, and to leave the genuine eights on the top. There is a more elaborate form of this trick procurable at the conjuring depots, in which several groups of cards are used in succession, and the changes are proportionately multiplied, various colors and patterns being produced in the place of the ordinary figures on the cards. In our own opinion the trick loses rather than gains by this great elaboration, as the more fanciful changes have the disadvantage of showing clearly, which the simpler form of the trick does not, that the cards used are not ordinary cards and this being once understood, the magic of the trick is destroyed. We have had occasion more than once to direct you to turn round the cards, and it will be well for you to know how to do this neatly and without exciting suspicion. Hold the four cards fanwise in the left hand, the fingers behind and the thumb in front of the cards. Having exhibited them, turn their faces towards yourself, and with the thumb and finger of the right hand close the fan and taking them by their upper ends lay them face downwards on the table. Their lower ends will now be away from you, and when you desire again to exhibit the cards in a transformed condition, you have only to turn them over sideways, and pick them up by the ends which are now directed towards you. This little artifice, which is simplicity itself in practice, though a little difficult to describe, must be carefully studied, as upon neat manipulation in this respect. The illusion of the trick mainly depends. A card having been drawn, and returned, and the pack shuffled, to make it appear at such number as the company choose. Invite a person to draw a card. Spread out the pack that he may replace it, and slip your little finger above it. Make the pass in order to bring the chosen card to the top. Palm it, and offer the pack to be shuffled. When the pack is returned to you, replace the chosen card on the top and make the first of the false shuffles above described, but commence by sliding off into the right hand the two top cards, instead of the top card only, so that the chosen card may after the shuffle be last but one from the bottom. Take the pack face downwards in the left hand, and carelessly move about the pack so that the bottom card may be full in view of the audience. Inquire at what number the company would like the card to appear, and when they have made their decision, Hold the pack face downwards, and with the first and second fingers of the right hand, draw away the cards from the bottom one by one, throwing each on the table face upwards, and counting aloud, one, two, three, and so on. The first card which you draw is naturally the bottom one, and the chosen card, which is second, would in the ordinary course come next. But you draw back this card with the third finger of the left hand and take the next instead, continuing in like manner, until you have reached one short of the number at which the card is to appear. You now pause, and say, the next card should be the card you drew. To avoid any mistake, will you kindly say beforehand what it was, at the same time placing the card face downwards on the table. When the card is named, you request the drawer, or some other person, to turn it up when it is found to be the right one. Another Method the card having been drawn and replaced, bring it to the top by the pass, palm it, have the pack shuffled, and replace it on the top. Invite the audience to choose at what number it shall appear. They choose, we will suppose, fifth. Very good, you reply. Permit me in the first place to show you that it is not there already. 
Deal out the first five cards, face downwards, and show that the fifth is not the chosen card. Replace the five cards in their present order on the pack, when the card will be at the number named. Several persons having each drawn and returned a card, to make each card appear at such number in the pack as the drawer chooses. Allow three or four persons each to draw a card. When all have drawn, make the pass in such manner as to bring the two halves of the pack face to face. The pack should not, however, be equally divided. The upper portion should only consist of about half a dozen cards, and therefore in making the pass you should insert the finger only at that number of cards from the bottom. Receive back the drawn cards on the top of the pack, ruffling the cards and saying, Pass, as each card is replaced. You may casually remark, Your card has vanished. Did you see it go? When all are returned, you quickly turn over the pack, and taking off the top card, say, addressing yourself to the person who last returned a card, you see your card has vanished, as I told you. At what number in the pack, say, from the first to the tenth, would you like it to reappear? We will suppose the answer to be the sixth. You deal five cards from the end of the pack that is now uppermost. Then, pretending a momentary hesitation, say, I fancy I dealt two cards for one. Allow me to count them again. This draws the general attention to the cards on the table, and gives you the opportunity to again turn over the pack. You continue, after counting. We have five. This makes six. Then this should be your card. Will you say what the card was? You place the card on the table, face downwards, and do not turn it till it is named, this giving you the opportunity to again turn over the pack, to be ready to repeat the operation with the next card. You must be careful to invite the different persons to call for their cards in the reverse order to that in which they are replaced in the pack. Thus you first address the person who last returned his card, and then the last but one, and so on. You must tax your ingenuity for devices to take off the attention of the spectators from the pack at the moment when it is necessary to turn it over. And as each repetition of the process increases the chance of detection, it is well not to allow more than three or four cards to be drawn. If you have reason to fear that the cards left undealt will run short, you may always replace any number of those already dealt upon the reverse end of the pack to that at which the chosen cards are. The Three-Card Trick This well-known trick has long been banished from the repertoire of the conjurer, and is now used only by the itinerant sharpers who infest race-courses and country fairs. We insert the explanation of it in this place as exemplifying one form of sleight of hand, and also as a useful warning to the unwary. In its primary form, the trick is only an illusion of the well-known fact that the hand can move quicker than the eye can follow. It is performed with three cards, a court card and two plain cards. The operator holds them face downwards, one between the second finger and thumb of the left hand, and the other two, of which the court card is one, one between the first finger and thumb, and the other between the second finger and thumb of the right hand, the latter being the outermost. Bringing the hands quickly together and then quickly apart, he drops the three cards in succession, and challenges the bystanders to say which is the court card. If the movement is quickly made, it is almost impossible, even for the keenest eye, to decide with certainty whether the upper or lower card falls first from the hand, and consequently which of the three cards, as they lie, is the court card. This is the whole of the trick, if fairly performed, and so far it would be a fair subject for betting, though the chances would be much against the person guessing. But another element is introduced by the swindling fraternity, which ensures the discomfiture of the unwary speculator. The operator is aided by three or four confederates, or bonnets, whose business it is to start the betting, and who of course are allowed to win. After this has gone on for a little time, and a sufficient ring of spectators has been got together, the operator makes use of some plausible pretext to look aside from the cards for a moment. While he does so, one of the confederates, with a wink at the bystanders, slyly bends up one corner of the court card, ostensibly as a means of recognition. The performer takes up the cards without apparently noticing the trick that has been played upon him, but secretly, 
that corner of the card being concealed by the third and fourth fingers of the right hand, straightens the bent corner, and at the same moment bends in like manner the corresponding corner of the other card in the same hand. He then throws down the cards as before. The bent corner is plainly visible, and the spectators, who do not suspect the change that has been made, are fully persuaded that the card so bent, and no other, is the court card. Speculating, as they imagine, on a certainty, they are easily induced to bet that they will discover the court card, and they naturally name the one with the bent corner. When the card is turned, they find, to their disgust, that they have been duped, and that the dishonest advantage which they imagined they had obtained over the dealer was in reality a device for their confusion. TO NAIL A CHOSEN CARD TO THE WALL Procure a sharp drawing-pin, and place it point upwards on the table, mantelpiece, or any other place where it will not attract the notice of the spectators, and yet be so close to you that you can cover it with your hand without exciting suspicion. Ask any person to draw a card. When he returns it to the pack, make the pass to bring it to the top, palm it, and immediately offer the pack to be shuffled. While this is being done, place your right hand carelessly over the pin, so as to bring the center of the card as near as possible over it, and then press gently on the card, so as to make the point of the pin just penetrate it. When the pack is returned, place the palmed card upon the top, and thus press home the pin, which will project about a quarter of an inch through the back of the card. Request the audience to indicate any point upon the woodwork of the apartment at which they would like the chosen card to appear, and when the spot is selected, stand at two or three feet distance, and fling the cards, backs foremost, heavily against it, doing your best to make them strike as flat as possible, when the other cards will fall to the ground, but the selected one will remain firmly pinned to the woodwork. Some little practice will be necessary before you can make certain of throwing the pack so as to strike in the right position. Until you can be quite sure of doing this, it is better to be content with merely striking the pack against the selected spot. The result is the same, though the effect is less surprising than when the cards are actually thrown from the hand. The Inseparable Sevens Place secretly beforehand three of the four eights at the bottom of the pack, the fourth eight, which is not wanted for the trick, being left in whatever position it may happen to occupy. The suit of this fourth eight must be borne in mind, for a reason which will presently appear. Now select openly the four sevens from the pack and spread them on the table. While the company are examining them, privately slip the little finger of the left hand immediately above the three eights at the bottom, so as to be in readiness to make the pass. Gather up the four sevens and place them on the top of the pack, taking care that the seven of the same suit as the fourth eight is uppermost. Make a few remarks as to the affectionate disposition of the four sevens, which, however far apart they are placed in the pack, will always come together, and watch your opportunity to make the pass, so as to bring the three eights, originally at the bottom, to the top. If you are sufficiently expert, you may make the pass at the very instant that you place the four sevens on the top of the pack, but unless you are very adroit, it is better to bide your time and make it an instant later when the attention of the audience is less attracted to your hands. You then continue, I shall now take these sevens, you can see for yourselves that I have not removed them, and place them in different parts of the pack. At the words, you can see for yourselves, etc., you take off the four top cards and show them fan-wise. In reality, three of them are eights, but the fourth and foremost card being actually a seven, and the eighth pip of each of the other cards being concealed by the card before it, and the audience having, as they imagine, already seen the same cards spread out fairly upon the table, there is nothing to suggest a doubt that they are actually the sevens. You will now see the reason why it is necessary to place uppermost the seven of the same suit as the absent eight. If you had not done so, the seven in question would have been of the same suit as one or the other of the three sham sevens, and the audience, knowing that there could not be two sevens of the same suit, would at once see through the trick. Again folding up the four cards, you insert the top one a little above the bottom of the pack, the second a little higher, the third a little higher still, and the fourth, which is a genuine seven, upon the top of the pack. 
The four sevens, which are apparently so well distributed throughout the pack, are really together on the top, and you have only to make the pass, or, if you prefer it, simply cut the cards to cause them to be found together in the center of the pack. End of section 8《Section 9 of Modern Magic》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic — A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman Tricks Involving Sleight of Hand or the Use of Specially Prepared Cards Part 3 The Inseparable Aces this is really only another form of the last trick, though it differs a good deal in effect. You first pick out and exhibit on the table the four aces and request someone to replace them on the pack, when you place three other cards secretly upon them. This you may either do by bringing three cards from the bottom by the pass, or you may, while the company's attention is occupied in examining the aces, palm three cards from the top in the right hand, and after the aces are replaced on the top, simply cover them with that hand, thereby bringing the three palmed cards upon them. You now say, I am about to distribute these aces in different parts of the pack. Pray observe that I do so fairly. As you say this, you take off and hold up to the audience the four top cards, being the three indifferent cards with an ace at the bottom. You cannot, of course, exhibit them fanwise, as in the last trick, or the deception would be at once detected. But the spectators, seeing an ace at the bottom and having no particular reason for suspecting otherwise, naturally believe that the cards you hold are really the four aces. Laying the four cards on the table, you distribute them, as in the last trick, in different parts of the pack, taking care, however, that the last card, which is the genuine ace, is placed among the three already at the top. You now invite someone to cut. When he has done so, you take up the two halves in their transposed position in the left hand, at the same time slipping the little finger of that hand between them. The four aces are now, of course, upon the top of the lower packet. You then announce, I am now about to order the four aces, which you have seen so well divided, to come together again. Would you like them to appear on the top, at the bottom, or in the middle of the pack? I should tell you that I know perfectly well beforehand which you will choose and indeed I have already placed them at that particular spot. If the answer is, in the middle, you have only to withdraw the little finger and invite the company to examine the pack to see that they are already so placed. If the answer is on the top, you make the pass to bring them there. To produce them at the bottom is rather more difficult, and unless you are pretty confident as to your neatness of manipulation, it will be well to limit the choice to top or middle. In order to be able to bring the four aces to the bottom, you must, in picking up the cards after the cut, push forward a little with the left thumb the four top cards of the lower packet, and slip the little finger below and the third finger above them, so as to be able to make the pass before or below those four cards as occasion may require. If you are required to bring those four cards to the top, you must withdraw the little finger, thereby joining those cards to the upper cards of the lower packet and make the pass with the aid of the third finger instead of the fourth. If, on the contrary, you desire to produce the four aces at the bottom, you simply withdraw the third finger, thereby leaving the aces at the bottom of the upper packet, when the pass will bring them to the bottom of the pack. We have described the trick as performed with aces, but the effect will, of course, be the same with four kings, four queens, or any other four similar cards. Having placed the four aces in different positions of the pack, to make the two black change places with the two red ones, and finally to bring all four together in the middle of the pack. This trick may immediately follow that last described. Again selecting the four aces, or such other four cards as you used for the last trick, and placing them on the table, take the two red ones, and opening the pack bookwise in the left hand, ostentatiously place them in the middle at the same time secretly slipping your little finger between them. Ask the audience to particularly notice which of the aces are placed in the middle and which at top and bottom. Next, place one of the black aces on the top 
and then turning over the pack by extending your left hand, place the remaining black ace at the bottom. As you again turn over the pack to its former position, make the pass, which the movement of the pack in turning over in the hand will be found to facilitate. The two halves of the pack having now changed places, the aces will naturally have changed their positions also, the two black ones now being in the middle and the two red ones at top and bottom. But it would be very indiscreet to allow the audience to know that this is already the case. As has already been mentioned, when a given change has taken or is about to take place, you should always seek to mislead the spectators as to the time of the change as they are thereby the less likely to detect the mode in which it is affected. In accordance with this principle, you should endeavor in the present case to impress firmly upon the minds of your audience that the cards are as they have seen you place them, and for that purpose it will be well to ask someone to say over again, for the general satisfaction, in what parts of the pack the four aces are. At this point a contretemps may arise, for which it is well to be prepared. The person interrogated may possibly forget the relative position of the two colors, and may therefore ask to see again how the cards are placed. Or some person may have seen or suspected that you have already placed them, and may make a similar request for the purpose of embarrassing you. In order to be prepared for such a contingency, it is desirable, after you make the pass, as above mentioned, not to allow the two halves of the pack to immediately coalesce, but to keep them still separated by the little finger. If you have done this, and for any reason it becomes necessary to show the cards a second time in their original condition, you have only to again make the pass, in order to bring them back to the same position which they occupied at first, making it a third time in order to effect the change. We will suppose that the audience are at length fully satisfied that the two red aces are in the middle, and the two black ones at the opposite ends of the pack. You then say, Ladies and gentlemen, I am about to command these aces to change places. Pray observe by what a very simple movement the transposition is effected. Making a quick upward movement with the right hand, you ruffle the cards at the same moment saying, Pass. Turning the faces of the card to the audience, you show them that the red aces are now at the top and bottom, and the black ones in the middle. While exhibiting them, take an opportunity to slip the little finger between these latter, and enclosing the cards, while they are still face upwards, again make the pass, and place the pack face downwards on the table. You then say, I have now, as you see, made the aces change places. I don't know whether you saw how I did it. Perhaps I was a little too quick for you. This time I will do it as slowly as you please, or if you prefer it, I will not even touch the cards with my hands, but merely place my wand upon the pack. So. Pass. Will you please to examine the pack for yourselves when you will find that the aces have again changed places, and have returned to their original positions? This is found to be the case. You continue, You have not found me out yet? Well, to reward your attention, as this really is a very good trick, I will show you how to do it for yourselves. Pick out the four aces, and hand the two red ones to one person, and the two black ones to another person. Then, taking the pack in your left hand, and addressing yourself first to the person on your right, request him to place the two aces, which he holds respectively at the top and bottom of the pack. Then, turning to the other person, request him to place the two other aces in the middle of the pack, which you apparently open midway with the right hand for the purpose. In reality, instead of merely lifting up, as you appear to do, the top half of the pack, you make the pass by sliding out the bottom half of the pack to the left. This movement is completely lost in your quick half-turn to the left as you address the second person, which so covers the smaller movement of the cards as to make it absolutely imperceptible. And it is in order to create the excuse for this useful half-turn that we have recommended you to place the aces in the hands of two different persons, and to begin with the person on your right. When the second pair of aces are thus replaced in the middle of the pack, they are in reality placed between the two others, which the audience believe to be still at top and bottom. You now hand the pack to a person to hold, placing it face downwards in his palm, and requesting him to hold it very tightly, thus preventing any premature discovery of the top or bottom card. You then say, 
I have promised to show you how to perform this trick. To make it still more striking, we will have this time a little variation. Instead of merely changing places, we will make all the four aces come together. Then addressing the person who holds the cards, you continue, The manner of performing this trick is simplicity itself, though it looks so surprising. Will you take my wand in your right hand? Hold the cards very tightly, and touch the back with this end of the wand. Quite right. Now say, Pass. It is very simple, you see. Let us consider whether you have succeeded. Look over the pack yourself. Yes, there are the aces all together, as well as I could have done it myself. You can try it again by yourself at your leisure, but please don't tell anyone else the secret, or you will ruin my business. The above delusive offer to show how it's done can be equally well adapted to many other tricks, and never fails to create amusement. A card having been thought of, to make such card vanish from the pack, and be discovered wherever the performer pleases. This trick should be performed with twenty-seven cards only. You deal the cards face upwards in three packs, requesting one of the company to note a card, and to remember in which heap it is. When you have dealt the three heaps, you inquire in which heap the chosen card is, and place the other two heaps face upwards as they lie upon that heap. Then turn over the cards, and deal again in like manner. You again inquire which heap the chosen card is now in. Place that heap undermost as before, and deal again for the third time, when the card thought of will be the first card dealt of one or other of the three heaps. You have therefore only to bear in mind the first card of each heap to know, when the proper heap is pointed out, what the card is. You do not, however, disclose your knowledge, but gather up the cards as before, with the designated heap undermost. When the cards are turned over, that heap naturally becomes uppermost, and the chosen card, being the first card of that heap, is now the top card of the pack. You palm this card, and hand the remaining cards to be shuffled. Having now gained not only the knowledge, but the actual possession of the chosen card, you can finish the trick in a variety of ways. You may, when the pack is returned, replace the card on the top, and giving the pack face upwards to a person to hold, strike out of his hand all but the chosen card. Or you may, if you prefer it, name the chosen card and announce that it will now leave the pack, and fly into a person's pocket, or any other place you choose to name where, it being already in your hand, you can very easily find it. A very effective finish is produced by taking haphazard any card from the pack and announcing that to be the chosen card, and on being told that it is the wrong card, apologizing for your mistake, and forthwith changing it by the fifth method to the right one. Some fun may also be created as follows. You name, in the first instance, a wrong card, say the seven of hearts. On being told that that was not the card thought of, you affect surprise, and inquire what the card thought of was. You are told, let us say, the king of hearts. Ah, you remark, that settles it. I felt sure you were mistaken. You could not possibly have seen the king of hearts, for you have been sitting on that card all evening. Will you oblige me by standing up for a moment? And on the request being complied with, you apparently take the card, which you have already palmed, from off the chair on which the person has been sitting. The more shrewd of the company may conjecture that you intentionally named a wrong card in order to heighten the effect of the trick, but a fair proportion will always be found to credit your assertion, and will believe that the victim had really, by some glamour on your part, been induced to imagine he saw a card which he was actually sitting on. This trick is frequently performed with the whole thirty-two cards of the bouquet pack. The process and result are the same, save that the card thought of must be one of the twenty-seven cards first dealt. The chances are greatly against one of the last five cards being the card thought of. But in such an event, the trick would break down, as it would in that case require four cards instead of three to bring the chosen card to the top of the pack. It is a good plan to deal the five surplus cards in a row by themselves, and after each deal turn up one of them, and gravely study it as if these cards were in some way connected with the trick. To cause a number of cards to multiply invisibly in a person's keeping. Secretly count any number, say a dozen, of the top cards, and slip the little finger of the left hand between those cards and the rest of the pack. 
invite a person to take as many cards as he pleases, at the same time putting into his hands all or nearly all of the separated cards. If he does not take all, you will be able to see at a glance, by the number that remains above your little finger, how many he has actually taken. Pretend to weigh in your hand the remaining cards, and say, we assume that you are using a piquet pack, I should say by the weight that I have exactly twenty-two cards here, so you must have taken ten. Will you see if I am right? While he is counting the cards he has taken, count off secretly from the pack and palm them in the right hand four more. When he has finished his counting, you say, Now will you please gather these cards together and place your hand firmly upon them? As you say this, you push them towards him with your right hand. This enables you to add to them, without attracting notice, the four cards in that hand. Continue. Now how many cards shall I add to those in your hand? You must not be too extravagant, say three or four. The person addressed will probably select one or other of the numbers named, but you must be prepared for the possibility of his naming a smaller number. If he says four, you have only to ruffle the cards in your hand, or make any other gesture which may ostensibly affect the transposition, and he will find on examination that the cards under his hand are increased by four, according to his desire. If he says three, you say, please give me back one card, to show the others the way. This makes the number right. If two are asked for, you may ask for two cards to show the way, or you may say, two, very good. Shall I send a couple more for anybody else? when some one or other is pretty sure to accept your offer. If one only is asked for, you must get two or three persons to take one each, taking care always by one or the other expedient to make the number correspond with the number you have secretly added. While the attention of the company is attracted by the counting of the cards, to see if you have performed your undertaking, again palm the same number of cards as was last selected, suppose three, and after the cards are counted, gather them up, and give them to some other person to hold, adding to them the three just palmed. Then taking the number of cards from the top of the pack, and again replacing them, say, I will now send these three cards into your hands in the same manner. Ruffle the cards as before, and upon examination, the number of cards in the person's hands will again be found to be increased by three. The pack being divided into two portions, placed in the keeping of two different persons, to make three cards pass invisibly from the one to the other. This trick is identical in principle with the one last described, but the mise en scène is more elaborate, and several circumstances concur to give it a surprising effect. It was a special favorite with the late Monsieur Robert Houdin, and we shall proceed to describe it as nearly as possible in the form in which it was presented by him. The performer brings forward a pack of cards, still in the official envelope. These he hands to a spectator, with a request that he will open and count them. He does so, and finds that they have the full complement of thirty-two or fifty-two, as the case may be. He is next requested to cut the pack into two portions, pretty nearly equal, and to choose one of the packets. Having made this selection, he is further asked to count the cards in the packet chosen the general attention being, meanwhile, drawn away from the performer, he has ample opportunity to get ready in his right hand, duly palmed, three cards of another pack, but of similar pattern to those of the pack in use. These may previously be placed either on the servante or in the performer's right hand pochette, or he may, if he prefers it, have them ready palmed in his right hand when he comes upon the stage to commence the trick. The spectator, having duly counted the chosen pack, declares it to consist, say, of seventeen cards. A capital number for the trick, remarks the performer. Now, sir, will you be kind enough to take these seventeen cards in your own hands? Here he pushes them carelessly towards him, and joins the three palmed cards to them. And hold them well up above your head, that every one may see them? Thank you. Now. As your packet contains seventeen cards, this other, we are supposing a piquet pack to be used, should contain fifteen. Let us see whether you have counted right. The performer himself audibly counts the remaining packet, card by card, on the table, immediately afterwards taking the heap in his left hand, 
and squaring the cards together, thus obtaining the opportunity to separate and palm in his right hand the three top cards. He continues, Fifteen cards here. And how many did you say, sir? Yes, seventeen, which the gentleman holds, making thirty-two. Quite right. Now, will someone else oblige me by taking charge of these fifteen cards? He hands the cards with the left hand, and at the same moment drops the three palmed cards into the profonde on the right side, immediately bringing up the hand, that it may be seen empty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will show you a very curious phenomenon, all the more astonishing because you will bear me witness that from the time the cards were counted, they have not been even one moment in my possession, but have remained in independent custody. Will you, sir, addressing the person who holds the second packet, hold up the cards in such a manner that I can touch them with my wand? I have but to strike the cards with my wand once, twice, thrice, and at each touch a card will fly from the packet which you are now holding, and go to join the seventeen cards in the other packet. As this trick is performed by sheer force of will, without the aid of apparatus or dexterity, I shall be glad if you will all assist me by adding the force of your will to mine, which will greatly lighten my labor. At each touch of the wand, then, please, all present, mentally to command a card to pass in the manner I have mentioned. Are you all ready? Then we will make the experiment. One, two, three. Did you see the cards pass? I saw them distinctly, but possibly my eyes are quicker than yours. Will each of the gentlemen who hold the cards be good enough to count his packet? This is done, and it is found that the one holds twenty cards, and the other twelve only. It is obvious that the two packets now collectively contain duplicates of three cards, while three others are missing, but it is extremely unlikely that any one will suspect this or seek to verify the constitution of the pack. End of section 9 Section 10 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Tricks involving sleight of hand or the use of specially prepared cards. Part 4. To allow several persons each to draw a card and the pack having been shuffled, to make another card drawn haphazard change successively into each of those first chosen. Invite a person to draw a card. This first card need not be forced, as it is not essential for you to know what card it is, so long as you afterward keep it in sight. When the card is returned to the pack, insert the little finger under it and make the pass in order to bring it to the bottom. Make the first of the false shuffles, and leave it at the bottom. Again make the pass to bring it to the middle of the pack, and force the same card on a second and again on a third person, each time making a false shuffle, and leaving the chosen card, which we will call A, ultimately in the hands of the last person who drew. Footnote. The different drawers should be person tolerably far apart, as it is essential that they should not discover that they have all drawn the same card. End footnote. When you have concluded the last shuffle, which, the card not now being in the pack, may be a genuine one, you offer the pack to some person who is not yet drawn, and allow him to draw any card he pleases, which second card we will call B. You open the pack, and ask the persons holding the two cards to replace them one on the other. That first chosen, A, being placed last, in other words uppermost. You make the pass to bring them to the top, and palm them and then immediately hand the pack to be shuffled by one of the company. This being done, you replace them on the top of the pack, and spreading the cards, and appearing to reflect a moment, pick out by the backs as many cards as there have been persons who drew, in other words, four, including among them the two cards A and B. Exhibiting the four cards, you ask each drawer to say, without naming his card, whether his card is among them. The reply is, of course, in the affirmative. Each person who drew, seeing his own card among those shown, naturally assumes that the remaining cards are those of the other drawers, and the remainder of the audience, finding the drawers satisfied, are fully convinced that the cards shown are the four which were drawn. You now replace the cards, 
in different parts of the pack, placing the two actually drawn in the middle, and secretly make the pass to bring them to the top. Then, spreading the cards, you invite another person to draw, which you allow him to do wherever he chooses. When he has done so, you request him to name aloud his card, which we will call C. Holding the card aloft, you ask each of the former drawers in succession, Is this your card? To which each answers, No. After having received this answer for the last time, you change the card by the first method for the top card. You now have the card A, the one drawn several times, in your hand, while B has become the top card, and C, which you have just exhibited, is at the bottom. You continue before showing A, You are all agreed that this is not your card. You had better not be too sure. I will ask you one by one. You, sir, addressing the first drawer, are you quite sure this is not your card? He is obliged to own that it is now his card. Pardon me, you say, breathing gently on the back of the card. It may have been so a moment ago, but now it is this lady's, exhibiting it to the second drawer, who also acknowledges it as her card. To the third person you say, I think you drew a card, did you not? May I ask you to blow upon the back of this card? It has changed again, you see, for now it is your card. The card having been again recognized, you continue, There was no one else, I think, at the same moment again making the change by the first method, so that A is now at the bottom and B in your hand. The person who drew B will no doubt remind you that you have not yet shown him his card. You profess to have quite forgotten him, and feigning to be a little embarrassed, ask what his card was. He names it accordingly, upon which you ask him to blow upon the card you hold, and, turning it over, show that it has now turned into that card. Then again making the change, you remark, everybody has certainly had his card now. Then, yourself blowing upon the card you hold, which is now an indifferent one, you show it, and remark, you observe that now it is nobody's card. In this trick, as in every other which mainly depends upon forcing a given card, there is always the possibility that some person may, either by accident or from a malicious desire to embarrass you, insist upon drawing some other card. This, however, must not discourage you. In the first place, when you have once thoroughly acquired the knack of forcing, the victim will nine times out of ten draw the card you desire, even though doing his utmost to exercise, as he supposes, an absolutely free choice and the risk may be still further diminished by offering the cards to persons whose physiognomy designates them as likely to be good-naturedly easy in their selection. But if such a contretemps should occur in the trick we have just described, it is very easily met. You will remember that the first card drawn is not forced, but freely chosen. It is well to make the most of this fact, and for that purpose, before beginning the trick, to offer the cards to be shuffled by several persons in succession and specially to draw the attention of the audience to the fact that you cannot possibly have any card in view. When the card is chosen, offer to allow the drawer, if he has the slightest suspicion that you know what it is, to return it and take another. He may or may not accept the offer, but your evident indifference as to the card chosen will make the audience the less likely to suspect you afterwards of desiring to put forward any particular card. If, notwithstanding, a wrong card is drawn the second time, leave it in the hand of the drawer, and at once offer the cards to another person, and again endeavor to force the proper card, A, and let the wrong card take the place of B in the foregoing description. In the very unlikely event of a second wrong card being drawn, leave that also for the moment in the hands of the drawer, and let that card take the place of C in the finish of the trick. To make four aces change to four kings, and four kings to four aces. This very effective trick is performed by the aid of four cards, which are so prepared as to appear aces on the one side and kings on the other. To make them, take four ordinary aces and four ordinary kings, and peel off half the thickness of each card. This may be easily done by splitting one corner of the card with a sharp penknife, when the remainder can be pulled apart without difficulty. The cards being thus reduced in thickness, paste back to back the king and the ace of each suit, placing them in a press or under a heavy weight, that they may dry perfectly smooth and flat. 
better still, entrust the process to some person who is accustomed to mounting photographs, when, at a trifling cost, you will have your double-faced cards thoroughly well made. Place these four cards beforehand in different parts of the pack, the ace side downwards, in other words, in the same direction as the faces of the other cards. Place the genuine aces face downwards on the top of the pack, which being thus disposed, you are ready to begin the trick. Take the pack in your hand, face uppermost. Remark, for this trick I want the aces and kings, and pick out one by one the real kings and the sham aces. Lay these cards on the table, the kings face upwards, and the prepared cards with the ace side uppermost. Draw the attention of the audience to these cards, and meanwhile make the pass so as to bring the two halves of the pack face to face, when the four genuine aces will, unknown to the audience, be at the lower end of the pack. Place the four kings ostentatiously upon the opposite end of the pack, in other words, that which is for the time being uppermost. You now borrow a hat. Placing the pack for a moment on the table, and taking the four false aces in one hand, and the hat in the other, place the aces on the table, and cover them with the hat, at the same moment turning them over. Then taking the pack in your hand, once more show the kings, and replacing them, say, I shall now order these four kings to pass under the hat, and the four aces to return to the pack. I have only to touch the cards with my wand, and say, Pass, and the change is accomplished. As you touch the cards with the wand, turn over the pack. The bringing together of the hands and the gentle tap with the wand effectually covering the slight movement of the hand. If you do not use the wand, a semicircular sweep of the hand, which holds the cards in the direction of the hat, as you say, pass, will answer the same purpose. Having shown that the cards have changed according to command, you may, by repeating the process, cause the cards to return to their original positions. It is better not to carry the trick further than this, for some of the audience may possibly ask to be allowed to examine the cards, which would be embarrassing. After the trick is over, make the pass to bring the pack right again, and then get the double-faced cards out of the way as soon as possible. The best way to do this, without exciting suspicion, is to take them up in the right hand, and apparently turn them over and leave them on the top of the pack, but in reality, palm them and slip them into your pocket, or elsewhere out of sight. After having done this, you may safely leave the pack within reach of the audience who, if they examine it, finding none but ordinary cards, will be more than ever puzzled as to your modus operandi. Having made four packets of cards with an ace at the bottom of each, to bring all four aces into whichever packet the company may choose, take the four aces or any other four cards of equal value from the pack, and throw them face upwards on the table. While the company's attention is being drawn to them, make the pass, as in the last trick, so as to bring the two halves of the pack face to face. The company, having satisfied themselves that the four cards shown are really the four aces, and are without preparation, take them up, and replace them face downwards upon the top of the pack, which you hold in the left hand, remarking, I am going to show you a trick with these four aces. I shall first place them on the table, and put three indifferent cards on each of them. Meanwhile, get the thumb of the left hand in position for the turnover, and the instant that you have drawn off the top card with the right hand, turn over the pack, which the movement of the hands in removing the top card will enable you to do without attracting notice. This top card is really an ace and you may therefore show it, as if by accident, while placing it on the table. Lay it face downwards, and then place three cards from the end you have just brought uppermost, which the audience will believe to be the other three aces, in a line with it on the table. Next, place three more cards, taken from the same end of the pack, upon each of the three cards last dealt. When you come to that first dealt, the genuine ace, before dealing the three cards upon it, you must again turn over the pack, thereby bringing the three aces on the top. You thus have upon the table four packets of four cards each, one packet consisting of aces only, and the remaining three packets of indifferent cards. But the audience imagine that the aces are divided, and that there is one at the foot of each packet. You may now ask any one to touch two out of the four packets. The two packets which he touches may include, or may not include, the one containing the four aces. 
Whichever be the case, take up and put aside the two which do not include the packet of aces, and remark, We will place these aside, an observation which will be equally appropriate whether those were the two touched or not. Next, ask the same or another person to touch one of the two remaining packets, and in like manner add that one which does not contain the aces to the two already set aside. Placing these three packets on the table, request some one of the company to place his hand upon them, and hold them tightly. Then, taking the remaining packet yourself, observe, You have three aces, and I have only one, but by virtue of my magic power I shall compel those three aces to leave your hand, and come to mine. I just touch the back of your hand so, touching it with the cards you hold, and say, Pass. The change is already accomplished. Here are all four aces. Please to examine your own cards when you will find that you have not a single ace left. Let me remind you that the audience chose, and not I, which of the four packets you should take, and which one I should retain. Footnote. It will be observed that this trick is terminated after the manner described on page 45, to which the reader is recommended to refer as the above description will be more clearly intelligible by the aid of the further explanations there given. End footnote. There is another method of performing this trick, which dispenses with the necessity of turning over the pack. In this case, as you place the four aces on the top of the pack, you insert the little finger of the left hand under the three uppermost, and make the pass to bring these three to the bottom, still, however, keeping the finger between them and the rest of the pack. You deal out the four top cards, supposed to be the four aces, as above, and three others on each of the three non-aces. You next ask some person to draw any three cards, taking care not to let him draw one of the three at the bottom, and place them at the top of the pack. The moment he has done so, you again make the pass, thus bringing the three aces upon them. You then say, taking off without showing the three top cards, now I will take these three cards, freely drawn from the middle of the pack, and place them here on this last ace. From this point the course of the trick is the same as already described. To change the four aces held tightly by a person into four indifferent cards. This is a most brilliant trick, and puzzles even adepts in card conjuring. In combination with the shower of aces, which next follows, it was one of the principal feats of the elder Conus, and subsequently of the celebrated Comte. The trick is performed as follows. You begin by announcing that you require the assistance of some gentleman who never believes anything that he is told. The audience generally take this as a joke, but for the purpose of this trick it is really rather an advantage to have the assistance of a person who will take nothing for granted and will be satisfied with nothing short of ocular demonstration of any fact which you desire him to concede. Some little fun may be made in the selection, but a volunteer having at last been approved of, you request him to step forward to your table. Selecting from the pack the four aces, you ask him to say aloud what cards those are, at the same time holding them up that all may see them. Then laying the aces face upwards on the table, you hand him the remainder of the cards and ask him to ascertain and state to the company whether there is any peculiarity about the cards, and whether, in particular, there are any other aces in the pack. His reply is in the negative. You then ask whether any other person would like to examine the pack. All being satisfied, you take the pack face downwards in your left hand, and picking up the four aces with the right, place them on the top, at the same moment slightly ruffling the cards, then taking the aces one by one without showing them, you place them face downwards on the table. Addressing the person assisting you, you say, I place these four aces on the table. You admit that they are the four aces. Your victim, not having seen the faces of the cards since they were replaced on the pack, and having noticed the slight sound produced by your ruffling the cards, will in all probability say that he does not admit anything of the sort. Why, you reply, you have only just seen them but I'll show them to you again if you like. Turning them face upwards, you show that the four cards really are the aces, and again replace them on the pack. Ruffle the cards, and deal out the four aces face downwards as before. You again ask your assistant whether he is certain this time that the four cards on the table are the aces. 
He may possibly be still incredulous, but if he professes himself satisfied, you ask him what he will bet that these cards are really the aces, and that you have not conjured them away already. He will naturally be afraid to bet, and you remark, ah, I could tell by the expression of your countenance that you were not quite satisfied. I'm afraid you are sadly wanting in faith, but as I can't perform the trick for the sake of my own reputation until you are thoroughly convinced, I will show you the cards once more. This you do, and again replace them on the pack, but before doing so, slip the little finger of the left hand under the top card of the pack. Again take off the aces with the finger and thumb of the right hand, carrying with them at the same time this top card, then with a careless gesture of the right hand toward the audience, so as to show them the face of the undermost card, the one you have just added, you continue, I really can't imagine what makes you so incredulous. Here are the aces. You replace the five cards on the pack. I take them one by one, so, and place them on the table. Surely there is no possibility of sleight of hand here. Are you all satisfied that these are really the aces now? The audience having noted, as you intended them to do, that the fifth or bottom card was not an ace, naturally conclude that other cards have been by some means substituted for the aces. And when you ask the question for the last time, you are met by a general shout of no. You say, with an injured expression, Really, ladies and gentlemen, if you are all such unbelievers, I may as well retire at once. I should hope that at least you will have the grace to apologize for your unfounded suspicions. Then, turning to the person assisting you, you continue, Sir, as every act of mine appears to be an object of suspicion, perhaps you will kindly show the company that those are the aces, and replace them yourself on the top of the pack. This he does. But during the course of the above little discussion you have taken the opportunity to count off and palm in your right hand the five top cards of the pack. It is hardly necessary to observe that while doing this you must scrupulously refrain from looking at your hands. The mode of counting is to push forward the cards one by one with the thumb, and to check them with the third finger of the left hand. A very little practice will enable you to count off any number of cards by feel in this manner with the greatest ease. When the aces are replaced on the top of the pack, you transfer the pack from the left to the right hand, thus bringing the palmed cards above them, then placing the whole pack on the table, face downwards, inquire, Will you be good enough to tell me where the aces are now? The answer is generally very confident. On the top of the pack. Without taking the pack in your hand, you take off one by one the four top cards, and lay them face downwards on the table, as before then taking up the fifth card and exhibiting it to the company, observe, you see there are no more aces left, but if you like you can look through the pack. So saying, you take up the cards, and run them rapidly over with their faces towards the spectators, taking care, however, not to expose either of the five at the top, four of which are the genuine aces. Then addressing your assistant, you say, the company being at last satisfied, Perhaps you will be good enough to place your hand on those four cards, and hold them as tightly as possible. Then holding the pack in the left hand, you take between the first finger and thumb of the right hand the top card of the pack, being the only one left of the five you palmed and placed over the aces, and say, Now I am going to take four indifferent cards one after the other, and exchange them for the four aces in this gentleman's hand. Observe the simplicity of the process. I take the card that first comes to hand. Here you show the face of the card that you hold, which we will suppose to be the seven of diamonds. I don't return it to the pack, even for a moment, but merely touch the hand with it, and it becomes the ace of, say, spades, which you show it to be. At the words return it to the pack, you move the card with what is taken to be merely an indicative gesture towards the pack and at the same instant change it by the third method for the top card of the pack, which is one of the aces. You now have the seven of diamonds at the top of the pack, with the remaining three aces immediately following it. You must not show this seven of diamonds a second time, and it is therefore necessary to get it out of the way. The neatest way of doing this is as follows. You remark, to show you that I take the cards just as they come, I will give them a shuffle which you do as indicated for the first of the false shuffles, subject to the modification following. 
Pass into the right hand the first top card, the seven of diamonds, alone, and upon this card pass the next three, which are the three aces, then the rest of the cards indifferently. When all the cards are thus passed into the right hand, shuffle them again anyhow, but take care to conclude by bringing the four lowest cards to the top. You will now have the three aces uppermost, and the seven of diamonds in the fourth place. Taking off the top card, and drawing it sharply over the hand of the person assisting, you show that it is also an ace, and in like manner with the next card, making, if you choose, a false shuffle between. After the third ace has been shown, make a false shuffle, and finally leave at the top the last ace, with one card above it. This may be effected by bringing up from the bottom, in concluding the shuffle, the two bottom cards, instead of the last, the ace, only. Taking the top card between the thumb and the first finger of the right hand, and showing it with apparent carelessness, so as to give the company the opportunity of remarking that it is not an ace, you replace it on the pack for an instant, saying, We have had three aces, I think. Which is it that is wanting? Here you glance down at the aces on the table. Oh, the ace of diamonds. Then the card that I hold must change to the ace of diamonds. You must have meanwhile effected the change, and turning up the card you hold, you show that it is the ace of diamonds. You may, if you please, use the first instead of the third method of making the change and performing this trick, but the first method demands a higher degree of dexterity to make it equally deceptive, and the movement used in the third method has in this instance the advantage of appearing to be the natural accompaniment of the words of the performer. End of section 10《ッシ11》of Modern Magic。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Modern Magic》A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman。Tricks Involving Sleight of Hand or the Use of Specially Prepared Cards Part 5 The Shower of Aces this trick forms a very effective sequel to that last described, or may with equal facility be made to follow many other card tricks. To perform it, the first essential is the possession of a pack of cards similar in size and pattern to that you have in general use, but consisting of aces only. You can purchase such a pack at most of the conjuring depots, or you may, without much difficulty, manufacture one for yourself. If you decide upon the latter course, you must first procure thirty or forty blank cards backed with the requisite pattern. These you can transform into aces in two ways. The first is to split three or four ordinary cards of each suit, and after peeling off as thin as possible the face of each, carefully cut out the pips and paste one in the center of each of your blank cards. This process, however, takes a considerable time and when the sham aces are collected in a pack, the extra thickness of the paper in the center of each produces an objectionable bulge. The better plan is to procure a stencil plate representing the figures of a club, heart, and diamond, which will enable you to produce any number of the aces of those suits, using Indian ink for the clubs and vermilion mixed with a little size for the hearts and diamonds. The ace of spades you must dispense with, but this is of little consequence to the effect of the trick. You must have these cards close at hand, in such a position as to enable you to add them instantly, and without attracting observation, to the pack you have been using. If you use the regular conjurer's table before described, you may place your pack of aces on the servante. If you do not use such a table, you may place them in one of your pochettes. In either case, you will have little difficulty in reaching them at the right moment and placing them on the top of the ordinary pack, holding the hole in your left hand, but keeping the little finger between. Having done this, you say to the person who has been assisting you, in continuation of the trick you just performed, You appear to be fond of aces, sir. How many would you like? He is fully convinced, having previously examined the pack, that you have only the ordinary four but from a desire to put your powers to an extreme test, he may possibly name a larger number, say, seven. Seven, you reply. That is rather unreasonable, seeing there are only four in the pack. However, we will make some more. 
Do you know how to make aces? No? Then I will show you. Like all these things, it's simplicity itself, when you once know it. Will you oblige me by blowing upon the pack? Which you hold just under his nose for that purpose. He does so, and you deliberately count off and give to him the seven top cards, which all prove to be aces. You then say, Perhaps you would like some more. You have only to blow again. Come, how many will you have? He again blows on the pack, and you give him the number desired. While he is examining them, you cover the pack for a moment with your right hand and palm a dozen or so of the remaining aces. Then remarking, you blew a little too strongly that time, you blew a lot of aces into your waistcoat, you thrust your hand into the breast of his waistcoat and bring out three or four of the palmed cards, leaving the remainder inside then pull out two or three more, dropping them on the floor, so as to scatter them about and make them appear as numerous as possible. You then say, There seem to be a good many more others yet. Perhaps you will take them out yourself. While he is doing so, you palm in the right hand all the remaining aces. When he professes to have taken out all, you say, Are you quite sure that you have no more aces about you? You blew very hard, you know. I really think you must have some more. Will you allow me? Then, standing on his right, you place your right hand just below his eyes and spring the remaining aces from it, in the manner indicated for springing the cards from hand to hand, the effect being exactly as if a shower of cards flew from his nose. Several persons having each drawn two cards, which have been returned and shuffled to make each couple appear in succession, one at the top and the other at the bottom of the pack. This capital trick was also a great favorite with Comte, who christened it, for reasons best known to himself, by the poetical name of The Lady's Looking Glass. The cards having been freely shuffled, you invite a person to draw two cards, allowing him free choice. Opening the pack in the middle, you ask him to place his cards together in the opening. You bring them to the top by the pass, make the first of the false shuffles, and conclude by leaving them on the top. Offer the cards to a second person to draw a couple, but in opening the cards for him to return them, make the pass, so that they may be placed upon the pair already drawn, which are thereby brought to the middle of the pack. Again, make the pass, so as to bring all four to the top. Make another false shuffle, leaving these four on the top, and offer the cards to a third and fourth person, each time repeating the process. Make the false shuffle for the last time so as to leave all the drawn cards in a body on the top of the pack, with one indifferent card above them. The audience believe that they are thoroughly dispersed, and your first care must be to strengthen that impression. If you are expert in card palming, you may palm the nine cards, and give the pack to be shuffled by one of the spectators. But this is not absolutely necessary, and there is some risk of the company noticing the absence of part of the pack. You remark, you have all seen the drawn cards placed in different parts of the pack, and the whole have been since thoroughly shuffled. The drawn cards are therefore at this moment scattered in different parts of the pack. I can assure you that I do not myself know what the cards are. This is the only item of fact in the whole sentence. But yet, by a very slight, simple movement, I shall make them appear in couples as they were drawn at top and bottom of the pack. Then showing the bottom card, you ask, is this anybody's card? The reply is in the negative. You next show the top card, and make the same inquiry. While you do so, you slip the little finger under the next card, and as you replace the card you have just shown, make the pass, thus bringing both cards to the bottom of the pack. Meanwhile, you ask the last person who drew what his cards were. When he names them, you ruffle the cards and show him first the bottom and then the top card, which will be the two he drew. While exhibiting the top card, take the opportunity to slip the little finger of the left hand immediately under the card next below it, and as you replace the top one, make the pass at that point. You now have the third couple placed top and bottom. Make the drawer name them, ruffle the cards, and show them as before, again making the pass to bring the card just shown at top, with that next following to the bottom of the pack, which will enable you to exhibit the second couple in like manner. These directions sound a little complicated, but if followed with the cards will be found simple enough. 
You may, by way of variation, pretend to forget that a fourth person drew two cards, and after making the pass as before, appear to be about to proceed to another trick. You will naturally be reminded that so-and-so drew two cards. Apologizing for the oversight, you beg him to say what his cards were. When he does so, you say, To tell you the truth, I have quite lost sight of them. But it is of no consequence. I can easily find them again. Then nipping the upper end of the cards between the thumb and the second finger of the right hand, which should be slightly moistened, you make the pack swing pendulum fashion a few inches backwards and forwards, when the whole of the intermediate cards will fall out, leaving the top and bottom card alone in your hand, those you hand to the drawer, who is compelled to acknowledge them as the cards he drew. To make two cards, each firmly held by a different person, change places. For the purpose of this trick, you must have a duplicate of some one of the cards, say the knave of spades, and you must arrange your pack beforehand as follows. The bottom card must be a knave of spades, the next to it an indifferent card, say the nine of diamonds, and next above that the second knave of spades. You come forward carelessly shuffling the cards, which you may do as freely as you please as to all above the three mentioned, and finish by placing the undermost knave of spades on the top. The bottom card will now be the nine of diamonds, with the knave of spades next above it. Holding up the pack in your left hand, in such a position as to be ready to draw back the bottom card, you say, Will you all be kind enough to notice and remember the bottom card which I will place on the table here, so as to be in sight of everybody? So saying, you drop the pack to the horizontal position and draw out with the middle finger of the right hand apparently the bottom card, but really slide back that card, and take the one next to it, the knave of spades, which you lay face downwards on the table, and ask someone to cover with his hand. You then, by the slip or pass, bring the remaining knave of spades from the top to the bottom, and shuffle again as before, taking care not to displace the two bottom cards. Again ask the company to note the bottom card, which is now the knave of spades and draw out, as before, apparently that card, but really the nine of diamonds. Place that also face downwards on the table, and request another person to cover it with his hand. The company are persuaded that the first card thus drawn was the nine of diamonds, and the second the knave of spades. You now announce that you will compel the two cards to change places, and after touching them with your wand, or performing any other mystical ceremony, which may serve to account for the transformation, you request the person holding each to show his card, when they will be found to have obeyed your commands. The attention of the audience being naturally attracted to the two cards on the table, you will have little difficulty in palming and pocketing the second knave of spades, which is still at the bottom of the pack, and which, if discovered, would spoil the effect of the trick. To change four cards, drawn haphazard, and placed on the table, into cards of the same value as a single card subsequently chosen by one of the spectators. This trick is on the same principle as that last above described, but is much more brilliant in effect. To perform it, it is necessary, or at least desirable, to possess a forcing pack consisting of one card several times repeated. We will suppose your forcing pack to consist of queens of diamonds. Before commencing the trick, you must secretly prepare your ordinary pack in the following manner. Place at the bottom any indifferent card, and on this a queen, then another indifferent card, then another queen, another indifferent card, then another queen, another indifferent card, and on it the fourth and last queen. You thus have at the bottom the four queens, each with an ordinary card next below it. Each indifferent card should be of the same suit as the queen next above it, so that all of the four suits may be represented. Shuffle the cards, taking care, however, not to disturb the eight cards above mentioned. Then say, I am about to take four cards from the bottom and place them on the table. Will you please to remember what they are? Show the bottom card, then, dropping the pack to the horizontal position, draw back that card and take the next, which is one of the queens, and without showing it, lay it face downwards on the table. You now want to get rid of the card you have already shown, which is still at the bottom. To effect this without arousing suspicion, the best and easiest plan is to shuffle each time after drawing a card, not disturbing the arranged cards at the bottom, but concluding the shuffle by placing the bottom card, which is the one you desire to get rid of, on the top of the pack.
Thus, after each shuffle, you are enabled to show a fresh bottom card, which, however, you slide back, and draw the next card, a queen, instead. Repeat this four times, when you will have all four queens on the table, though the audience imagine them to be the four cards they have just seen. In order to impress this more fully upon them, ask someone to repeat the names of the four cards. While the attention of the audience is thus occupied, you secretly exchange the pack you have been using for your forcing pack, and advancing to the audience say, Now I shall ask someone to draw a card, and whatever card is drawn, I will, without even touching them, transform the four cards on the table to cards of the same value. Thus if you draw a king, they shall all become kings. If you draw a ten, they shall become tens, and so on. Now choose your card, as deliberately as you please. You spread the cards before the drawer, allowing him perfect freedom of choice, as, of course, whatever card he draws must necessarily be a queen of diamonds. You ask him to be good enough to say what the card he has drawn is, and on being told that it is a queen, you say, then, by virtue of my magic power, I order that the four cards now on the table change to queens. Pray observe that I do not meddle with them in any way. I merely touch each with my wand, so. Will someone kindly step forward and bear witness that the change has really taken place? If you do not possess a forcing pack, but rely upon your own skill in forcing with an ordinary pack, it is well to prepare this second beforehand by placing the four queens, supposing that you desire a queen to be drawn, at the bottom. Making the pass as you advance to the company, you bring these to the middle and present the pack. It is comparatively easy to ensure one or other of four cards placed together being drawn. Two heaps of cards, unequal in number, being placed upon the table to predict beforehand which of the two the company will choose. There is an old schoolboy trick which consists in placing on the table two heaps of cards, one consisting of seven indifferent cards and the other of the four sevens. The performer announces that he will predict beforehand, either verbally or in writing, which of the two heaps the company will choose and fulfills his undertaking by declaring that they will choose the seven heap. This description will suit either heap, being in the one case understood to apply to the number of cards in the heap, in the other case to denote the value of the individual cards. The trick in this form would not be worth noticing, save as a prelude to a newer and really good method of performing the same feat. You place on the table two heaps of cards, each containing the same number, say six cards which may be the first that come to hand, the value of the cards being in this case of no consequence. You announce that of the two heaps one contains an odd and the other an even number. This is of course untrue. But it is one of the postulates of a conjurer's performance that he may tell professionally as many fibs as he likes, and that his most solemn asseverations are only to be taken in a Pickwickian sense. You continue, I do not tell you which heap is odd and which is even, but I will predict to you as many times as you like which heap you will choose. Observe I do not influence your choice in any way. I may tell you that you will this time choose the heap containing the odd number. While delivering this harangue, you take the opportunity of palming in your right hand a single card from the top of the pack, and place the remainder of the cards apart on the table. When the audience have made their choice, you pick up the chosen heap with the right hand, thereby adding the palmed card to that heap, and coming forward, ask someone to verify your prediction. The number is, naturally, found to be odd. You then bring forward the second heap, which is found to be even. Join the two heaps together, and again separate them, palming the top card of the odd heap. Replace the two heaps on the table, and this time predict that the audience will choose the heap containing the even number. When they have made their selection, you have only to pick up the non-chosen heap with the hand containing the palmed card, and the chosen heap with the empty hand. You may with truth assure the audience that you could go on all evening predicting their choice with equal certainty, but it is best not to repeat the trick too often. You will do wisely to pass on at once to the next trick, which will enable you to display your powers of divination in yet a more surprising form. A row of cards being placed face downwards on the table to indicate, by turning up one of them, how many of such cards have during your absence been transferred from one end of the row to the other. 
This trick is somewhat out of place in this chapter inasmuch as it involves no sleight of hand, but we insert it here as forming an appropriate sequel to that last described. It is thus performed. You deal from the top of the pack, face downwards on the table, a row of fifteen cards. To all appearance you are quite indifferent what cards you take, but, in reality, you have prearranged the first ten cards in the following manner. First a ten, then a nine, then an eight, and so on down to the ace inclusive. The suits are of no consequence. The eleventh card should be a blank card if you have one of the same pattern as the pack. If not, a knave will do. This card, in the process which follows, will stand for zero. When the fifteen cards are dealt, their arrangement will therefore be as follows. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, asterisk, 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 asterisk. The four asterisks representing any four indifferent cards. This special arrangement is, of course, unknown to the audience. You now offer to leave the room, and invite the audience, during your absence, to remove any number of the cards, not exceeding ten, from the right-hand end of the row, and place them in the same order at the other end of the row. On your return, you have only to turn up the eleventh card, counting from the beginning or left end, which will indicate by its points the number of cards removed. A few examples will illustrate this fact. Thus, suppose that two cards only have been removed from the right to the left hand end. The row thus altered will be as follows. Asterisk, asterisk, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, asterisk, asterisk. The eleventh card from the left will be a two, being the number moved. Suppose that seven cards have been removed. The new arrangement will be two, one, zero, asterisk, 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 ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. And the card in the eleventh place will be a seven. Suppose the audience avail themselves of your permission to the fullest extent, and remove ten cards, the same result follows. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, asterisk, 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 ten, nine, eight, seven, six. If no card is moved, the zero will remain the eleventh card, as it was at first. If you repeat the trick a second time, you must replace the cards moved in their original positions. Do not, if you can possibly help it, allow the audience to perceive that you count the cards. You are not necessarily restricted to fifteen cards, but may increase the number up to twenty if you please, making up the complement by increasing the number of the indifferent cards at the right hand of the original row. The trick may be equally well performed with dominoes, or with numbered pieces of paper, as with playing cards. End of section 11section 12 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman tricks involving sleight of hand or the use of specially prepared cards part 6 Several cards, having been freely chosen by the company, returned and shuffled, and the pack placed in a person's pocket to make such person draw out one by one the chosen cards. This trick is an especial favorite of the well-known Herman, in whose hands it never fails to produce a brilliant effect. The performer hands the pack to one of the company, who is requested to shuffle it well and then to invite any four persons each to draw a card. This having been done, the pack is returned to the performer, who then requests the same person to collect the chosen cards face downwards on his open palm. The cards so collected are placed in the middle of the pack, which is then handed to the person who collected them, with a request that he will shuffle them thoroughly. After he has done so, 
The pack is placed by the performer in the volunteer assistant's breast pocket. The performer now asks one of the four persons who drew to name his card. He next requests the person assisting him to touch the end of his wand, and then as quickly as possible, that the mystic influence may not have time to evaporate, to put his hand in his pocket and draw out the card named. He takes out one card accordingly, which proves to be the very one called for. A second and third card are named and drawn in the same manner to the astonishment of all and not least of the innocent assistant. The fourth and last card, which is, say, the ten of spades, he is requested to look for in the pack, but it proves to be missing, and the performer thereupon offers to show him how to make a ten of spades. To do so, he requests him to blow into his pocket where the missing card is immediately found. But he has, unfortunately, blown too strongly, and has made not only a ten of spades, but a host of other cards, which the performer pulls out in quantities, not only from his pocket, but from the inside of his waistcoat, ultimately producing a final shower from his nose. This trick, which appears marvellous in execution, is really very simple, and depends for its effect not so much on any extraordinary degree of dexterity, as on the manner and address of the performer. When the four cards are replaced in the middle of the pack, the performer makes the pass to bring them to the top, and palms them. He then hands the pack to be shuffled. When it is returned, he replaces them to the top, and, placing the person assisting him on his left hand, and facing the audience, places the pack in the left breast pocket of such person, taking care to place the top of the pack, on which are the chosen cards, outwards. In asking the names of the drawn cards, he puts the question first to the person who last replaced his card, and whose card is therefore on the top, and so on. He is particular in impressing upon the person assisting him that he must draw out the card as quickly as possible, thus giving him no time to select a card, but compelling him, so to speak, to take that which is readiest to his hand, which will always be the outermost or top card. Should he notwithstanding by accident or finesse draw out a card from the middle of the pack, the performer at once says, Oh, you were not half quick enough. You must pull out the card as quick as thought, or the magic influence will go off. Allow me. Then pulling out the outer card himself, he shows that it is the right one. When three cards have been thus produced, he himself plunges his hand into the pocket and takes out the whole pack with the exception of the then top card, which is the fourth of the cards drawn. Then, pretending to recollect himself, he says, Stay, we had four cards drawn. Will you say what your card was, madam? We have supposed that it was the ten of spades. He hands the pack to the person assisting him, saying, Will you find the ten of spades and return it to the lady? Being in his pocket, of course, it cannot be found in the pack, and on browsing into the pocket it is naturally discovered there. The performer, meanwhile, has palmed about a third of the pack, which he introduces into the pocket at the same moment that he places his hand therein to take out the supposed superfluous cards. From this stage to the close, the trick is merely a repetition of that already given under the title of the Shower of Aces, to which the reader is referred. The cards having been freely shuffled, and cut into three or four heaps, to name the top card of each heap. Note the bottom card of the pack, which we will suppose to be the nine of diamonds. Shuffle the cards, so as to bring this card to the top and palm it. Then remark, but perhaps you would rather shuffle for yourselves, and hand the pack to some one of the company for that purpose. When the pack is returned, replace the card on the top, and continue placing the pack on the table. You observe that I do not meddle with the cards in any way. Now will someone be good enough to cut them into two, three, or four parts? when I will at once name the top card of each. To do this you must take a special notice where the upper part of the pack is placed, as you know that the top card of this particular heap is the nine of diamonds. Placing your finger gravely not on this, but on one of the other heaps, you say, appearing to reflect, this is the nine of diamonds. We will suppose that it is in reality the queen of spades. You take it in your hand without allowing the audience to see it, and noticing what it is, at once touch the top card of another heap, saying, And this is the Queen of Spades. Glancing in like manner at this card, which is, say, the Seven of Clubs, you touch another card, and say, This is the Seven of Clubs. We will suppose that this third card is really the Ace of Hearts. You conclude, 
taking up the card you have all along known, the real nine of diamonds, and this last is the ace of hearts. Then throwing all four on the table, show that you have named them correctly. This trick should be performed with considerable quickness and vivacity, so as not to give the audience much time for thought as you name the cards. It is further necessary that the spectators be well in front of you, and so placed that they cannot see the faces of the cards as you pick them up. To allow a person secretly to think of a card, and dividing the pack into three heaps, to cause the card thought of to appear in whichever heap the company may choose. Hand the pack to the company, with a request that they will well shuffle it. When it is returned, cut the pack into three heaps on the table, and invite someone to secretly think of a card. When he has done so, say boldly, The card you have thought of is in this heap, touching one of them. Say, the middle one. Will you be kind enough to name it? The person names, say, the Queen of Spades. You continue. Your card, as I have already told you, is in this center heap. To satisfy you that it is so, and that I do not now place it there by means of any sleight of hand, I will in the first place show you that it is not in either of the other heaps. Gathering together the two heaps in question, and turning them face upwards, you come forward to the audience, rapidly spreading and running over the cards, the while in order to ascertain whether the Queen of Spades is among them. If it is not, the trick has so far succeeded without any trouble on your part and after showing that the card is not among those you hold, you bring forward the remaining packet, and show that you were correct in your assertion. You then say, I do not generally repeat a trick, but on this occasion, as you may possibly imagine that my success was a mere result of accident, I will perform the trick once more, and if you please, you shall yourselves name beforehand the packet in which the card thought of shall appear. The packet having been chosen, you join the other two in your left hand, and invite someone to think of a card. When he has done so, you come forward, as before, to show that it is not among the cards you hold. Luck may again favor you, but if not, and you see the card chosen among those you hold in your hand, you quickly draw it by a rapid movement of the second finger of the right hand behind the rest of the pack, and continuing your examination, show the company, to all appearance, that the card is not there. Having done this, you again turn the pack over, when the card thought of will be on the top, and covering the pack for a moment with the right hand, palm that card. Then picking up with the same hand the heap remaining on the table, you place the palmed card on the top, and transferring the cards to the left hand, you say, You are welcome to watch me as closely as you please. You will find that I shall cut these cards at the precise card you thought of. To all appearance you merely cut the cards but really, at the same moment, make the pass by lifting away the lower instead of the upper half of the packet. The upper part of the packet, with the card on the top, remains in the left hand. You request someone to look at the top card, which is found to be the card thought of. Should the card in the first instance prove to be among the non-designated cards, you will proceed as last directed, but do not, in this case, repeat the trick. To allow a person secretly to think of a card, and, even before such card is named, to select it from the pack, and place it singly upon the table. This trick is on the same principle, and performed in a great measure by the same means as that last described. You invite a person to think of a card without naming it. When he has done so, you offer the pack to another person to shuffle, and finally to a third person to cut. Then, selecting any one card from the pack, you walk to your table and without showing what it is, place it face downwards on the table, retaining the rest of the pack in your left hand. Then, addressing the person who was requested to think of a card, you say, The card which I have just placed on the table is the one you thought of. Will you be good enough to name it? We will suppose that the card thought of was the Ace of Spades. You say, as in the last trick, Allow me to show you, in the first place, that the Ace of Spades is no longer in the pack. Coming forward to the audience, and rapidly running over the cards, you catch sight of the ace of spades and slip it behind the rest. Having shown that it is apparently not in the pack, you turn the cards over, when the ace will of course be on the top, and palm it. Leaving the pack with the audience, you advance to your table, and pick up the card on the table with the same hand in which the ace of spades is already palmed. Draw away the card towards the back of the table, and as it reaches the edge, drop it on the servant 
and produce the ace of spades as being the card just picked up. The trick requires a little practice, but if well executed, the illusion is perfect. The above directions are framed upon the assumption that you are performing with a proper conjurer's table, which, as already stated, has a servante or hidden shelf at the back for the reception of objects which the performer may require to pick up or lay down without the knowledge of his audience. The trick may, however, be performed without the aid of such a table, but will in such case require some little variation. If you are using an ordinary table, the most effective mode of finishing the trick is as follows. Walk boldly to the table, and pick up with the right hand in which the card actually thought of is palmed, the card lying on the table, and without looking at it yourself, hold it towards your audience, remarking, Here it is, you see, the ace of spades. The card being in truth a totally different one, say the seven of diamonds, the audience naturally imagine that the trick has broken down, and a derisive murmur apprises you of the fact. You thereupon glance at the card, and affect some little surprise and embarrassment on finding that it is a wrong one. However, after a moment's pause, you say, taking the card face downwards between the thumb and second finger of the left hand, well, I really don't know how the mistake could have occurred. However, I can easily correct it. Change the card by the fifth method, and, after a little by-play, to heighten the effect of the transformation, again show the card, which this time proves to be the right one. The audience will readily conclude that the supposed mistake was really a feint, designed to heighten the effect of the trick. A card having been secretly thought of by one of the audience, to place two indifferent cards upon the table, and to change such one of them as the audience may select into the card thought of. Arrange your pack beforehand in such a manner that among the fifteen or sixteen undermost cards there may be only one court card, and note at what number from the bottom this card is. Advance to the company, offering the cards face downwards in the ordinary way, and requesting some person to draw a card. Then, as if upon a second thought, say, before he has time to draw, or if you prefer it, you need not even touch the cards, but merely think of one as I spread them before you. So saying, spread the cards one by one, with their faces to the company, beginning at the bottom, the single court card being conspicuous among so many plain cards and there being nothing apparently to create a suspicion of design about the arrangement, it is ten to one that the person will note that particular card, which we will suppose to be the knave of hearts. When you have run over twelve or fourteen cards in this way, ask, still moving on the cards, Have you thought of a card? On receiving an answer in the affirmative, you make the pass two cards below the court card, which you know by the number at which it stands, and forthwith make a false shuffle, leaving the last three cards undisturbed, so that the court card remains third from the bottom. Turning to the audience, you remark, I will now take the two bottom cards, whatever they may happen to be, and lay them on the table. Then, holding up the pack in the left hand, with the bottom card towards the audience, you inquire, That is not your card, sir, I suppose. Not that? each time lowering the cards in order to draw away with the moistened finger of the right hand and place face downwards on the table the card just shown. The second time, however, you do not really draw the card you have shown, but draw back that card and take the one next to it, viz. the knave of hearts. You then, standing behind your table and facing the audience, again repeat the question. You are quite sure, sir, that neither of these two cards is the card you thought of. Which of them would you like me to transform into your card, the right or the left? Whichever the answer is, it may be taken in two ways, and you interpret it as may best suit your purpose. Thus, if you have placed the knave of hearts on your own right, and the choice falls on the right-hand card, you interpret it to mean the one on your own right hand. If, on the contrary, the person chooses the card on the left, you interpret him to mean the card on his left, and therefore on your right so that in either case you make the choice fall on the knave of hearts. Footnote. As it is of constant use in the conjuring. End footnote. Taking up the other card, and holding it without apparent design, so that the audience can see what it is, you return it to the pack. Then say boldly, This card upon the table will forthwith change to the card you thought of. Will you be good enough to name it? If he names the knave of hearts, you have nothing to do but to turn up, or request some other person to turn up, the card on the table, and show that it is the right one. 
It is, however, quite possible that the person, by accident or design, may have thought not of the knave of hearts, but of some other card, say the nine of diamonds. Even in this case you need not be at a loss, although the card on the table is a wrong one. When the card is named, you say, the nine of diamonds. Quite right. Let me show you, in the first place, that it is not here in the pack. Advancing to the audience, and at the same time running over the cards, as in the last trick, you draw the nine of diamonds behind the other cards, and show that, apparently, it is not among them. On turning the pack over, it will be at the top. Taking the pack in the left hand, and returning to your table, pick up, with the right hand, the knave of hearts, and without looking at it, yourself, say, here it is, you see, the nine of diamonds. Then, with a careless gesture, and making a half turn to the right or left to cover the movement, change the card by the third method, taking care not to show the card after the change. The audience will naturally exclaim that the card you have just shown them is not the nine of diamonds. You affect great surprise, and ask, Indeed, what card was it then? They reply, The knave of hearts. The knave of hearts? Surely not! You exclaim, again showing the card in your hand, which is now found to be the nine of diamonds. Indeed, you continue, you could not possibly have seen the knave of hearts, for that gentleman in the front row has had it in his pocket all the evening. The knave of hearts was, in truth, left after the change on top of the pack. As you advance to the audience, you palm it, and are thereby enabled to find it without difficulty in the pocket of a spectator, or in any other place which you may choose to designate. It will be observed that the mode here indicated of changing a wrong card into a right one differs from that described in the last trick. Either method will be equally available, but it will be well to practice both, as it is a great desideratum to be able to vary the denouement of a trick. The course of action above directed in the event of an unexpected card being thought of may be made available as a means of escape from a breakdown in many other cases. Thus, for instance, if you are using a basote pack, and a chosen card has been replaced without the pack having been previously reversed, or if you have from any other cause accidentally lost the means of discovering a card drawn, you may still bring the trick to an effective termination as follows. Give the pack to someone to shuffle, and then, drawing a card haphazard, and placing it face downwards on the table, announce boldly that the card drawn is now upon the table. Ask the person to name his card, show apparently that it is not in the pack, and finish the trick in one or other of the modes above described. End of section 12section 13 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman tricks involving sleight of hand or the use of specially prepared cards part 7 a card having been drawn and returned and the pack shuffled to divide the pack into several heaps on the table, and to cause the drawn card to appear in such heap as the company may choose. Invite a person to draw a card. When it is returned, make the pass to bring it to the top. Make a false shuffle, and leave it still at the top. If any of the audience requests to be allowed to shuffle, palm the card, and hand him the pack. When it is returned, again place the card on the top. Taking cards in the right hand, face downwards, drop them in packets of four or five cards each, on the table, noting particularly where you place the last packet, on the top of which is the chosen card. Ask the audience in which of the heaps they would like the chosen card to appear, and when they have made their choice, pick up all the other packets and place them in the left hand, placing the packet on which is the chosen card at the top. Divide the chosen packet into two, and bid the audience again choose between these, placing the cards of the non-chosen packet below the pack in the left hand. If the packet still remaining will admit of it, divide it into two again, but endeavor so to arrange matters that the packet ultimately chosen shall consist of two cards only, concealing, however, from the audience the precise number of cards in the packet. When you have reached this stage of the trick, palm the drawn card, which we will suppose to have been the ace of diamonds and picking up with the same hand the chosen packet, secretly place that card on the top. 
Place the three cards face downwards, side by side, the ace of diamonds in the middle, and ask the audience which of the three they desire to become the card originally drawn. If they choose the middle card, the trick is already done, and after asking the person to name his card, and showing that neither of the two outside ones is the card in question, you turn up the ace of diamonds. If the choice falls on either of the outside cards, gather together all three, without showing them, the ace still being in the middle, and ask someone to blow on them, then deal them out again in apparently the same order as before, but really deal the second for the first, so as to bring that card into the place of the card indicated. Then, after showing the two other cards as above directed, finally turn up the ace of diamonds, and show that it is the card originally chosen. To change a drawn card into the portraits of several of the company in succession. For the purpose of this trick, you will require a forcing pack of similar pattern to your ordinary pack, but consisting throughout of a single card, say the seven of clubs. You must also have half a dozen or more sevens of clubs in the same pattern, on the faces of which you must either draw or paste small caricature portraits, after the manner of Twelfth Night characters which should be of such a kind as to excite laughter without causing offence. You arrange your pack beforehand as follows. On the top place a fancy portrait, say, of a young lady, then a seven of clubs, then a fancy portrait of a gentleman, then a seven of clubs, another fancy portrait of a lady, another seven of clubs, and so on, so that the first eight or ten cards of the pack shall consist of alternate portraits and sevens of clubs, the top card of all being a lady's portrait and the rest of the pack of sevens of clubs only. Secretly exchange the prepared pack for that which you have been using. Invite a young lady to draw, taking care to offer that part of the pack which consists of sevens of clubs only, so that the card she draws will of necessity be a seven of clubs. You then say, when she has looked at the card, will you now be kind enough to return that card to the pack, when I will paint your portrait on it? You open the cards bookwise about the middle of the pack for her to return the card, and when she has done so, request her to breathe on it. As she does so, you slip the top card of the pack onto that which she has just replaced, and on examining that card, which she takes to be the one she has just seen, she is surprised to find that it is still a seven of clubs, but adorned with a more or less flattering likeness of herself. You continue, after the portrait has been handed round and replaced, I would willingly give you this portrait to take home, but unfortunately, being only a magical picture, the likeness fades very quickly. Will you oblige me by breathing on it once more when you will find that the likeness will vanish, and the card will again be as it was at first? On her doing so, you again slip the top card, which is now an ordinary seven, on to the portrait, and on again examining, the lady is compelled to admit that the card is again as she first drew it. You then offer to paint on the same card a gentleman's likeness, and proceed as before, each time after taking a likeness changing it back again to an ordinary seven, which adds greatly to the effect of the trick. You may, if you please, use allegorical instead of caricature portraits. For example, for a young lady, a rosebud. For a conceited young man, a poppy, or dandelion, or a donkey's head. It is hardly necessary to observe that nothing short of very close intimacy would excuse the use of any portrait of a disparaging or satirical nature. A card having been drawn and returned, and the pack shuffled, to place on the table six rows of six cards each, and to discover the chosen card by a throw of the dice. The effect of this surprising trick is as follows. You invite a person to draw a card, allowing him the utmost freedom of selection. You allow the drawer to replace his card in any part of the pack he pleases and you thoroughly shuffle the cards, finally inviting him to cut, then dealing out six rows of six cards each, face downwards on the table. You offer the drawer a dice box and a pair of dice, and after he has thrown any number of times to satisfy himself that the dice are fair and unprepared, you invite him to throw each singly, the first to ascertain the row in which his card is, and the second to discover at what number it stands in the row. He throws, say, six first, and three afterwards, and on examination the card he drew proves to be the third card of the sixth row. The whole mystery consists in the use of a forcing pack, all the cards of which are alike, 
and which must not consist of a less number than thirty-six cards. The dice are perfectly fair, but as each card of each row is the same, it is a matter of perfect indifference what numbers are thrown. It is advisable to gather up all the other cards, and to request the person to name his card before allowing the one designated by the dice to be turned up. This will draw the attention of the company to the card on the table, and will give you the opportunity to re-exchange the cards you have used for an ordinary pack, from which, by the way, the card answering to the forced card should have been withdrawn. This pack you may carelessly leave on the table, so that, in the event of suspicion attaching to the cards, it will be at once negatived by an examination of the pack. The trick may be varied by using a teetotum, numbered from one to six instead of the dice, or you may, if you prefer it, make the trick an illustration of second sight, by pretending to mesmerize some person in the company, and ordering him to write down beforehand, while under the supposed mesmeric influence, the row and number at which the card shall be found. The mode of conducting the trick will be in either case the same. A card having been withdrawn, and replaced, to call it from the pack, and to make it come to you of its own accord. This is a very simple trick, but, if neatly executed, will create a good deal of wonderment. It is performed as follows. You must procure beforehand a long hair from a lady's head. One end of this must be fastened by means of a bent pin, or in any other way you find most convenient, to the front of your waistcoat, which should be a dark one. At the other end of the hair fix a little round ball, about half the size of a peppercorn, of beeswax. Press this little ball lightly against the lowest button of your waistcoat, to which it will adhere. You will thus always be able to find it at a moment's notice, without groping or looking down for it, which would be likely to draw the eyes of the spectator in the same direction. Request the audience to examine the cards, that they may be sure that there is no preparation about them and as a further proof get two or three persons to shuffle them in succession. When the cards are returned to you, invite some person to draw one, and, while he is examining it, drop your right hand carelessly to your waistband, and remove the little ball of wax to the tip of your right thumb, to which it will adhere without interfering with the movements of the hand. When the card is returned, make the pass to bring it to the top of the pack, and press the little ball of wax upon the back of the card as near the edge as possible. Then shuffle the cards. The shuffle may be a genuine one, but you must take care to keep the lower edge of the chosen card half an inch or so below the remaining cards, that the little ball of wax may not be disturbed. The chosen card will, after the shuffle, be in the middle of the pack, but attached to your waistcoat by the hair. Spread the cards face upwards on the table, by which means the wax, being on the back of the card, will be out of sight taking care not to detach the hair. You then address your audience to the following or some similar effect. In the old style of conjuring, I should merely have picked out your card and handed it to you, and there was a time when people would have thought that a very good trick, but nowadays we should regard that as a very lame conclusion. I can assure you that I have not the smallest idea what your card was. How do you suppose I intend to find out? Various guesses are hazarded, but you shake your head at each. No, you continue, my process is much simpler than any you have suggested. I shall merely order the card you chose to walk out of the pack and come to me. Pronounce any magic formula you like, at the same time beckoning to the cards, and gradually withdrawing yourself away from the table, when the card must needs follow you. As it reaches the edge of the table, receive it in the left hand, and then take it in the right, drawing off with the first finger and thumb of the left hand the wax at the back. Ask the person who drew whether that was his card, and again hand the card and the rest of the pack for examination. This little trick, though simple, will require a good deal of practice to enable you to perform it neatly, but the effect produced by it will well repay your trouble. It may be well to mention once for all, as beeswax is an article of frequent use in magical operations, that if, as sometimes happens, the pure wax is found too hard or not sufficiently adhesive, the addition of a small quantity, say an eighth part, of Venice turpentine mixed with it in a melted condition will make it all that can be desired. THE WRIST TRICK Footnote. For an inferior form of this trick, in which the sleight of hand is not employed, 
See page 51. End footnote. Improved method. To deal yourself all the trumps, the three other players holding the usual mixed hands. Having decided which suit, suppose diamonds, is to be the trump suit, arrange the pack in such a manner that every fourth card shall be of that suit, the intervening cards being taken haphazard. When about to perform the trick, securely exchange the pack you have hitherto been using for the prepared pack, make the bridge, and then a false shuffle by the third method. Invite someone to cut, and make the pass at the bridge, thus restoring the cards to their original condition. Deal in the usual manner, when you will be found to hold all the trumps, the remaining suits being distributed in the ordinary way among the other three players. Where in this or any other trick it is found necessary to change one pack for another, the following will be found the neatest way of effecting that object. Have the prepared pack in the pochette on the left side. Hold the ordinary pack in the right hand, and in moving from the audience to your table, drop the left hand to the pochette. Seize the prepared pack, bring the hands together, and make the pass with the two packs when they will have changed hands. Drop the left hand, and get rid of the ordinary pack into the profonde the prepared pack being left in the right hand. Any little clumsiness in making the pass is of small consequence, the hands being covered by the body. If, however, you find it impossible to make the pass with so large a bulk of cards, the prepared pack may be placed under the waistband, held in position by a strap of half-inch wide elastic, stitched to the inside of the vest. The right hand in this case at the moment of the turn to the table, transferring the ordinary pack to the left, and immediately drawing down the prepared pack, while the left hand, as in the former case, drops the ordinary pack into the profonde. End of section 13、section、14 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Card Tricks Requiring Special Apparatus. Part I. We propose to describe in this chapter such card tricks as require the aid of some mechanical appliance or apparatus, but are still appropriate for a drawing room performance. There are some few tricks performed with cards, such as the fairy star, the demon's head, and the like, which necessitate the use of a mechanical table or other apparatus of an elaborate and costly character. These will not be here noticed, but will be given at the close of the work in the portion devoted to stage tricks. We may here anticipate a not unlikely question on the part of the student, viz., how can I best obtain the necessary apparatus? In some instances, an amateur with a mechanical turn may be able to manufacture his appliances for himself, and where this is the case we would by no means discourage his doing so, as he will thereby derive a double amusement from his study of the magic art. But where the student has not the ability or inclination to do this, we should strongly advise him not to attempt to have his apparatus made to order by persons unaccustomed to this class of work. But to go direct to one or other of the regular depots. Magical apparatus requires so much precision in its details, and so much attention to apparent trifles, that the first attempt of any workman, however skilful, is almost sure to be a failure. And by the time the defects are rectified, the purchaser will find that he has paid more for a clumsy makeshift than he would have done for a thoroughly good article had he gone to the right quarter. Experience will quickly prove that inferior apparatus is dear at any price. Peck and Snyder, 124 Nassau Street, New York City, are the largest manufacturers, importers, and dealers in sports, pastimes, and trick materials. They will forward illustrated catalogues on application, giving details of an infinite variety of optical, chemical, mechanical, magnetical, and magical experiments, and ingenious deceptions. Supplementary sheets are issued from time to time giving descriptions of new novelties. One peculiarity of their business is that every purchaser is taught, by the very explicit instructions that accompany each article, and by correspondence, to perform whatever tricks he may buy, 
so that he may exhibit them with ease and without fear of detection, and no trouble is spared in order to make him perfect in what he purchases. Prices are generally low. Where a seemingly high price occurs, the professor or skilled amateur will readily realize that it is occasioned by the elaborateness of the mechanism of the particular apparatus desired, and the cost that such precision in manipulative manufacture involves. The purchaser, we speak from personal experience, can always depend on receiving uniform courtesy, good value, and sound practical instruction. The novice must be warned against imagining that when he has got into the region of apparatus the necessity for personal address and dexterity will be diminished. On the contrary, there is hardly a trick among those we are about to describe which does not demand more or less practical knowledge of sleight of hand. We shall assume in the following pages that the reader has carefully followed and studied the directions already given, in which case he will find little difficulty in this portion of the work. The Magic Sword A card being drawn and replaced, and the pack flung in the air to catch the chosen card on the point of the sword. We have already described a trick somewhat similar in effect, in which the pack being flung in the air the chosen card is caught in the hand of the performer. The trick in this form makes a very good prelude to the still more surprising one which we are about to describe. It will be remembered that, in the trick above mentioned, an ordinary pack is used, and the spectator is allowed to draw whatever card he pleases. The card, when returned, is brought to the top by the pass, and palmed and though supposed to be caught amid the falling shower, in reality never leaves the hand of the performer. The audience may possibly have a suspicion of this, and you may hear a faint murmur to the effect that he had the card in his hand, and so on. When this occurs, it serves as a very natural introduction to the trick with the sword. You say, Ah, you fancy I had the card in my hand? I will repeat the trick, in order to show you that you are mistaken. Will someone be kind enough to draw another card? Thank you. Don't return the card to me, but put it back in the pack yourself. Now be kind enough to shuffle thoroughly. You cannot say I have the card in my hand this time, at all events. Excuse me one instant while I fetch my magic sword. You go behind your screen, and return holding in your hand a drawn sword. You place yourself in fencing attitude and addressing the person who holds the cards, say, I am going to give you the words one, two, three. At the word three, will you please throw the cards in the air, so as to fall lightly on the point of my sword, when I will pick out with the point the identical card you drew. Spread the cards in a little fan shape before you throw them, so that I may get a fair sight of them. Are you ready? One, two, three. At the word three, the cards are thrown. The performer makes a lunge among them, and a card is instantly seen fluttering on the point of the sword, and, on examination, is found to be the very card which was drawn. The secret of this surprising feat lies mainly in the sword. This is an ordinary small sword with a three-sided rapier blade, but altered in a particular way for the purpose of the trick. The tip of the blade is cut off at about a third of an inch distance from the extreme point and across the concave side of this tip, and also across the corresponding part of the shortened blade, are soldered minute cross-pieces of brass, each bent outwards in the middle, so as to form with the concavity of the blade a kind of eye just large enough to admit freely a piece of thin black elastic cord, the other end of which is passed through a similar small hole in the guard of the hilt. The elastic thus lies along the hollow side of the blade, passing through the two eyes already mentioned, and is kept in position by a knot at each end. The tension of the elastic holds the movable tip in its natural position at the end of the blade. It may, however, be drawn away from it in any direction as far as the elastic will permit, but when released immediately flies back to its old position. On the same side of the hilt, viz. the side farthest away from the palm of the hand when grasping the sword, is fixed a flat oblong piece of tin, painted black, with its longer edges folded over about half an inch on each side, in such manner as to form a receptacle for a card. 
Unless you are tolerably expert in forcing, you will also require some forcing cards of the same pattern as the ordinary pack you have in use. These, however, need not be a full pack, a dozen cards alike being amply sufficient for your purpose. You commence your preparations by taking one of the cards of the forcing pack, cut a small slit in its center with a penknife, and thrust completely through it the movable tip of the sword, taking care not to enlarge the hole more than absolutely necessary, and place the sword thus prepared out of sight of the audience, but so as to be easily got at when you want it. Have your forcing cards in your pocket, or somewhere where you can lay your hand on them without attracting observation, and your ordinary pack on the table. You may begin by remarking, let me ask you to take particular notice that I perform this trick with whatever card you choose, not influencing your choice in any way. To show you that I don't compel you to take any particular card, I will just take a handful of cards from the top of the pack. As you say this, you place your forcing cards, which you have previously palmed, for an instant, on the top of the ordinary pack, immediately taking them off again, as if they had formed part of it, and were the handful of cards you referred to and offer them to someone to draw. Take whichever you please. First card, last card, middle card, it is precisely the same to me. Observe that I don't attempt to press upon you any particular card, but hold the cards perfectly motionless while you make your choice. As soon as a card is drawn, without waiting for it to be replaced, return to your table, holding the remaining forcing cards in your left hand. Pick up the pack with your right hand. Place it on the cards in your left hand, at the same moment making the pass to bring these cards to the top. Palm these with the right hand, and dropping them into your profond, or elsewhere out of sight, advance with the pack to the person who drew, and request him to replace his card, and shuffle thoroughly. While he does so, you retire to fetch your sword, as before mentioned. Before returning to the audience, you prepare it as follows. Taking it in your right hand in the ordinary manner, you draw down with the other hand the pierced card, and slide the card endways into the receptacle on the hilt. The elastic, which is now stretched to double its ordinary length, will pull at the card pretty tightly, but you retain it in position by pressing on the face of the card with the second and third fingers of the hand that grasps the hilt. Having done this, you return to the audience, taking care so to stand that the back of the hand that holds the sword shall be towards them. When the cards are flung in the air, as already described, you make a lunge among them, and at that same moment relax the pressure of the fingers on the pierced card. The elastic, being thus released, flies rapidly back to its original position, and carries the movable tip, and with it the card to the end of the blade, by which the card appears to be transfixed. The movement of the sword and the lunge, coupled with that of the falling cards, completely covers the rapid flight of the pierced card from hilt to point. To get the card off the sword, pull it down the blade and tear it roughly off. When you have taken off the card, drop the point of the sword and hand the card at once to the drawer for examination. This serves to divert attention not only from the sword itself, but also from the cards scattered on the ground among which the one actually drawn still remains. This trick is sometimes performed with three cards instead of one. The working of the trick is the same, save that you use a forcing pack consisting of three cards repeated, and that in preparing the sword the two first cards which are threaded on the elastic are perforated with holes of such a size as to allow them, when released, to slide partially down the blade, the first nearly to the hilt and the second about halfway. THE RISING CARDS Several cards having been drawn, returned, and shuffled, to make them rise spontaneously from the pack. This is one of the best of card tricks. The performer advances, pack in hand, to the company. He invites three persons each to draw a card. The cards having been drawn, they are replaced in different parts of the pack which is thoroughly shuffled. The performer then places the pack in a tin box or case, just large enough to hold it in an upright position. This case is generally in the form of a lyre, open in front and at the top, and supported on a shaft or pillar, twelve or fifteen inches high. 
He then asks each person in succession to call for his card, which is forthwith seen to rise slowly from the pack, without any visible assistance, the performer standing quite apart. The ingenuity of different professors has added little embellishments of a humorous character. For instance, the performer may remark, addressing one of the persons who drew, I will not even ask the name of your card, sir. You have only to say, I command the card I drew to appear, and you will be obeyed. He does so, but no effect is produced. The cards remain obstinately motionless. The command is repeated, but with the same result. The performer feigns embarrassment, and says, I must really apologize for the disobedience of the cards. I cannot tell how it is. They never behaved in this way before. I am afraid I must ask you to name the card after all, when I will try my own authority. The card proves to have been a queen, say, the queen of spades. Oh, the performer says, that quite explains it. Queens are not accustomed to be ordered about in such a peremptory manner. If we try again in becoming language, I dare say we shall be more successful. Let us try the experiment. Say, will your majesty oblige the company by appearing? Thus propitiated, the card rises instantly. Occasionally a knave is one of the cards drawn, and when summoned, scandalizes the performer by appearing feet foremost. He is appropriately rebuked, and thrust down again by the professor, upon which he immediately reappears in a proper attitude. Sometimes a card, after coming up halfway, begins to retire again, but at the command of the performer starts afresh, and rises completely out of the pack. These apparently surprising effects are produced by very simple means. In the first place, the cards which rise from the pack are not those actually drawn, but duplicates of them, arranged beforehand. The performer ensures the corresponding cards being drawn by using a forcing pack made up of repetitions of the three cards in question, which we will suppose to be the Queen of Spades, the Ten of Hearts, and the Seven of Diamonds, with some other single card at the bottom. The tin case, in the original form of the trick, has two compartments, the one to the front being large enough to hold a complete pack, but the hinder one adapted to contain six or eight cards only. In this hinder compartment are placed six cards, three of them being those which are intended to rise, and the other three in different cards. A black silk thread is fastened to the upper edge of the partition between the two compartments and is thence brought under the foremost card, which is, say, the Queen of Spades, over the next, an indifferent card, under the third, the Ten of Hearts, over the fourth, an indifferent card, under the fifth, the Seven of Diamonds, over the sixth, an indifferent card, finally passing out through a minute hole at the bottom of the hinder compartment. If the thread be pulled, the three cards named will rise in succession, beginning with the hindmost, viz., the seven of diamonds. The three indifferent cards are put in as partitions, or fulcrums, for the thread to run over. If these partitions were omitted, the three chosen cards would rise all together. The thread may be drawn in various ways. Sometimes this is done by the performer himself, standing behind or beside the table. Another plan is to have the thread attached to a small cylindrical weight within the pillar, which is made hollow and filled with sand. The weight rests on the sand until the operator desires the cards to rise, when by moving a trigger at the foot of the pillar he opens a valve which allows the sand to trickle slowly down into a cavity at the base, and the weight, being thus deprived of its support, gradually sinks down and pulls the thread. The pillar in this case is made about two feet high, as the weight must necessarily travel six times the length of a card. Others again draw the thread by means of a clockwork arrangement in the table, or in the pillar itself, answering the same purpose as the sand and weights. The arrangement which we ourselves prefer, where practicable, is to have the thread drawn by an assistant, who may either be placed behind a screen, or may even stand in full view of the audience, so long as he is at some little distance from the table. The silk thread is quite invisible, if only you have a tolerably dark background. The only portion as to which you need feel any anxiety is that immediately connected with the cards. To conceal this, it is well, if you use a special table, to have a small hole bored in the top, 
through which the thread may pass. The card stand being placed immediately in front of the hole, the thread will pass perpendicularly downward for the first portion of its length, and will thus be concealed behind the pillar. In default of a hole, a ring of bent wire attached to the table will answer the same purpose. The great advantage of having the thread pulled by a living person instead of a mechanical power is that you can take your own time in the performance of the trick, whereas if you use a weight or clockwork there is always a danger of a card beginning to rise before you have called for it, or possibly not rising at all, either contingency being rather embarrassing. In the latest and best form of the trick the second compartment of the case is dispensed with, and the apparatus may be handed round for examination both before and after it is used. In this case three cards are forced and returned as already mentioned, but the performer, as he reaches his table, adroitly changes the forcing pack for another already prepared, and placed on the servante, if a regular conjuring table is used, or if not, concealed behind some object on the table. This pack is prepared as follows. The last six cards are arranged with the thread travelling in and out between them, just as the six cards in the hinder compartment were in the older form of the trick, which is hitched into a notch an eighth of an inch deep, made in the lower edge of the sixth card. The knot prevents the thread from slipping, but does not interfere with its being instantaneously detached when, the trick being over, you hand the whole apparatus, cards and all, to be examined. Some performers use no stand or pillar for the card case, but fix it by a short plug projecting for that purpose on its under side, in a decanter of water on the table. Some, again, in order to exclude all apparent possibility of mechanical aid, fasten it on the top of a common broomstick, fixed in the floor of the stage, and broken over the performer's knee at the conclusion of the trick. To our own taste the trick is best performed without any special card-case whatever, the pack being placed in an ordinary glass goblet with upright sides first handed round to the audience for inspection. It is here absolutely self-evident that the glass can give no mechanical assistance, and as the audience know nothing of the exchange of the packs, the immediate rising of the cards at the word of command appears little short of miraculous. It only remains to explain the modus operandi of the little variations before alluded to. The offended dignity of the Queen, declining to appear when summoned in too cavalier a manner, is accounted for by the fact that the performer or his assistant refrains from pulling the thread until the offender has adopted a more respectful tone. The phenomenon of the knave first appearing feet foremost, and then invisibly turning himself right and uppermost, is produced by the use of two knaves, the first, in other words hindmost, being placed upside down and the second, with an indifferent card between, in its proper position. When the performer pushes the first knave down again, with a request that it will rise in a more becoming attitude, he thrusts it down, not as he appears to do, in the same place which it originally occupied, but among the loose cards forming the front portion of the pack, thus getting it out of the way, and allowing the thread to act on the second knave. It is hardly necessary to observe that for producing this particular effect, the cards must be of the old-fashioned single-headed pattern. The alternate ascent and descent of a given card is produced by using a card at whose lower edge, between the back and the front of the card, is inserted a slip of lead foil. The card so weighted sinks down of itself as soon as the pull of the thread is relaxed, and may be thus made to rise and fall alternatively, as often as the operator chooses, and finally, by a quick sharp jerk to jump right out of the pack. Another very telling incident is the transformation of an eight to a seven, or a seven to a six. A seven of spades, say, has been one of the drawn cards, but when it is summoned, an eight of spades appears. The performer apologizes for the mistake, and giving the card a touch of his wand shows it instantly transformed to a seven. This is effected by sticking, with a little beeswax, a loose spade pip in the appropriate position on an ordinary seven of spades. The performer takes out the supposed eight with one hand, and thence transfers it to the other. In so doing he draws off, with the hand which first held the card, the loose pip, and holding the card face downwards, touches it with the wand, 
and shows that it has apparently changed to the card drawn. There is a mode of performing the trick of the rising cards entirely without apparatus, and without the necessity of forcing particular cards. The performer in this case invites a person to draw a card, and when it is returned, makes the pass to bring it to the top of the pack. He then makes a false shuffle, leaving it on the top, and offers the pack to a second person to draw. When he has done so, and before he replaces the card, the performer makes the pass to bring the card first drawn to the middle, so that the second card is placed upon it, and then again makes the pass to bring both together to the top. The process may be repeated with a third card. The three cards are thus left at the top of the pack, that last drawn being the outermost. The performer now asks each person, beginning with the last who drew, to name his card, and holding the pack upright in his right hand, the thumb on one side, and the third and fourth fingers on the other, with the face of the pack to the audience, he causes the cards to rise one by one by pushing them up from the back by an alternate movement of the first and second fingers, which should be previously slightly moistened. If the face of the cards is held fairly to the spectators, it will be impossible for them to discover that the cards do not rise from the middle of the pack. We have been more prolix than we would have desired in the description of this trick, but minute details are the very soul of conjuring. The experience of Horace, brevis esse laboro, obscurus fio, applies with particular force to the magic art, and if we occasionally irritate the reader of quick apprehension by too great minuteness, he must remember that we have, as far as we can, to anticipate every possible question, and that a single point left unexplained may render useless and otherwise careful description. End of section 14— Section 15 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Card Tricks Requiring Special Apparatus, Part 2. The Jumping Cards. Two or three cards having been drawn, returned, and shuffled, to make them jump out of the pack. This trick is somewhat similar in working to that of the rising cards as performed in the hand, which we have just described. The course of the two tricks is precisely the same up to the point when, the two or three cards having been drawn and returned, you have got them all to the top of the pack. Here, however, the resemblance ceases. In the present case, you drop the whole pack into an open-mouthed box, made for that purpose, and announce that, although the chosen cards have been replaced in different parts of the pack, and the whole have since been thoroughly shuffled, you have only to blow upon them in order to separate them visibly from the rest of the pack. You blow upon the box accordingly, when the chosen cards instantly fly out of the pack, rising to a height of three or four feet, and fall on the table. The secret of the trick, apart from the sleight of hand necessary to bring the chosen cards together at the top of the pack, lies in the box. It is in general appearance something like a miniature pedestal for a statue, but hollow, and open at the top the cavity being rather more than large enough to hold a pack of cards. It is divided longitudinally into two compartments, the foremost being large enough to hold a whole pack, the hindmost to hold only three or four cards, the partition between the two coming about halfway up the box. The bottom of the larger compartment is level with the top of the plinth, but the smaller is open to the whole depth save that across it is a steel spring about half an inch in width. Figure 47 represents a section of the apparatus, capital A being the upper part, of which small a is the larger or front compartment, and small b the smaller compartment at the back. Capital B is the plinth. Capital A is so constructed as to slide forwards on, or rather in, b, to the extent of about an eighth of an inch but is prevented doing so, in the normal condition of the apparatus, by the spring small c, which is screwed to the bottom of capital A, its free end pressing against the side of the plinth. If, however, the spring be pressed down from above so as to be below the level of the shoulder small d, for which purpose a thin slip of wood is supplied with the apparatus, 
and capital A be at the same time pushed towards small d, it will slide forward to the position indicated in figure 48, and the spring small c will be held down beneath the shoulder small d. This is the condition in which the apparatus is first exhibited to the audience. After turning it over to show that there are no cards already concealed in it, the performer places it in the pack, first, however, slipping his little finger between the chosen cards, which are on the top, and the rest of the pack, so as to enable him to drop the chosen cards into the smaller compartment at the back where they rest upon the bent spring. See figure 48. Standing behind the box and placing his hands around the plinth as if to hold it steady, the fingers of each hand being in front, and the thumb behind, he blows smartly upon the box, at the same moment pushing A forward with the thumbs to the position which it occupies in figure 47, the spring small c being drawn back with it beyond the shoulder small d is released, and instantly flies up to its old position, shooting out of the box the cards resting upon it. This trick is sometimes like that of the rising cards, worked with a forcing pack duplicates of the forced cards being placed beforehand in the hinder compartment. This method, however, is very inferior to that above described, and would hardly be adopted by any performer who had acquired a competent mastery of sleight of hand. To make a card stand upright by itself on the table. This is a little trick of hardly sufficient importance to be performed by itself, but as an incident introduced in the course of some more pretentious illusion, produces a very good effect. A great deal of the sparkle of a conjuring entertainment depends upon the performer's readiness in what may be called by-play, consisting of a number of minor tricks not supposed to form part of the settled program, but merely introduced incidentally, and used, as it were, as a garnish to the more important feats. Thus, when a coin, an egg, or other small article is required for the purpose of a trick, the performer may fetch it openly from behind the scenes, or have it handed to him by his servant. But this is a commonplace proceeding. The higher class of performers prefer in such cases to produce the article from the hair, whiskers, or pocket of one of the audience, and, in like manner, when the article has served its purpose, to make it vanish by some magical process, rather than by the prosaic methods of everyday life. These little incidents serve to keep the audience on the qui vive, and they further assist materially in keeping up the continuity of an entertainment. In a thoroughly good performance the audience should have no time to think, but should be led direct from one surprise to the contemplation of another. The trick we are about to describe is of the class above alluded to. In the course of one or other of your card tricks, you have, or make occasion to ask, some person to go and place a given card on the table, or to examine a card already placed there. He does so, and is about to return to his place, but you check him. No, sir, that won't do. I want everybody to see what card it is. Will you be good enough to stand it up on end with its face to the company, so that everybody can see it? He looks foolish, and finally says that he can't do it. Not do it, you reply. My dear sir, it's the simplest thing in the world. Allow me. In taking the card from him, you place it upright on the table, and leave it standing without any visible support. Taking it up again, you hand it round to show that there is no preparation about it, and on receiving it back again, stand it upright, but with the other end upwards, or, if challenged, allow the audience themselves to choose a card which you cause to stand alone with equal facility. The secret lies in the use of a very small and simple piece of apparatus, being in fact merely a strip of tin or sheet brass, an inch and a half in length, and five-eighths of an inch in width, bent at a shade less than a right angle, say eighty-five degrees, its shorter arm being one-third of its length. On the outer surface of the long arm is spread a thin layer of beeswax, made more adhesive by the addition of a small portion of Venice turpentine and to the inner surface of the shorter arm is soldered a small piece of lead, about an eighth of an inch thick. When you desire to perform the trick, you have this little appliance concealed in your right hand, the longer arm between the first and second fingers, and the shorter arm pointing towards the little finger. Picking up the card with the left hand, you transfer it to the right, 
taking hold of it in such a manner that the fingers shall be behind and the thumb in front of the card. As you place the card on the table, which, by the way, must be covered with a cloth, you press against it the waxed side of the slip of tin, which will slightly adhere to it, and thus form a prop or foot, the little lump of lead acting as a counterpoise to the weight of the card. You pick it up with the same hand, and as you transfer it to the other, you will find no difficulty in removing and secreting between the fingers the little prop. If the wax is properly amalgamated, it should leave no mark on the card. CHANGING CARD BOXES, AND TRICKS PERFORMED WITH THEM The changing card box, in its simplest form, is a small flat box in walnut or mahogany. Its outside measurement is four inches by three, and not quite an inch deep. Inside it is just large enough to admit an ordinary-sized playing card. The upper and lower portions of the box, which are connected by hinges, are exactly alike in depth, and each is polished externally, so that the box, which, when open, lies flat like a book, may be closed either way up, and either portion will, according as it is placed, become box or lid in turn. Thus, by using a card which unknown to the audience has two faces, for example, is an ace of hearts on the one side and an ace of spades on the other, and placing such card in one side of the open box, you have only to close the box with that side uppermost, or to turn over the box as you place it on the table to transform the card just shown into a different one. There is nothing in the appearance of the box itself to indicate that it has been turned, so to speak, wrong side up, and a very little practice will enable you to turn it over as you place it on the table without attracting observation. There is a further appliance in connection with the box in question which, however, may be used with or without it, as may best suit the trick in hand. This is a loose slab, small a, of the same wood of which the interior of the box is made, of the thickness of cardboard, and of such a size as to fit closely, though not tightly, in either half of the box. When so placed, it has the appearance of the inside top, or bottom, of the box. When the box is closed in such manner that the part in which this slab is placed is uppermost, the slab falls into the lower portion, thus forming a false bottom on whichever side happens to be undermost. If a card, say the Ace of Hearts, be secretly placed in either side of the box, and this slab placed on it, the box will appear empty. If now another card, say the Knave of Spades, be openly placed in either side, and the box closed in such manner that the portion containing the false bottom is undermost, no change will take place. But if, either in closing the box or subsequently, it is so placed that the side containing the false bottom becomes uppermost, the false bottom will at once drop into the opposite division, and on reopening the box the Ace of Hearts will be revealed, and the Knave of Spades will in its turn be concealed. The effect to the spectators is as if the Knave of Spades had changed into the Ace of Hearts. These card boxes are frequently worked in pairs, as follows. The boxes are prepared by placing a different card secretly in each, say an Ace of Hearts in the one, and a knave of spades in the other. The performer brings them forward to the company, each hanging wide open, and held by one corner only, with the first and second finger inside, and the thumb outside the box, taking care, however, to hold each by the side containing the false bottom, which is thus kept in position by the pressure of the fingers. So held, the boxes appear absolutely empty, having drawn attention to the entire absence of any preparation the performer lays them open upon the table, and taking up a pack of cards requests two of the company each to draw one. They, of course, imagine that they are making a free choice, but in reality he forces, either by sleight of hand or by means of a forcing pack, the ace of hearts and the knave of spades. Again bringing forward the two boxes, he requests each person to place his card in one of them, taking care so as to arrange that the person who has drawn the ace of hearts shall place it in the box already containing the concealed knave of spades, and vice versa. Closing each box with the portion containing the false bottom uppermost, he now announces that, at his command, the cards will change places, which, on reopening the boxes, they appear to have done. By again turning over the boxes, they may be made to return to their original quarters. 
Numerous other good tricks may be performed with the aid of these boxes, which should form part of the collection of every conjurer. By placing a given card beforehand beneath the false bottom, and forcing a light card, you may allow the card drawn to be torn into twenty pieces, and yet by placing the fragments in the box, or firing them at it from a pistol, restore the card instantly, as at first. In like manner, you may cause a given card to be found in the apparently empty box, or may cause a card openly placed therein to vanish altogether. The changing box is also sometimes employed by those who are not proficient in sleight of hand, as a substitute for forcing, in the following manner. The performer requests some person to draw a card, and, without looking at it, to place it face downwards in the box for supposed safekeeping. The box is presently opened by the same or some other person who is requested to note what the card is. He does so, believing the card to be that which was drawn, and which he had just before seen placed in the box, whereas the card he now examines is, in reality, one concealed beforehand in the box by the performer to suit his purpose, the card actually drawn being now hidden by the false bottom. THE MECHANICAL CARD BOX this also is a piece of apparatus for changing a chosen card to another. It is somewhat the same in principle as the card boxes last described, but differs from them a good deal in detail. It is an oblong wooden box in external measurement about four and a half inches by three and a half, and four inches high. Internally, the measurement is so arranged that putting the lid out of the question, the front of the box is of exactly equal area with the bottom. Against this front lies a slab of tin or zinc, working on a cloth hinge along its lower edge, thus rendering it capable of either lying flat on the bottom of the box, which it exactly covers, or of being folded up against the front, the upper edge of which projects slightly inwards so as to aid in concealing it. This flap, like the whole inside of the box, is painted black. On one point of its upper surface is a little stud which, when the flap is raised, fits into a hole prepared for it in the lock, across which passes the hinder end or tail of the bolt. The box is prepared for use as follows. The key is turned, as if locking the box, which, however, is held open. Thus pushing forward the bolt of the lock, and the flap is lifted up against the front, the stud passing into the little hole before mentioned. The key is then again turned, as if unlocking the box, when the tail of the bolt catches the stud and secures the flap. The box will in this condition bear any amount of examination, but as soon as it is closed and the key turned to lock it, the tail of the bolt being again shot forward no longer retains the stud, and the flap falls. When in actual use a card, say the ace of spades, is placed upon the flap and folded up with it against the front of the box, the card to be changed, suppose the nine of diamonds, is in due course openly placed in the box, which is then handed to someone with a request that he will himself lock it, that there may be no possibility of deception. The trick proceeds, and when the box is again opened, the card placed therein is found transformed to the ace of spades. Some card boxes are so made that the flap, instead of falling actually upon the bottom of the box, falls parallel to it but at a distance of an inch or so above it, leaving a hollow space beneath capable of containing a lady's handkerchief, a canary, or any other small article which being covered by the falling flap is thus apparently changed into a card. The box in this case is somewhat taller in proportion than that above described. End of section 15section 16 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman card tricks requiring special apparatus part 3 the card and bird box this is, in form and general appearance, similar to that form of the card box last above described, that which has an enclosed space beneath the flap. 
but its working is precisely the converse. In other words, the normal condition of the flap in this case is to lie folded against the back of the box, against which it is pressed by the action of a spring. It may, however, be folded down so as to lie parallel with the bottom, a little catch projecting from the inner surface of the front holding it in that position. The lock is in this case a mere sham, having neither key nor keyhole, but a little stud projecting from the lower edge of the lid, and representing the staple of the lock, presses, when the box is closed, upon an upright pin passing through the thickness of the wood up the front of the box, and thereby withdraws the catch, when the flap flies up, concealing the card which has just been placed upon it, and revealing the bird or other object which had previously been concealed beneath it. The same principle is sometimes applied to the card box, the flap when set lying flat on the bottom of the box, leaving no hollow space below. The Card Tripod This is a miniature table, standing five or six inches high. It has a round top of about the same diameter, supported on a tripod foot. It is provided with an ornamental cover of tin or pasteboard, shaped somewhat like the top of a coffee pot just large enough to fit neatly over the top of the table, and about an inch deep. The table has a false top, made of tin, but japanned to match the real top, and of such a size as to fit tightly within the cover. If the false top be laid upon the true one, and the cover placed over both, the cover will, on being again removed, carry with it the false top, and leave exposed the real one, which, however, the audience take to be that which they have already seen. The reader will already have perceived that the card tripod is in effect very similar to the changing card box. Like the card box, it may be used either singly or in pairs, and the tricks performed by its aid will be nearly the same. Thus two forced cards drawn by the audience may be made to change places from one tripod to another. A card drawn and destroyed may be reproduced from its own ashes, or a card drawn and placed on the tripod may be made to vanish altogether the drawn card being in each case laid upon the false top, that to which it is to be apparently transformed, having been previously placed under the false and upon the true top. A card once changed, however, cannot be restored to its original condition, and the card tripod is therefore in this respect inferior to the card box. The Torn Card This is a very effective trick. The performer requests some one of the company to draw a card, and having done so, to tear it up into any number of fragments. He does so, and hands them to the operator, who returns one corner to him, with a request that he will take particular care of it. The performer announces that, out of the torn fragments, he will restore the card anew, for which purpose he first burns the fragments on a plate or otherwise, carefully preserving the ashes. He then brings forward one of the changing card boxes already described, and, after showing that it is empty, closes it and places it on the table in view of all present. He next takes the ashes of the torn card and, loading a pistol with them, fires at the box. If he has not a pistol at hand, placing the ashes on the box, rubbing them on the lid, or any other act which gets rid of them will answer the same purpose. When the box is opened, the card is found whole, as at first, with the exception of one corner being, ostensibly, that which was retained by the drawer. Taking this piece in his right hand, and holding the card by one corner between the thumb and first finger of his left hand, the performer makes a motion as if throwing the small piece towards it. The small piece instantly vanishes from his hand, and at the same moment the card is seen to be completely restored, the torn corner being in its proper place. Some performers, instead of giving the drawer the torn corner to take charge of in the first instance, burn ostensibly the whole of the pieces and pretend surprise on finding that there is a corner missing when the card is restored. Directly afterwards, however, they pick up the missing fragment from the floor where they have just previously dropped it, and the trick proceeds as already described. The reader will no doubt already have conjectured that the card drawn is a forced one, and that the supposed restored card was concealed beforehand underneath the false bottom of the card box. 
This pretended restored card is in reality an ingenious, though simple piece of apparatus constructed as follows. A piece of tin is cut to the exact size and shape of a card. Out of this, at one of the corners, is cut an oblong piece, measuring about one inch by five-eighths. This piece is attached by a spring hinge, small a, small a, on one side of it, to the larger piece of tin, in such manner that it can be folded back, flat against it. The action of the spring, however, bringing it back again when released to its original position. To this piece of tin is soldered lengthways a narrow tailpiece of such length as to extend nearly to the opposite end of the larger piece of tin. This tailpiece forms a kind of handle wherewith to bend back the smaller piece of tin on its hinge, and at the same time acts as a check to prevent the action of the spring pressing the smaller piece beyond the plane of the larger one. A playing card is split in two in order to reduce its thickness, and the face of the card thus reduced is pasted on the front of the larger piece of tin. Previously, however, a piece, somewhat smaller than the little movable flap, is torn out of one corner, and pasted on the flap in such a manner that, when the latter is released, the torn piece will occupy its proper position with respect to the remainder of the card, which will thus appear complete. When, however, the movable flap is folded back, and so held by the pressure of the forefinger upon the tailpiece, the torn portion of the card will be folded back with it, as in figure 54. When the mechanical card is placed in the box, it should be thus folded back, and kept in position by a little bit of thin wire, half an inch long, and bent into a miniature staple or clip, which, slipped over the end of the tailpiece and the adjoining edge of tin, will effectually hold the flap back, and yet may be got rid of in an instant, when the forefinger is ready to take its place. You must take care so to place the card in the box as to be face uppermost when the box is opened, as the audience must not, of course, see the back. When you desire to make the card complete, you have only to slip aside the forefinger and thus release the movable flap. There are torn cards now made entirely of pasteboard, dispensing with the tin plate at the back. This is a decided improvement. As to the disappearance of the loose corner from your hand, you will find little difficulty when you have learnt the art of coin-palming to be hereafter explained. Assuming that you have at present no knowledge on this subject, you may proceed as follows. Take the bit of card between the forefinger and thumb of your right hand, and, as you make the motion of throwing it towards the mechanical card, push it with the ball of the thumb between the first or second joints of the first and middle fingers. This releases the thumb, and the inside of your hand being turned away from your audience, you run little risk of discovery, particularly as the same piece, apparently, is now seen in its proper place as part of the restored card. We must not omit to mention that there is a mode of performing the torn card trick in which the use of the mechanical card is dispensed with. In this case the performer secretly takes an ordinary card, say the knave of spades, and tears off one corner, which he carefully preserves. The card thus mutilated he places in a card-box or other similar piece of apparatus. Pack in hand he advances to the company and forces the knave of spades, having meanwhile the little corner piece of the concealed card hidden between the second and third fingers of his right hand. The card having been drawn, he requests the drawer to tear it up and place the pieces on a plate, which he hands him for that purpose. Having received the pieces, he says carelessly, you had better keep one piece for the purpose of identification, and so saying, hands him apparently one of the fragments of the card just torn, but really the concealed corner piece, which he drops from his hand on the plate, for that purpose in the very act of picking up. The trick then proceeds as already described up to the finding of the card partially restored, in which condition it is handed to the drawer, and its identity proved by showing that the torn edge exactly corresponds with the corner retained. The trick may either end here, or by using a second card-box, card tripod, or the like, the card and corner may be again changed for a complete card. Mechanical Changing Cards These are of two or three kinds, but all have the same object, viz. 
the apparent transformation of the card to a different one. In some cases the change is from a court card of one suit to the same card of another suit, for example a king of spades to a king of hearts, involving merely the alteration of the pip in the corner. This is effected by having the card made double, that portion of the front card on which the pip should be being cut out. The hindmost card, which is pasted only round the extreme edge to the front one, is a plain white card, but with the appropriate pip, say a spade, neatly painted in the proper position to allow of its showing through the opening in the front card, which thus has the appearance of an ordinary king of spades. Between the two cards is a movable slip, worked by a pin through a slip in the back, on which is painted a heart pip. By moving this slip, the heart is in turn brought opposite the opening, covering the spade pip, so that the card now appears to be the king of hearts. The card, as above described, is of the old single-headed pattern, but the same principle may be applied to double-headed cards. In this case, both of the pip portions of the front card are cut away as in figure 55, while on the upper corresponding portion of the hinder card is painted, say, a spade, and on the lower a heart as in figure 56. The movable slip is of such a shape and size as to cover the one or the other, according as it is drawn up or down. And on the upper part of this is painted a heart, and on the lower a spade. When therefore the slip is pushed up, the heart pip on the slip and the heart pip on the hindmost card are shown, so that the card appears to be a king of hearts. When on the other hand the slip is drawn down, the spade pip of the hinder card is revealed, and at the same time the slip covers over the heart pip of this latter, and exhibits its own spade pip, giving the card the appearance of a king of spades. These mechanical cards are used in various ways. Such a card may be introduced with good effect in the trick of the rising cards before described. The king of spades, we will suppose, is one of the cards drawn. The changing card is made one of those which rise from the pack but is so arranged as to appear as the king of hearts. When the king of spades is called for, this card rises. The performer feigns to be taken by surprise, and asks the person who drew the card whether he is sure he is not mistaken, and that the card he drew was not the king of hearts. The drawer naturally maintains the correctness of his own recollection, while the performer as stoutly insists that the cards never deceive him, and that, if the king of spades had been drawn, the king of spades would infallibly have risen when called. At last, as if tired of the dispute, he says, Well, I still maintain you were mistaken, but as you insist that your card was the king of spades, why, we will make this into a king of spades. So saying, and holding up the card between his middle finger and thumb, he touches its face with his wand, and at the same moment with the first finger moves the slide, when the card changes to the king of spades. The little dispute as to the supposed mistake which the audience have hitherto believed to be genuine, gives to the transformation an impromptu air which is very effective. The performer may go on to say, still holding up the card, You are quite satisfied now, I presume. The drawer assents. Then, if so, as it would spoil my pack to have two kings of spades in it, you will allow me, before proceeding further, to change the card back again. Change. Again he touches the card with his wand, and it is seen to change back again to the king of hearts. Another mode of using the mechanical card is in conjunction with the changing card boxes above described. In this case the changing cards are used in pairs. One of them, arranged as the king of spades, is secretly placed in the one box, and the other arranged as the king of hearts in the other. Two of the spectators are requested each to draw a card, and two genuine kings of the same respective suits are forced upon them. Taking the cards so drawn, and showing the card boxes apparently empty, the performer places one of the cards in each, taking care to place the king of hearts in the box containing the ostensible king of spades, and vice versa. He now commands the two cards to change places, and opening the boxes, shows that his commands are obeyed. He then remarks, Now I dare say you all think that the trick depends on the boxes. To show you that it is not so, I will again order the cards to change, and this time I will not place them in the boxes, but will merely take one in each hand, so. If your eyes are quick enough, 
you will see the cards fly across from one hand to the other. Observe, the king of spades is in my right hand, and the king of hearts in my left. One, two, three, change, with a stamp and a slight flourish of the cards. Did you see them fly? Here is the king of hearts in my right hand, and the king of spades has passed to my left. I will put them in the boxes once more. You put each in the box which it before occupied, in doing so again making the change, but without closing the boxes. You continue, please to notice which I put in each box, the king of hearts in the right hand box, and the king of spades in the left hand box. Is that right? The audience reply in the affirmative. Excuse me, you say. I fear you are mistaken. You did not notice, perhaps, that the cards had changed again. You show that this is so, and then close the boxes so as to bring the cards originally drawn uppermost. Opening them once more, you show that the cards have again changed, and then remark, I have shown you that the secret does not lie in the boxes. Perhaps you would like to satisfy yourselves that there is no preparation about the cards, which you accordingly hand for examination. Another form of changing card is known as a flap card. This is a card across whose center is fixed a movable flap of exactly half its size. When the flap is folded one way, it covers the upper half, and when it is folded the other way, the lower half of the card, in each case revealing a different surface. On one of such surfaces is pasted, say, a queen of clubs, made thin by peeling off the back, and on the other surface, say, a nine of diamonds, prepared in like manner. Thus the card will appear, according as the flap is folded, alternately a queen of clubs or a nine of diamonds. An india-rubber spring tends to draw the flap down, so that the normal condition of the card is to appear as, say, the nine of diamonds. When exhibited to the company, the flap is forced over in the opposite direction, so that the card appears to be the queen of clubs. The thumb and finger hold the flap down until the right moment when they relax their pressure, and the flap flying up, the card is instantly transformed to the Nine of Diamonds. End of section 16 Section 17 of Modern Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Ship. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Principles of sleight of hand more especially applicable to coin tricks. Before attempting tricks with coin, it will be necessary for the student to practice certain sleights and passes which more especially belong to this particular branch of the magic art, though the sleight of hand used in coin tricks is more or less applicable to most other small objects. The principles which we have given for card tricks will not here be of any direct assistance to the student, but the readiness of hand and eye which he will have acquired, if he has diligently put in practice the instructions already given, will be of great value to him as a preliminary training, and it may safely be predicted that any person who is a first-rate performer with cards will find little difficulty in any other branch of the art. The first faculty which the novice must seek to acquire is that of palming, i.e. secretly holding an object in the open hand by the contraction of the palm. To acquire this power, take a half-crown, florin or penny, these being the most convenient in point of size, and lay it on the palm of the open hand. Figure 59. Now close the hand very slightly, and if you have placed the coin on the right spot, which a few trials will quickly indicate, the contraction of the palm around its edges will hold it securely. Figure 60. And you may move the hand and arm in any direction without fear of dropping it. You should next accustom yourself to use the hand and fingers easily and naturally while still holding the coin as described. A very little practice will enable you to do this. You must bear in mind while practicing always to keep the inside of the palm either downwards or towards your own body, as any reverse movement would expose the concealed coin. When you are able to hold the coin comfortably in the right hand, practice in like manner with the left after which you may substitute for the coin a watch, an egg, 
or a small lemon, all these being articles of frequent use in conjuring. Being thoroughly master of this first lesson, you may proceed to the study of the various passes. All of the passes have the same object, viz. the apparent transfer of an article from one hand to the other, though such article really remains in the hand, which it has apparently just quitted. As the same movement frequently repeated would cause suspicion and possibly detection, it is desirable to acquire different ways of effecting this object. For facility of subsequent reference, we shall denote the different passes described by numbers. Footnote. It should be here mentioned that the term palming, which we have so far used as meaning simply the act of holding any article, is also employed to signify the act of placing any article in the palm by one or other of the various passes. The context will readily indicate in which of the two senses the term is used in any given passage. It is hardly necessary to remark that the diagrams, save where the letterpress indicates the contrary, represent the hands of the performer as seen by himself. Pass 1. Take the coin in the right hand between the second and third fingers and the thumb, figure 61, letting it, however, really be supported by the fingers and only steadied by the thumb. Now move the thumb out of the way and close the second and third fingers with the coin balanced on them into the palm, figure 62. If the coin was placed right in the first instance, you will find that this motion puts it precisely in the position above, described as the proper one for palming, and on again extending the fingers, the coin is left palmed as in figure 60. When you can do this easily with the hand at rest, you must practice doing the same thing with the right hand in motion toward the left which should meet it open, but should close the moment that the fingers of the right hand touch its palm, as though upon the coin which you have by this movement feigned to transfer to it. The left hand must thenceforward remain closed as if holding the coin and the right hand hang loosely open as if empty. In the case of an article of larger size than a coin, as for instance a watch or an egg, you need not take the article with the fingers, but may let it simply lie on the palm of the right hand, slightly closing that hand as you move it towards the left. The greater extent of surface in this case will give you plenty of hold, without the necessity of pressing the article into the palm. Remember that, in any case, the two hands must work in harmony, as in the genuine act of passing an article from the one hand to the other. The left hand must therefore rise to meet the right, but should not begin its journey until the right hand begins its own. Nothing looks more awkward or unnatural than to see the left hand extended with open palm before the right hand has begun to move towards it. After the pass is made, a judicious use of the wand will materially assist in concealing the fact that the object still remains in the right hand. For this purpose, the performer should, before commencing the pass, carelessly place the wand under either arm, as though merely to leave his hands free. Immediately that the pass is made, the right hand should, with a sort of backhanded movement, which under the circumstances is perfectly natural, grasp the wand, draw it from under the arm, and thenceforth retain it till an opportunity occurs of disposing of the coin as may be necessary. The position of the fingers in the act of holding the wand is such as to effectually mask the concealed coin, while yet the hand appears perfectly easy and natural. The same expedient may be employed with equal advantage in the remaining passes. Pass 2. This is somewhat easier than pass 1, and may sometimes be usefully substituted for it. Take the coin edgeways between the first and third fingers of the right hand, the sides of those fingers pressing against the edges of the coin, and the middle finger steadying it from behind. Figure 63. Carry the right hand towards the left and at the same time move the thumb swiftly over the face of the coin till the top joint just passes its outer edge, figure 64. Then bend the thumb and the coin will be found to be securely nipped between that joint and the junction of the thumb with the hand, figure 65. As in the last case, the left hand must be closed the moment the right hand touches it, and the right must thenceforth be held with the thumb bent slightly inwards towards the palm, so that the coin may be shielded from the view of the spectators. This is an especially quick mode of palming, 
and if properly executed, the illusion is perfect. It is said to be a special favourite of the elder Frickel. Pass 3. Hold the left hand palm upwards with the coin in the position indicated in figure 59. Move the right hand towards the left and let the fingers simulate the motion of picking up the coin and instantly close. At the same moment, slightly close the left hand so as to contract the palm around the coin as in figure 60 and drop the hand, letting it hang loosely by your side. Pass 4. Le Tunique. This, sometimes known as the French drop, is an easy and yet most effective pass. Hold the left hand palm upwards with the coin as shown in figure 66. Now move the right hand towards the left, passing the thumb of the right hand under and the figures over the coin, closing them just as they pass it. The effect is the same to the eye of the spectator, as if you seize the coin with thumb and fingers, but in reality, at the moment when the coin is covered by the fingers of the right hand, you let it drop quietly, figure 67, into the palm of the left. The right hand you should carry upwards and forwards after it leaves the left hand, following it with your eyes and thereby drawing away the attention of the audience from the other hand. See figure 68. Do not be in too great a hurry to drop the left hand, but turn the palm slightly towards you with the fingers a little bent and after a moment's pause let it fall gently to your side. The hollow made by the bent fingers will be sufficient to hold the coin. This pass is available even for a sixpence or threepenny piece which, from their small size, cannot readily be palmed by the ordinary means. It is also very useful for ball conjuring. Pass 5. La Pinchette. This is a modification of the pass last described. The coin is held, as in figure 69, between the thumb and first and second fingers of the left hand. You then make the movement of taking it between the same fingers of the other hand, which for that purpose makes a kind of swoop down upon it, the back of the hand being kept towards the spectators. At the moment when the coin is covered by the fingers of the right hand, it is allowed to slip gently down into the palm of the left, and the right is instantly elevated as if containing it. Pass 6. This pass is best adapted for use with three or four coins, as the chink of the coins against one another materially assists the illusion. Having to get rid of, say, fourpence or florins, you take them in the right hand as indicated in figure 70, viz. well back towards the wrist. Move the right hand sharply towards the left with the fingers foremost so that the fingertips of the right hand may come smartly at about right angles against the palm of the left, at the same time slightly bending the fingers. The coins, instead of being shot forward as to the eye and ear of the spectators they appear to be, into the left hand, are in reality retained in the hollow formed by the fingers of the right, as in figure 71. They are turned completely over as the hands come in contact, producing a loud chink. The left hand is, of course, closed, and the thumb of the right is allowed to sink gently on the coins, so that when the hand falls by your side, they may not make a second chink, and so betray their presence in the wrong hand. Pass 7. La Coulée. This pass is best adapted for a coin of large diameter, like the French five-franc piece, and is but little used by English conjurers. If, however, the student has a very small hand, a serious disadvantage in conjuring generally, he may find it convenient to use the pass in question with a half crown or penny. Take the coin in the right hand, between the first and second fingers and the thumb, and in the act of apparently transferring it to the left hand, gently slide it with the ball of the thumb into the position shown in figure 72, where it is held by the pressure of the first and fourth fingers against its opposite edges, the hand remaining completely open. Pass 8. The peculiarity of this pass is that it is made while holding the wand in the hand, a case in which none of the other passes are available. Holding the wand and coin in the right hand, as indicated in figure 73, you strike the edge of the coin sharply against the palm of the left hand and instantly close that hand. The effect of the movement is to drive back the coin, which should be held very lightly, into the position shown in figure 74, in which, being behind the first three fingers, it is completely hidden. You should lose no time in relaxing the fingers of the right hand and gently closing them around the coin, as their straightened position, if continued, might arouse suspicion. 
You must, however, be careful that in doing so you do not allow the coin to chink against the wand, as the sound would naturally draw attention to its whereabouts. It must not be imagined that all of the passes above given are in turn used by every performer. Almost every conjurer has his favourite pass or passes, either selected from those above described or invented by himself. Any mode by which a coin can be held in the hand without indicating its presence may be worked up into a pass. Thus, some performers will hold a coin by its edges between two of the fingers or between the thumb and the side of the hand. Others, again, hold the coin flat against the first or second joint of the second or third finger, retaining it by slightly bending the finger. The novice should experiment till he ascertains which method best suits the confirmation of his own hand. We have specified the hand to and from which each pass is generally used, but if the student desires to attain special excellence, he should practice until he is able to use each from left to right as well as from right to left. In performing before a company of spectators and standing with the left side towards them, it is well to use a pass which apparently transfers the coin from the right hand to the left and vice versa. The coin is thus left in the hand furthest away from the spectators and the performer has the benefit of the cover of the body in dropping it into the pochette or otherwise disposing of it. The student will here, as in card conjuring, find great advantage in practising before a looking glass before which he should, in the first place, actually do that, which he afterwards pretends to do, and carefully notice the positions and motions of his hands in the first case, which he should then do to his best to simulate that there may be as little difference as possible between the pretense and the reality. He should further accustom himself always to follow with his eyes the hand in which the object is supposed to be, this being the most certain means of leading the eyes and the minds of his audience in the same direction. When he is able to perform the passes neatly with a single florin or penny, he should then practice with coins of smaller size, with two coins at once, and afterwards with three or four. A word of caution may here be desirable. These passes must by no means be regarded as being themselves tricks, but only as processes to be used in the performance of tricks. If the operator, after pretending to pass the coin, say from the right hand to the left, and showing that it had vanished from the left hand, were to allow his audience to discover that it had all along remained in his right hand, they might admire the dexterity with which he had, in this instance, deceived their eyes, but they would henceforth guess half the secret of any trick in which palming was employed. If it is necessary immediately to reproduce the coin, the performer should do so by appearing to find it in the hair or whiskers of spectator, or in any other place that may suit his purpose, remembering always to indicate beforehand that it has passed to such a place, thereby diverting the general attention from himself. As the coin is already in his hand, he has only to drop it to his fingertips as the hand reaches the place he has named, in order, to all appearances, to take it from thence. Having given this little piece of advice as to the hand in which the coin actually is, we must add a few words more as to the hand in which it is not. Whenever you have, apparently, placed any article either in the closed hand or in some piece of apparatus from which it is afterwards to disappear, you should not, as a rule, show that the article has departed from the spot where you have apparently placed it without interposing some magical process, however slight, which may colourably account for its disappearance. A mere nothing will suffice. A touch of the wand, the pronouncing of a magic formula, the pressure of a finger but in some form or other the ceremony should never be omitted. Thus, to take a very simple example, we will suppose that by means of pass one, you have apparently placed in the left hand a coin which really remains in the palm of the right. If you at once open the left hand and show that the coin is not there, the spectators will naturally jump to the correct explanation, viz. that you did not, in reality, put the coin there at all. If, however, you delay opening the left hand for a minute or two, so as to let the audience get accustomed to the idea that the coin is therein, and then, before opening it, touch the hand mysteriously with your wand, or even simply, as you slowly open the left hand, rub the ball of the wrist with the second and third fingers of the hand which holds the coin, see figure 75, you not only give that hand an occupation apparently inconsistent with the fact of anything remaining concealed in it, but you suggest to the audience that the gesture in question is the cause of the disappearance of the coin. 
It is surprising what an effect even such a trifle as this has in misleading the judgment of a spectator. He knows perfectly well in the abstract that touching the closed hand with the wand or rubbing it with a finger of the opposite hand is not an adequate cause for the disappearance of the coin. But the fact being indisputable that the coin has disappeared, the mind unconsciously accepts the explanation which is thus indirectly offered. The advice here given becomes less important where, before the hand is opened, you are able to get rid of the object from that in which it originally appeared. Here the spectator is precluded from imagining that you retained it in the hand in which he first saw it, as that hand also is shown to be empty, and the absolute disappearance of the coin being a self-evident fact, you may leave the spectator to account for it in his own manner. The various passes may be employed not only to cause the disappearance of an article as above described, but to secretly exchange it for a substitute of similar appearance. These exchanges are of continual use in conjuring. Indeed, we may almost say that three parts of its marvels depend on them. Such an exchange having been made, the substitute is left in sight of the audience, while the performer, having thus secretly gained possession of the original, disposes of it as may be necessary for the purpose of the trick. We proceed to describe various forms of changes, denoting them as in the case of the passes by numbers. Change 1. You desire, we will suppose, to exchange, or in conjurer's parlance to ring, a florin, marked by the audience for another. You have the latter, which we will call the substitute, ready palmed in your left hand, of course taking care to keep the palm turned away from the audience. Taking the marked florin in the right hand, you palm it in that hand by pass 1 but instead of closing the left hand as the fingers of the right touch it, keep that hand loosely open and show lying on its palm the substitute which the audience take to be the original just placed there by your right hand. Change 2. This is the same as change 1, save that you use with the right hand pass 2 instead of pass 1. Change 3. Here also you use pass 2, but you have the substitute palmed in the right hand instead of the left. Taking up the marked florin with the same hand, you make with it pass two at the same instant dropping the substitute from its palm into the left hand. This is a very neat and effective change. Some performers are expert enough to make this change by means of pass one instead of pass two, the genuine coin taking the place of the substitute in the palm, but this demands dexterity of a more than average order. Change four. For this change you must have the substitute palmed in the right hand and take the marked coin between the thumb and second finger of the left. Then, by pass four, appear to take it in the right hand, and at the proper moment exhibit the substitute, which you have already in that hand. Change five. Have the substitute palmed in your right hand, and hold the marked coin openly on the palm of the left. Pick up the genuine coin with the right hand, at the same moment releasing the palmed substitute, which will accordingly fall into the left hand the fingers of which should be held slightly hollowed the better to conceal it. Show the marked coin in the right hand and say, You have seen me take up this coin visibly. I will make it return invisibly, or make some other appropriate observation. Close the left hand, make pass one or two with the right hand, with a motion towards the left, but without bringing the hands near together. The marked coin will, after the pass, be concealed in your right palm. Immediately opening your left hand, you show the substitute which the audience believe to be the original which they have just seen. There are many other changes, indeed. They are almost too numerous to describe. If you are able to palm and to make the various passes neatly, you will readily invent methods of ringing for yourself. In the meantime, you will find that the above will answer every necessary purpose so far as coin tricks are concerned. End of section 17. Section 18 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Tricks with Coin Without Apparatus, Part 1. There is an immense variety of tricks with coins, some with apparatus, some without some demanding a thorough mastery of sleight of hand, some so simple as to be within the compass of the merest tyro. 
the only classification which we shall attempt will be to divide them into such as do and such as do not require special apparatus a florin being spun upon the table to tell blindfold whether it falls head or tail upwards you borrow a florin and spin it or invite some other person to spin it on the table which must be without cloth you allow it to spin itself out and immediately announce without seeing it whether it has fallen head or tail upwards this may be repeated any number of times with the same result though you may be blindfolded and placed at the further end of the apartment the secret lies in the use of a florin of your own on one face of which say on the tail side you have cut at the extreme edge a little notch thereby causing a minute point or tooth of metal to project from that side of the coin if a coin so prepared be spun on the table and should chance to go down with the notched side upwards it will run down like an ordinary coin with a long continuous whirr the sound growing fainter and fainter until it finally ceases but if it should run down with the notched side downwards the friction of the point against the table will reduce this final whirr to half its ordinary length and the coin will finally go down with a sort of flop the difference of sound is not sufficiently marked to attract the notice of spectators but is perfectly distinguishable by an attentive ear therefore if you have notched the coin on the tail side and it runs slowly you will cry tail if quickly head if you professedly use a borrowed florin, you must adroitly change it for your own under the pretense of showing how to spin it or the like. You should not allow your audience to imagine that you are guided by the sound of the coin, as, if once they have the clue, they will easily learn to distinguish the two sounds. They are not, however, likely to discover the secret of the notch, and if anyone professes to have found out the trick, you may, by again substituting an unprepared florin, safely challenge him to perform it. Odd or Even, The Mysterious Edition this is a trick of almost childish simplicity depending upon an elementary arithmetical principle we have however known it to occasion great perplexity even to more than ordinarily acute persons you take a handful of coins or counters and invite another person to do the same and to ascertain privately whether the number he has taken is odd or even you request the company to observe that you have not asked him a single question but that you are able notwithstanding to divine and counteract his most secret intentions and that you will in proof of this yourself take a number of coins and add them to those he has taken when if his number was odd the total shall be even if his number was even the total shall be odd requesting him to drop the coins he holds into a hat held on high by one of the company you drop in a certain number on your own account he is now asked whether his number was odd or even and the coins being counted the total number proves to be as you stated exactly the reverse the experiment is tried again and again with different numbers but the result is the same the secret lies in the simple arithmetical fact that if you add an odd number to an even number the result will be odd if you add an odd number to an odd number the result will be even you have only to take care therefore that the number you yourself add whether large or small shall always be odd to change a florin into a penny back again and then to pass the same invisibly into the pocket of the owner this is a trick of genuine sleight of hand and will test your expertness in two or three different passes having beforehand palmed a penny in your right hand you borrow from one of the company a florin or half crown requesting the owner to mark it in such manner that he may be able to identify it make him stand up facing you your own right side and his left being towards the audience taking the marked florin between the fingers and thumb of the right hand the back of which from your position will be toward the spectators you ask him whether he is nervous whether he can hold fast and so on on receiving satisfactory replies you state that you are about to put him to the test and request him to hold out his right hand telling him that you are about to count to three and that at the word three you will drop the florin into his hand which he is to close tightly upon it you accordingly count one two three each time making a motion as if dropping the florin into his hand and at the word three actually do drop it when he closes his hand upon it as directed but you are not satisfied that won't do my sir you exclaim you are not half quick enough you will allow all the electric fluid to escape we'll try once more and pray be a little quicker in your movements oblige me with the coin again now then are you ready one two three giving the words with great energy as you say three you stamp your foot and apparently again drop the florin but really drop the penny instead by change three he is sure this time to close his hand very quickly and having no reason to the contrary naturally believes that it is the florin which he holds your previous feint when you did actually drop the florin being specifically designed to lead him to that conclusion you next request him to hold the closed hand high that all may see it 
this draws the general attention to him and away from yourself and enables you to place in your palm the florin which was left after the change in the bend of your right thumb you continue you did better that time sir now what will you bet me that i cannot take that two shilling piece out of your hand without you knowing it whether he admits or defies your power the course of the trick is the same well you say at last you seem so determined that i am almost afraid to take the whole of the two shilling piece away from you i think i must be content with one and eleven pence allow me to touch your hand with my wand you do so and on opening his hand he discovers that the two shilling piece has changed into a penny you thank him for his assistance hand him the penny and dismiss him to his seat naturally enough he objects to accept the penny in place of his florin you pretend at first not to understand him but as if suddenly enlightened you exclaimed oh the florin you want the florin my dear sir indicating the penny that is the florin at present it is only under an electric influence but you have only to wait till that goes off it won't take more than three weeks or so when it will resume its former appearance you don't believe me i see but i can easily convince you by discharging the electric fluid when the change will take place at once observe you take the penny between the thumb and second finger of the left hand after the manner indicated in figure sixty six and make change four making a gentle rubbing movement with the fingers and thumb of the right hand before you open that hand and disclose the restored florin at the same time carelessly dropping your left hand to your side and letting the penny fall into your pochette on that side bring up the left hand again showing but without apparent design that it is empty and still holding the coin in the right hand make pass one as if you transferred it to the left hand make a motion with the left hand as if handing the coin and say to the owner will you be good enough to examine the florin and see that it is the same you marked he naturally holds out his hand for the coin which he believes to be in your left hand and which you pretend to give him but it has vanished well you say is it the same florin looking probably rather foolish he replies that he has not got it not got it you say why well, i have just given it to you i passed it into your pocket look for yourself he forthwith begins to search his pockets you are trying the wrong one you say this is the pocket as if desiring merely to assist his search you plunge into any pocket which he has not yet tried your right hand in the palm of which was the coin left after the pass and letting the coin drop to the finger ends take it out as if it were already in the pocket as nine-tenths of the audience will believe it to have been to make a marked florin and penny wrapped in separate handkerchiefs change places at command borrow a florin or half crown and a penny requesting the owners to mark them that they may be sure of knowing them again also borrow two pocket handkerchiefs it may be well to mention once for all that it is generally desirable to borrow from the audience when you can any indifferent article used in a trick e g a hat a watch or a handkerchief as you thereby seem to give a guarantee for the absence of preparation articles so borrowed are taken upon trust so to speak and by making a secret exchange you may still use a prepared substitute which will escape the close scrutiny to which any article confessedly provided by yourself would be subjected while the articles above mentioned are being collected from the audience you secretly palm in your left hand a penny of your own receiving the borrowed coins in your right hand apparently transfer them to the left but really only transfer the florin the marked penny remaining in your right hand this may be effected by making a pass with the marked penny at the same time allowing the marked florin to drop from the palm as directed in change three take the earliest opportunity of transferring the marked penny to the palm of the right hand and showing the marked florin and substitute penny which the spectators take to be the genuine one on the open left hand place them on your table begging the audience to observe that they do not for one moment leave their sight then picking up with the right hand the florin on which you may casually show the mark and throwing one of the borrowed handkerchiefs over the hand take hold through the handkerchief of apparently the florin which you have just shown but really of the marked penny and transfer the marked florin to the palm the shape of the coin which the audience takes to be the florin will be distinctly seen through the handkerchief whose folds will fall down around it give the handkerchief containing the coin to some person requesting him to hold it tightly just below the coin and well above his head that all may see it footnote this takes it out of the range of his eyes and prevents his indulging any desire for a premature examination of the contents. End of footnote. Now take up the substitute penny and apparently wrap it in like manner in the second handkerchief, really substituting as before the coin concealed in your palm. The substitute penny, which remains in your right hand, you must drop into your pochette or profonda at the first available opportunity. Give the second handkerchief to another person to hold. The first handkerchief now, to all appearance, contains the florin, and the second the penny. 
Invite the two persons to stand face to face, the hands holding the handkerchiefs just touching, and after gravely cautioning them to hold very tight, etc., etc., give their hands a gentle rap with your wand, saying, Change. Upon examination, the coins are found to have obeyed your commands. Managed with neatness and address, this is an admirable drawing-room trick. The previous marking of the coins apparently precluding any possibility of using substitutes, and allowing the spectator no alternative but to admit that by some mysterious means the identical coins have changed places. A similar trick may be performed without the use of a handkerchief. As before, you borrow a marked florin and penny, exchanging the latter for one of your own, and palm the genuine one. Taking up the marked florin from the table, you hand it to someone to hold, substituting for it as you do so the genuine penny by change three, as indicated in the trick last described. The florin is thus left in your right hand. Palm it, and take up the substitute penny between the second finger and thumb of the left hand, and pretend by pass four to transfer it to the right, which you immediately close. Drop the penny into your pochette on the left side, and announce that by your magic power you will compel the penny which you hold to change places with the florin held by the spectator. When the hands are opened, the supposed change is found to be accomplished. To make two marked coins wrapped in separate handkerchiefs come together in one of them. The coins and handkerchiefs borrowed for the purpose of the last trick will again serve in this one. Palm in your right hand a penny of your own, and throw over the same hand one of the borrowed handkerchiefs. This will effectually conceal the substitute penny, which you may now take between the finger and thumb. Holding the handkerchief spread out upon the open hand, you take up with the left hand the marked penny and place it on the handkerchief, as if to wrap it therein, but at the same time with the third finger push a fold of the handkerchief under the substitute penny in your right hand. You now invert the handkerchief over your left hand for a minute, allowing the marked penny to drop back into the hand, and at the same time twist the fold already mentioned around the substitute. The audience seeing the shape of a coin wrapped in a handkerchief, and naturally believe that it is that of the marked penny which you have apparently placed inside it. In reality, it is that of your own penny, wrapped merely in an outside fold. You now hand the handkerchief to someone to hold, requesting him to grasp the coin and hold it tightly. The marked penny, it will be remembered, remains in your left hand, and the marked florin on the table. As you go to take up the latter, you transfer the penny to your right hand and palm it, then pick up the florin, holding it at the tips of the fingers. Spread the second handkerchief in the open palm of the left hand. Bring the florin down smartly upon it, and by the same movement let the penny fall from the palm onto the handkerchief. The two coins will now be lying, covered by the right hand, on the handkerchief a couple of inches apart. Close the left hand on both coins, and turn the hand over so that the edges of the handkerchief hang down. With the right hand, grasp the handkerchief five or six inches below the coins. Take one of these through the handkerchief between the finger and thumb of the left hand, letting the other fall loose inside the handkerchief, which you then invite someone to hold in like manner, but in a horizontal position. See figure 76. This position is adopted in order that the two coins may not, by accidental chink, prematurely disclose the fact that both are already in the handkerchief. You now announce that you are about to make both coins pass into one handkerchief. Advancing to the person who holds the first handkerchief, you request him, still maintaining his hold, to remove his hand four or five inches below the coin to give you room to operate. First, showing that your hand is empty, you gently rub the substitute penny through the handkerchief between your finger and thumb when, being only wrapped within a fold, it quickly falls into your hand. No one ever thinks of inquiring at this point whether it is the marked one or not. Taking in the left hand, in position for pass four, you say to the person holding the second handkerchief, Having extracted this penny from the one handkerchief, I will now pass it into the other. I won't even touch the handkerchief, but will simply take the coin in my hand and say pass. Will you be good enough, at the word pass, to let go of the coin you are holding, but still keep hold of the handkerchief with the other hand? Appearing by pass four to take the penny in the right hand, you open that hand with a quick motion toward the handkerchief, saying pass. The person holding the handkerchief looses his hold as directed, when the two coins are heard to chink together, as though the second coin had just arrived in the handkerchief, and on examination they are, of course, found to be those marked. We may here describe another, and still neater mode, the invention, we believe, of M. Robert Houdin, of apparently wrapping a coin securely in a handkerchief, though really only covered by an outer fold. Holding the coin upright between the fingers and thumb of the left hand, throw the handkerchief fairly over it. Having shown, it is fairly covered remark, but perhaps you may fancy I have changed the coin. Allow me to show you I have not. With the right hand palm upwards, take the coin through the handkerchief, as shown in figure 77, between the first and second fingers of that hand. For a moment, let go with the left hand, but without removing it from under the handkerchief. Turn over the right hand towards yourself, and again seize the coin with the left hand, but this time nip the opposite edge of the coin to that which it first held, and through the double thickness of the handkerchief. 
Remove the right hand from the coin and with it raise the outer edge of the handkerchief and show the coin as in figure 78. Then let the edges of the handkerchief fall. Apparently the coin is underneath and in the center of the handkerchief, but in reality it is outside, lying in a slight fold on the side away from the spectators. The above description sounds intricate, but, if carefully followed with the coin and handkerchief, will be found perfectly simple in practice. It is worth while taking some pains to acquire this sleight, as it is of great value in coin tricks. End of section 18. Section 19 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Tricks with Coin Without Apparatus, Part 2. To pull four florins or half crowns through a handkerchief. You begin by borrowing four marked half-crown thorns, or penny pieces, and a silk or cambric handkerchief. You then request the assistance of a very strong man. This gives an opportunity for a little fun in the selection. Having at last found a volunteer to your liking, you seat him on a chair facing the company. Spreading the handkerchief on your left palm and placing the four coins upon it, you close your hand upon them through the handkerchief and hand them to him, requesting him to hold them firmly. Then, as if suddenly recollecting yourself, you say, Pardon me, I have omitted one little detail which is rather important. Oblige me with the handkerchief again for one moment, if you please. I ought to have shown the company that there are no holes in it. The last sentence should not be pronounced until you have gained possession of the handkerchief, as a company might possibly declare themselves satisfied of the fact without examination, which would not answer your purpose. The handkerchief being returned to you, you spread it out to show that it is free from holes, coming among the audience to do so, and appearing to lay great stress upon the fact. Again, spreading it over your left hand, you count the coins one by one upon it, then giving a glance round at the company, you say, as you quickly return to your platform, you have all seen that the four coins are fairly wrapped in the handkerchief, or make any other remark in order to draw the general attention as a sharp, quick remark almost always will to your face and away from your hands. At the same moment you move the left thumb over the face of the coins, thereby covering them with a fold of the handkerchief, and seize them through the fold thus made between the thumb and fingers of the right hand, as indicated in figure 79, immediately withdrawing the left hand. The coins will now be held in the right hand, and the handkerchief hanging down loosely around them. To anyone who has not watched your movements with more than ordinary vigilance, it will appear that the coins are within and under the handkerchief, though they are, in reality, wrapped in an external fold. Giving them a twist round in the handkerchief, you hand it to the person assisting you, asking him to say whether the money is still there, to which he naturally replies in the affirmative. You then tell him to grasp the handkerchief with both hands, three or four inches below the coins, and to hold as tightly as he possibly can. Placing your wand under your right arm and taking hold of the coins, through the handkerchief, with both hands, the right hand undermost, you begin to pull against him, making a show of pulling with great force, and remarking that you are very glad it is not your handkerchief, that you should not have thought he was so strong, etc. Meanwhile, and while the company are enjoying the discomfiture of the owner of the handkerchief, you untwist the latter and secretly get the money out of the fold into your right hand and palm it therein. Give one last pull with your left hand and let go smartly, observing that you fear you must give up, and own yourself conquered. Take your wand in your right hand. This will make it seem natural for you to keep that hand closed, and will materially aid in concealing the fact that the money is therein. Your antagonist, or the spectators for him, will by this time have discovered that the money has vanished, but you pretend to be unconscious of the fact, and request him to give it back, that you may return it to the owners. He naturally declares that he has not got it. With all the seriousness that you can command, you insist that he has got it, and that he must restore it. On his continued denial, you suggest he should search his pockets, which you tap one after another with your wand, giving a metallic sound as if containing money, but the coins are still not to be found. At last, after all his pockets have been tried in vain, you, as if upon a sudden thought, tap the leg of his trousers, the metallic clink still following every tap of the wand till you have nearly reached his feet, when you exclaimed, Yes, there it is. Will you have the kindness to put your foot on that chair? He does so, and quickly transferring your wand to the left hand, with the fingers of your right you turn up the edge of the trouser, giving at the same time a slight shake when the four coins are seen to fall out, to the great surprise of the victim. 
The effect is produced as follows. The coins being in your right hand, you introduce them with the second, third, and fourth fingers under the edge of the trouser. Then, with the first finger and thumb which are left outside, you nip them through the cloth and hold them an instant till you have withdrawn the remaining fingers, when, with a slight shake, you let them fall. The metallic chink on tapping the pockets may be produced in two ways. One method is to use a hollow metal wand, japanned to match the one you ordinarily use, and containing throughout its length a loose piece of thick wire, which, striking against the sides of the tube, exactly imitates the chink of money. The other mode is to merely use the ordinary wand, allowing the end which you hold to chink against the money held in the same hand. With a little practice, the effect is equally deceptive as with the special wand. To pass a marked florin, or half-crown, into the center of two oranges in succession. For this excellent trick, a little previous preparation is necessary. A slit, an inch and a half deep and just large enough to admit a florin, is made in each of the two oranges, and in one of them a florin, which for distinction we will call number one, is placed. These must be put in readiness behind the scenes or so placed as to be out of sight of the audience. The performer palms in either hand a second florin, number two, and advancing to his audience, borrows from one of them a florin, first marked by the owner. This last we will call number three. He invites special attention to the fact that throughout the experiment he is about to perform, the coin is never removed from their sight, and he accordingly places it, really substituting, by one or other of the changes, florin number two, in full view on his table. He then goes out to fetch an orange and takes the opportunity of slipping the marked florin number three into the vacant one. He brings forward this orange publicly and places it on the table at his right hand. The other orange he has meanwhile placed in his secret pocket on the right side, ready for palming at a moment's notice. He then says, I think, by the way, it would be as well to have two oranges. Can any gentleman oblige me with one? No one responding, he looks about him, and presently stepping up to one of his audience, pretends to take from his hair, hat, or handkerchief the second orange, which contains, it will be remembered, florin number one and places it on the left side of the table. He now, standing behind his table, asks into which orange, the right or the left, he shall pass the florin. As the right of the audience is his left, he is at liberty to interpret the answer in whichever way he thinks proper, and he does so in such a manner as to designate the orange containing the non-marked florin number one. Thus, if the audience say, the left, he answers, on my left, very good. If they choose the right, he says, on your right, very good. Not one person in a thousand will detect the equivoque. Taking up floor number two from the table and holding it in his left hand, he pretends by the tourniquet to take it in his right and thence to pass it into the orange, meanwhile dropping it from his left hand on to the servante or into the profonde. Showing his hands empty, he cuts open the orange and exhibits the florin number one therein contained. Before giving the audience time to examine it for the remark, he hears, or pretends to hear, a murmur among them to the effect that that was not the orange chosen. Pardon me, he says, some of you seem to think that I had a special reason for preferring this particular orange. I gave you absolute liberty to choose which you liked, and I understood you to say that you chose this one. However, in order to satisfy everyone, I will repeat the trick with the other orange. Taking up the second orange, he thrusts the knife through it, in the slit already made, and gives the knife thus loaded to someone to hold. Then, standing at some distance from it, he takes up floor number one, and, getting rid of it by one or another of the passes, previously described, he makes a motion as if throwing it towards the orange. He now requests the person holding the orange himself to cut it open, when the genuine florin number three is found therein and duly identified. The finding of the second orange in the possession of the company may, if preferred, be admitted, and both oranges brought forward openly in the first instance. Occasionally, a refractory spectator may insist upon the wrong orange, i.e., that containing the genuine coin, being cut open first. As you have offered the audience the choice, you cannot well resist this, but it makes very little difference. In accordance with this general desire, you cut open the orange and show the coin, number three, drawing particular attention to the mark. Its identity being fully established, you offer, for the general satisfaction, to pass the same coin into the second orange. Being satisfied that it was the genuine coin in the first case, the audience will more readily believe that it is so in the second, but in this case you should cut open the second orange yourself, as it will be necessary to again substitute the genuine florin before you hand the coin to be examined. The Flying Monkey To make a coin pass invisibly from the one hand to the other, and finally through the table. Have ready beforehand a florin or half-crown, with a little wax on one side of it, and take an opportunity of secretly sticking it, by means of the wax, against the underside of the table, any ordinary table, with which you intend to perform the trick. 
Have also a similar coin of your own palmed in your right hand. Borrow a marked florin from one of the company and lay it carelessly upon the table, but in doing so exchange it for the one previously palmed. You now have the substitute on the table and the marked coin palmed in its place. Turn up your sleeves to show that they have nothing to do with the trick and make a few introductory remarks about the extraordinary power of the mesmeric influence as applied to metallic substances, then taking up the coin from the table between the fingers and thumb of the left hand which you hold with the palm towards the company so as to show incidentally that it is otherwise empty, continue to the following effect. Here ladies and gentlemen is an ordinary coin, a mere inert piece of silver. If you take it in your hand there it will remain till you lay it down but let a person possessing the mesmeric gift only breathe upon it you suit the action to the word and it is at once endowed with hearing sense and motion and will fly from hand to hand at the mere word of command and that so rapidly that its flight is absolutely invisible see i take it so taking it in the right hand one two three pass and it flies back into my left hand again in order to show that there has been no substitution perhaps the owner will kindly verify the mark the coin is examined and found to be the same. The solution is produced as follows. When you breathe upon the substitute coin, you naturally turn the left hand palm upwards. In the act of taking that coin in the right hand, which you do with the hands in the position depicted in figure 69, you drop the genuine coin, which was previously palmed in the right hand, into the left, the position of the hand concealing it from the audience. After a momentary pause, you close the left hand and hold it extended about level with your eyes. At each of the words one, two, three, you make a slight motion of the right hand towards it, and at the word pass, palm the coin by means of pass one, at the same time making a half turn of your body to the left, opening the left hand, and pointing with the index finger of the right hand to the coin lying therein. While it is being examined for the mark, you drop the substitute, which remains palmed in your right hand, into the pocket on that side, and bring your hand up empty. Having proceeded thus far, borrow a second florin, but without in this case suggesting that it should be marked. Breathe upon it, and lay it with that first used upon the table. Now with your right hand take up one of the coins and by pass one pretend to transfer it to the left, really retaining it in the palm of the right hand. Then take up the second coin between the fingers and thumb of the right hand and announce that you are about to make the coins which you now hold in each hand come together. Holding your arms well apart you make a motion with the left hand as if throwing something towards the right, at the same moment saying as before, one, two, three, pass, and making the two coins in the right hand come together with an audible chink. You then open the hand and show that the left is empty and that both of the coins are together in the right hand. You continue. You all think you know how that was done, I dare say. Imagine no doubt that the money was merely thrown from one hand to the other with extreme rapidity. The quickness of the hand deceives the eye, as Shakespeare, or somebody else, says. I will therefore show you the same experiment in another form in which you will find that no such solution is admissible. I will pass the money right through this table, which, as you see, is pretty solid. The quickness of the hand would not be of much use in this case. I take one of the coins in the left hand as before. Here, however, you introduce a feint. Taking up the coin in the right hand, you transfer it to the left, but purposely do it with a pretended awkwardness, and hold the right hand afterward rather stiffly, so as to lead the spectators to believe that you have really retained the coin in the right hand. To do this cleverly will require considerable practice, but it will by no means be labor lost, as feints of this kind are of frequent use. The spectators, delighted to have, as they imagine, caught you tripping, are sure to exclaim that the coin is still in your right hand. Surely, ladies and gentlemen, you say with an injured air, you don't think that I would avail myself of such a transparent artifice. See for yourselves. Opening your hands. I won't ask you to apologize, but pray give me a little more credit for the future. Come, we will have no mistake about it this time. Take the florin between the finger and thumb of the left hand, and by means of the tourniquet or pincette, appear to transfer it to the right. Pick up the second coin with the left hand, and place that hand under the table, holding the closed right above it. Say, pass, open the right hand, show it empty, and at the same moment chink the two florins together in the left hand, and bring them up for inspection. Looking around you, you continue. I am afraid you are only half convinced. Some of you look incredulous still. Come, we will try the experiment once more, and we will see whether you can find me out this time. As before, I take one coin in each hand this time you actually do so you again pass your left hand under the table detaching in its passage the third florin which you had previously stuck to the underside of the table but taking care that the two do not prematurely jingle together 
then holding the other florin with the finger to the right hand which should be held palm downwards about a foot above the table make pass one with that hand thus bringing the coin into its palm and at the same time chink the other two coins in the left hand and bring them up for examination one of them in this instance is a substitute and therefore in the unlikely event of the audience insisting that the trick should be performed with marked coins this last act must be omitted with a regular conjuring table this trick might be made even more surprising from the facilities which the servante would afford for getting rid of and regaining the coin but even if you habitually use such a table it is better not to avail yourself of it for this performance the trick is in any shape too minute for stage performance and in a drawing room it is apt to draw special attention to the table which in the case of a trick table is a little embarrassing end of section nineteen section twenty of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by k hand modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman tricks with coin without apparatus part three to rub one sixpence into three this is a simple little parlor trick but will sometimes occasion great wonderment procure three sixpences of the same issue and privately stick two of them as directed for the florin in the last trick with wax to the underside of a table at about half an inch from the edge and eight or ten inches apart announce to the company that you are about to teach them how to make money turn up your sleeves and take the third sixpence in your right hand drawing particular attention to its date and general appearance and indirectly to the fact that you have no other coin concealed in your hands turning back the table cover rub the sixpence with the ball of the thumb backwards and forwards on the edge of the table in this position your fingers will naturally be below the edge after rubbing for a few seconds say it is nearly done for the sixpence is getting hot and after rubbing a moment or two longer with increased rapidity draw the hand away sharply carrying away with it one of the concealed sixpences which you exhibit as produced by the friction pocketing the waxed sixpence and again showing that you have but one coin in your hands repeat the operation with the remaining sixpence the multiplication of money this is an old and favorite trick it may be performed with shillings pence or florins as may best suit your convenience whichever you use we will suppose florins you prepare for the trick by secretly palming in the right hand such number say three as you intend to magically add advancing to the audience you beg the loan of ten or a dozen florins the precise number is immaterial at the same time requesting someone of the company to collect them and bring them to you he collects we will suppose twelve you request him to count them openly on the table that all may be able to verify their number this being done you invite a second person also to step forward and assist Picking up from the table the same number of coins as you have concealed in your palm, you give them to one of the two persons, whom we will call A, to hold. Then, taking up the remaining coins, you request the second person, whom we will call B, to take charge of them. When he holds out his hand to receive them, you let fall with them the palmed coins, so that he really receives twelve, though he believes that he only has nine. You make him close his hand and hold it high above his head. You then ask A for the coins you entrusted to him. On his returning them to you, you take them between the second finger and thumb of the left hand and pretend by the tourniquet to transfer them to the right, really getting rid of them at the earliest opportunity on the servante or into one of your pochettes. The audience believe that the three coins are in your closed right hand. You announce that you are about to pass them invisibly into the hand of B, and after the necessary amount of magical gesture, you open your hand and show that they have vanished, and B, on examining his stock, finds that the supposed nine have increased to twelve. It is a very good plan in performing this trick for the performer himself to collect the coins from the company in a plate, the coins to be added being held in the same hand which carries the plate, when, the thumb being naturally above and fingers below, the coins are effectually concealed. After the coins have been counted, the performer, taking the plate in the other hand, pours them from it into the hand which already holds the concealed coins, thus bringing them together easily and naturally. A further improvement may be made in the trick by using, in place of an ordinary plate, a special plate or salver, generally made of tin japanned, but sometimes of crockery or china. The specialty of this plate, which is known as the money plate or multiplying salver, consists in a flat space running along its bottom between its upper and under surface, just wide enough and deep enough to hold concealed a row of coins, florins or shillings as the case may be, and closed at the one end but open at the other, the opening being concealed by the edge of the plate see figure 80 
You prepare the plate beforehand by placing in the concealed space three, four, or six coins and place it on your table. When you first take it up, you take hold of it near the opening when you may, of course, handle it as freely as you please, as, the mouth of the passage being upwards, the coins cannot possibly fall out. Letting the plate hang downwards in a perpendicular position, and passing it carelessly from hand to hand, the audience cannot help observing that you have nothing concealed in your hands. Then collect, or count out if already collected, the money in the plate, and, after taking away and handing A a number, equal to the coins concealed, pour the remainder direct from the plate into the hands of B. First, however, so reversing the position of the plate, which you may do by merely transferring it from one hand to another, as to turn the opening of the passage away from you. When you now slope the plate to pour the remaining coins into his hands, the money in the concealed passage will naturally pour out with them. See figure 80. Thus making the required addition with hardly a possibility of detection. It is a good plan to perform the trick first without, and then to repeat it with, the aid of the money plate, making a great point in the second instance of the fact that you do not even touch the money, and accounting for the use of the plate as designed to preclude all possibility for the use of sleight of hand, or any other mechanical mode of deception. The spectators, having already seen you perform the trick without the aid of the plate, are precluded from supposing that this latter has any special connection with the secret, and seeing clearly that you have in this instance no coins concealed in your hands, naturally conclude that the same was the case on the former occasion. Thus the repetition of the trick, instead of assisting them to a solution, rather increases the mystery. The trick may be varied at pleasure so far as regards the manner of the disappearance of the coins which are supposed to be passed invisibly into the hands of the person holding the larger number. One mode is to ask one of the company to wrap them up in a piece of stiff paper, for which you forthwith secretly substitute a piece of similar paper, in which a like number of coins have been wrapped, but have been removed, the paper, however, retaining the form of the coins. Taking this in the left hand, you pretend to take from it, invisibly, with the finger and thumb of the right hand, each coin in succession, and to pass it in the same manner into the hand of the person holding the remaining coins, finally tearing the paper in half to show that they really have passed away from it. Or you may, if you prefer it, place the coins in question on the vanishing plate, to be hereafter described, whence they mysteriously disappear as you take them off one by one. This is a very effective mode. Or you may place them in the plug box, the Davenport cabinet, or any other of the various appliances after mentioned for vanishing money. To make a marked sixpence vanish from a handkerchief, and be found in the center of an apple or orange previously examined. Have ready, concealed in either hand, a sixpence of your own, with a little wax smeared on one side of it. Roll another minute portion of wax into a round ball half the size of a peppercorn, and press it lightly upon the lowest button of your waistcoat, so that you may be able to find it instantly when wanted. You must also have at hand an ordinary full-sized table knife and a plate of oranges. You begin by borrowing a sixpence, requesting the owner to mark it, and a handkerchief. You spread the handkerchief flat on the table, with its sides square with those of the table. Then standing behind your table, you place ostensibly the borrowed sixpence, but really your own, with the waxed side up, in the center of the handkerchief, then fold over the corners one by one, beginning with one of those nearest to you, in such a manner that each shall overlap the sixpence by about an inch, gently pressing each corner as you fold it down. Ask someone to come forward and ascertain by feeling the handkerchief that the sixpence is really there. Then offer the knife for inspection, and after all are satisfied that it is without preparation, hand the plate of oranges to be examined in like manner, requesting the audience to choose one for the purpose of the trick. While they do so, your fingers go in search of the little ball of wax and press it against one side of the marked sixpence, which still remains in your hand. Press the sixpence against one side of the blade of the knife, at about the middle of its length, and lay the knife on the table, the sixpence adhering to its underside. Then taking hold of the handkerchief, as represented in figure 81, and blowing on its center, draw the hands quickly apart. The two corners of the side next to you will thus be brought one into each hand, and adhering to one of them, the one which you first folded down, will be the substitute sixpence, which will thus appear to have vanished. Hand the handkerchief for examination, that it may be seen that the coin has really disappeared, and meanwhile get rid of the substitute into your pocket or elsewhere. Turn up your sleeves and show that your hands are empty. Then take up the knife, taking care to keep the side on which the sixpence is, away from the spectators, and cut open the orange. Cut about halfway down with the point, and then finish the cut by drawing the whole length of the blade through the opening thus made. This will detach the sixpence, which will fall between the two halves of the orange, as though it had all along been contained therein. Wipe it with the handkerchief to remove the juice of the orange from it, and at the same time rub off any wax which may still adhere to it, and hand it for identification. The coin may, if preferred, be found in an egg instead of in the orange, the audience being invited to choose which shall be used. This trick is sometimes performed by the aid of a knife made for this special purpose. 
with a small spring lever after the manner of a flute key soldered against one side of the blade the coin is held in position by the short arm of the lever which answers the same purpose as the wax in the form of the trick above described the disadvantage of using this which is known as the fruit knife is that you cannot hand the knife for examination and this to our mind spoils the trick the traveling counters this is a very similar trick to that already described under the title of the multiplication of money it is performed with twelve metal counters the performer begins by counting the twelve counters on the table then taking up four of them he hands them to a spectator to hold and taking the remainder in his own hand commands them to change places on examination his commands are found to be obeyed the spectator has eight while the performer has only four the spectator is now requested to take charge of the eight when the operator commands the four which he himself holds to rejoin them this also is found to be accomplished the operator now hands the twelve to a second spectator requesting him to hold them tightly after a moment's interval he is requested again to count them but finds he has grasped them too tightly for they are now welded together into a solid mass the performer again takes them and by merely breathing on them restores them to their original state the student with the experience which he has by this time gained will naturally conjecture that the trick is in reality performed with sixteen loose counters and twelve soldered together that the performer commenced the trick with four counters palmed in his right hand which he secretly added to the four which he handed to the spectator that taking up the remaining eight and apparently transferring them from his right hand to his left he really transferred four only leaving the remainder in the right hand and that when he again handed the eight counters to the spectator he added these last to them that in apparently transferring the remaining four from hand to hand he palmed them forthwith dropping them into one of his pochettes and taking from the same place or from under his waistband the solid twelve which he finally handed to the second spectator in place of the twelve loose counters again substituting the loose ones as before when by breathing on them he professed to restore them to their primitive state as the student has so successfully guessed all this it would be an impertinence on our part to further explain the trick the wandering sixpence have ready two sixpences, each slightly waxed on one side. Borrow a sixpence and secretly exchange it for one of the waxed ones, laying the latter, wax side uppermost, on the table. Let anyone draw two cards from an ordinary pack, take them in the left hand, and transferring them to the right, press the second wax sixpence against the center of the undermost, to which it will adhere. Lay this card, which we will call A, on the table, about eighteen inches from the sixpence which is already there, and cover that sixpence with the other card, B. Lift both cards a little way from the table to show that the sixpence is under card A, and that there is apparently nothing under card B. As you replace them, press lightly on the center of card A. You may now make the sixpence appear under whichever card you like, remembering that, if you wish the sixpence not to adhere, you must bend the card slightly upwards in taking it from the table, otherwise take it up without bending. End of section 20《Section 21 of Modern Magic》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson.《Modern Magic — A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring》by Professor Louis Hoffman. — Section 21 — Tricks with Coin Requiring Special Apparatus — part one the heads and tails trick this is a pretty little trick of an unpretending nature but of very good effect especially if introduced in a casual and apparently extempore manner the performer borrows or produces from his own pocket four penny pieces placing them upon the table he requests someone to make a pile of them all one way say tail upwards he next requests the same or another person to turn over the pile so made without disturbing the relative position of the coins and announces with an air of supernatural knowledge that they will now all be found head upwards this appears so ridiculously obvious that the audience naturally observe with more or less straightforwardness of expression that any fool could tell that pardon me says the performer it is not quite such a simple matter as you think i very much doubt whether any of you could do as much i will place the coins again watch me as closely as you please i will place them as before tail 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 is that fairly done now i will turn them over 
He does so, letting the tips of his fingers rest upon them. What are they now? A general chorus replies. All heads, of course. But on examination, it is found that only three are heads, and one a tail. Again he arranges them, placing them this time alternately, head, tail, head, tail. He turns them over. The natural order, beginning from below, would again be head, tail, head, tail. But they are found to be head, tail, tail, tail. Again he places them tail, 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 head. When turned over, they should be tail, head, 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 but are found to be tail, head, alternately. The secret lies in the use of a prepared penny, consisting of similar halves, in the case above described, two tails, soldered together so as to be tail on either side. This the performer palms in his right hand, after first going through the operation with the genuine coins, as above, he picks them up with his left hand, and apparently transferring them to the right, really transfers three of them only. He then performs the trick with these and the prepared coin, when the apparently miraculous result above described becomes a matter of course. It is best not to repeat the trick too often, and a little practice is necessary in order to be able to return the three genuine coins neatly to the left hand, in which the fourth borrowed coin must be retained throughout the trick, at the same time secretly retaining your own. It is a frequent occurrence for one or other of the company, imagining that the seeming wonder is, in some unexplained way, a result of some natural principle, to request to be allowed to try for himself. It is obvious that, under such circumstances, it would not do to hand him the prepared coin, and hence the necessity for some quick and natural method of again getting the four genuine coins together. The trick may be brought to an effective conclusion as follows. After you have got rid of the double-faced penny, you may continue. Perhaps it is a little too complicated for you with four coins. Suppose we try it with only one and I won't even turn it over. Placing one of the genuine pence in the middle of the right palm, which you hold out horizontally before you, you draw special attention to the fact that the coin is tail upwards. Quickly covering it with the other hand, you say, What is it now? Tail, is the reply. Wrong again, you say, and lifting up the hand, show that the coin has this time vanished altogether. This mysterious disappearance is effected as follows. When you apparently cover the coin with the left hand, you bring the hands together with a quick lateral motion, as though sliding the one across the other. This shoots the coin from the palm down the opposite sleeve, the motion being so quick that the keenest eye cannot detect it. This little sight is by no means difficult, and is well worthy of acquirement, as it may be introduced with equal effect in many tricks. The Magic Cover and Vanishing Halfpence This is a very old trick, but is still very popular with a juvenile audience. The principal apparatus consists of half a dozen halfpence, of which the centre portion has been cut out, leaving each a mere rim of metal. Upon these is placed a complete halfpenny, and the whole are connected together by a rivet running through the whole thickness of the pile. When placed upon the table, with the complete coin upwards, they have all the appearance of a pile of ordinary halfpence, the slight lateral play allowed by the rivet adding to the illusion. A little leather cap, shaped something like a fez, with a little button on the top, and of such a size as to fit loosely over the pile of half-pence, with an ordinary die, such as backgammon is played with, complete the necessary requirements. You begin by drawing attention to your magic cap and die, late the property of the king of the fairies. In order to exhibit their mystic powers, you request the loan of a half a dozen half-pence. The number must, of course, correspond with that of your own pile and while they are being collected, 
you take the opportunity to slip the little cap over your prepared pile which should be placed ready to hand behind some small object on the table so as to be unseen by the spectators pressing the side of the cap you lift the pile with it and place the whole together in full view in close proximity to the die the required halfpence having been now collected you beg all to observe that you place the leather cap which the spectators suppose to be empty fairly over the die taking the genuine coins in either hand you pretend by one or other of the passes to transfer them to the other holding the hand which is now supposed to contain the coins immediately above the cap you announce that they will at your command pass under the cap from which the die will disappear to make room for them saying one two three pass you open your hand and show that the coins have vanished if you use a regular table you may place them on the servante and show both hands empty and then lifting up the cap by the button you show the hollow pile covering the die and appearing to be the genuine coins once more covering the pile with the cap you announce that you will again extract the coins and replace the die and to make the trick still more extraordinary you will this time pass the coins right through the table placing the hand which holds the genuine coins beneath the table and once more saying one two three pass you chink the coins and bringing them up place them on the table again picking up the cap but this time pressing its sides you lift up the hollow pile with it and disclose the die quickly transfer the cap without the pile to the other hand and place it on the table to bear the brunt of examination while you get rid of the prepared coins the trick may be varied in many ways according to the ingenuity of the performer but it belongs at best to the juvenile school of conjuring and we have not thought it worth while to waste space in elaborating it the animated coin which answers questions etc this trick is performed in a variety of different ways some with apparatus some without the effect produced is as follows the performer borrows a coin and after making a few mesmeric passes over it drops it into a glass upon the table where it immediately begins to jump about as if alive the performer then announces that the coin thus mesmerized has the power of fortune telling naming chosen cards predicting the number that will be thrown by a pair of dice etc the coin answers yes by jumping three times no by jumping once according to the approved spiritualistic code of signals we shall not stay to discuss the questions asked which are of the same class as those which are generally put to the magic bell or drum but proceed at once to explain the various modes of producing the movement of the coin one plan is for the performer to have a coin of his own to which is attached a long black silk thread the other end of which is in the hand of the assistant behind the scenes or elsewhere out of sight of the audience this coin is placed on the table in readiness but concealed from the spectators by some larger object in front of it when the performer advances to the table with the borrowed coin he secretly picks up the prepared one and drops the latter into the glass as being that which he has borrowed a short quick jerk of the thread by the assistant will make the coin spring up and fall back again producing the required chink it is only necessary to be careful not to jerk the thread so violently as to make the coin fly out of the glass it is desirable where practicable to make the thread pass either through a hole in the top of the table or a ring fixed to its surface and placed immediately behind the glass this will keep that portion of the thread nearest to the glass perpendicular behind it in which position it will be completely hidden by the glass and so be invisible some performers prefer to use the actual coin borrowed the arrangements in this case are the same as above described save that the silk thread instead of having a substitute coin attached to it has merely a pellet of wax at its end the performer having handed round the glass for inspection 
and standing in front of the table with his left side turned towards the audience picks up a pellet of wax with his right hand at the same moment that holding the borrowed coin in his left hand he begs the spectators to take especial notice that he really uses the borrowed coin and no other having said this he transfers the coin by a perfectly natural movement to his right hand and pressing against it the waxen pellet drops it into the glass the third and last mode of performing the trick is by means of a special glass with a hole drilled through its foot this is placed on a suitable pedestal in which works up and down a steel needle forming the upper portion of a kind of loose piston the top of the pedestal is covered with green baize allowing free passage of the needle which when pushed upward strikes the coin from below with much the same effect as the thread pulling it from above this pedestal is only available with one of the mechanical tables which will be described in connection with stage tricks such tables contain among other contrivances what are called pistons being small metal rods which by pulling a string are made to rise vertically an inch or so above the surface of the table sinking down again as soon as the cord is released the pedestal is placed immediately above one of these whose movement is in turn communicated to the loose piston in the pedestal and thence to the coin it only remains to be stated how the necessary knowledge for the answers is communicated to the person who controls the movements of the piece with respect to chosen cards the cards are either indicated by the wording of the questions or are agreed on beforehand the performer taking care to force the right ones the assistant is enabled to predict the throw of the dice by the simple expedient of using a small boxwood vase in which there are two compartments in one of which a pair of dice apparently the same which have just been dropped in haphazard from the top have been arranged beforehand for the purpose of the trick the ordinary fortune telling questions as to which young lady will be married first which spends most time at her looking-glass which has most sweethearts and so on are either answered in accordance with previous arrangement or according to the fancy of the moment of course where a question of this kind is asked the performer takes care to follow up the question by designating a number of persons in succession so that a mere yes or no answer may be a sufficient answer we shall next proceed to describe three or four pieces of apparatus designed to cause a piece of money to disappear and therefore well adapted for commencing a coin trick there are other appliances more particularly adapted for reproducing a coin any of these will be available for the conclusion the particular combination being at the option of the performer the vanishing halfpenny box to make a halfpenny vanish from the box and again return to it this is a little round box made of boxwood about an inch deep and of such diameter that its internal measurement exactly admits a half penny in other words that if a half penny be placed in it it exactly covers the bottom the top and bottom of the box are lined with some bright colored paper and with it is used a half penny one side of which is covered with similar paper if therefore this half penny be placed in the box with the paper side upwards the half penny is naturally taken to be the bottom of the box which thus appears empty the performer begins by tendering the box for examination keeping the while the prepared half penny palmed in his right hand when the box has been sufficiently inspected he borrows a half penny from the audience and secretly exchanges it for his own taking care that the spectators only see the unprepared side of the latter he then announces that this box apparently so simple has the singular faculty of causing the disappearance of any money entrusted to its keeping as they will perceive when he places in it the half penny he has just borrowed he places the half penny in it accordingly holding it with the uncovered side towards the audience but letting it so fall that it shall lie in the box with the papered side upwards he now puts the lid on and shakes the box up and down to show by the rattling of the coin that it is still there he desires the audience to say 
when they would wish the coin to leave the box and on receiving their command touches the lid with his wand and again shakes the box this time however he shakes it laterally and as in this direction the coin exactly fits the box it has no room to rattle and is therefore silent he boldly asserts that the coin is gone and opening the box shows the inside to the spectators who seeing as they suppose the papered bottom are constrained to admit that it is empty once again he closes the box and touches it with the wand announcing that he will compel the coin to return shaking the box up and down it is again heard to rattle taking off the lid he turns the box upside down and drops the coin into his hand this brings it out with the papered side undermost and so hidden again handing the box to be examined he exchanges the prepared halfpenny for the one which was lent to him and which he now returns to the owner with thanks a variation may be introduced by causing the borrowed halfpenny to reappear in some other apparatus after it has vanished from the box in question the borrowed coin may if desired be marked in order to heighten the effect of the trick the rattle box to make a coin vanish from the box though still heard to rattle within it this is a useful and ingenious little piece of apparatus it is an oblong mahogany box with a sliding lid its dimensions are about three inches by two and one inch in depth externally internally it is only half that depth and the end piece of the lid is of such a depth as to be flush with the bottom thus if a coin be placed in the box and the box held in such a position as to slant downwards to the opening the coin will of its own weight fall into the hand that holds the box thus giving the performer possession of it without the knowledge of the audience between the true and the false bottom of the box is placed a slip of zinc which when the box is shaken laterally moves from side to side exactly simulating the sound of a coin shaken in the box in its normal condition however this slip of zinc is held fast and therefore kept silent by the action of a spring also placed between the two bottoms but is released for the time being by a pressure on a particular part of the outer bottom the part in contact with the fingers a casual inspection of the box suggests nothing save perhaps that its internal space is somewhat shallow in proportion to its external measurement the mode of using it is as follows the performer invites any person to mark a coin and to place it in the box which he holds for that purpose as represented in the figure and the coin is thus no sooner placed in the box than it falls into his hand transferring the box to the other hand and pressing the spring he shakes it to show by the sound that the coin is still there then leaving the box on the table he prepares for the next phase of the trick by secretly placing the coin which the audience believed to be still in the box in any other apparatus in which he desires it to be found or make such other disposition of it as may be necessary having done this and having indicated the direction in which he is about to command the coin to pass he once more shakes the box to show that it is still in statu quo then with the mystic word pass he opens the box which is found empty and shows that his commands have been obeyed the pepper box for vanishing money this is a small tin box of the pepper box or flower dredger's shape standing three to four inches high the box portion as distinguished from the lid is made double consisting of two tin tubes sliding the one within the other the bottom being soldered to the inner one only by pulling the bottom downwards therefore you draw down with it the inner tube telescope fashion by doing so you bring into view a slit or opening at one side of the inner tube level with the bottom and of such a size as to let a coin say a two shilling piece pass through it easily the lid is also specially prepared it has an inner or false top and between the true and false top a loose bit of tin is introduced which rattles when the box is shaken 
unless you at the same time press a little point of wire projecting from one of the holes at the top and so render it for the time being silent the box is first exhibited with the inner tube pushed up into its place and the opening thereby concealed a marked coin is borrowed but either before or after the coin is placed therein as may best suit his purpose the performer secretly draws out the inner tube a quarter of an inch or so thus allowing the coin to slip through into his hand as he places the box on the table a very slight pressure suffices to force the tube up again into its original position and close the opening having made the necessary disposition of the coin the performer takes up the box and shakes it to show apparently that the coin is still there pressing on the little point above mentioned when he desires it to appear that it has departed and immediately opening the box to show that it is empty the pepper box will not bear minute inspection and is in this particular inferior to the rattle box end of section 21section 22 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ashley jane modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor louis hoffman section 22 tricks with coin requiring special apparatus part two the brass money box for the same purpose this is on a similar principle to that of the pepper box but has no rattle movement and is not adapted for any coin of larger size than a shilling its shape will be best understood from an examination of the diagrams it has no movable lid but merely a slit in the top just large enough to admit the coin which when once dropped in cannot be got out again without a knowledge of the secret this like the pepper box consists of two tubes one within the other but the inner tube is firmly soldered to the two end pieces a and b which are solid the only movable portion is the outer tube c which is so arranged as to slide upwards within a for about an eighth of an inch thereby disclosing the opening of the inner tube and allowing the coin to slip through figure eighty seven represents the box with the slit open and figure eighty six with it closed some little practice is required to use the money box with dexterity the performer should hold it tightly in the middle between the finger and thumb of his right hand taking care that the side on which the secret opening is shall be toward the inside of his hand as he drops the coin through the slit he should press lightly on the top with the fingers of the left hand and at the same time push a upwards with the right hand the coin will now slip through into his hand while the slight downward pressure as he replaces the box on the table will again push down c and make it all close as before if the performer prefers to use one hand only he should press downward on the top with the first finger at the same time pressing upwards with the second finger and thumb there are various ways of using this little apparatus it may either be used as above as a means of surreptitiously gaining possession of a coin to be afterwards produced in some other apparatus or it may be used by itself singly the coin being made apparently to fall through the bottom at the will of the performer it may also be used as a puzzle its secret being so well concealed that it will bear a very minute examination without discovery the brass box for money known as the plug box this is a piece of apparatus so ingenious in construction and capable of being used in so many different ways that we should recommend the student of magic to make it one of his first investments it is about three inches in height and one and a half in diameter and is composed of four separate parts 
see figure 88 in which a represents the outside or body of the box being in reality a mere brass tube open at both ends with a movable bottom b which fits tightly in the end of a appearing when in its place to be a fixture and to form with a one complete whole a has no lid properly so called, but is closed by inserting it in what appears to be a solid brass plug or piston. This plug, however, though in appearance solid, also consists of two parts, the plug proper, C, which is really solid, and a brass sheath, D, exactly fitting it as to its diameter, but a quarter of an inch longer, thus leaving when C is placed in D and pushed home a hollow space at the bottom of D capable of containing a florin or half crown. The sheath D is of precisely the same length as A and is so made as to fit easily upon C but tightly within A. When the plug box is exhibited to the audience, the bottom B is in its proper place and C, which is shown apart from A, is covered with its sheath, D. There being nothing in its appearance to point to any other conclusion, the spectators naturally believe the apparatus consists of those two parts only. If now the plug be placed within the box and pushed home, the movable bottom, B, will be pressed out and fall into the hand of the performer. On again withdrawing the plug, the sheath, D, which is already mentioned, fits more tightly within A than upon C, is left within A. The bottom of D, which becomes exactly flush with the lower edge of A, now appearing to be the bottom of the latter. To the eyes of the audience, the box is exactly as they saw it at first, and it may even be examined pretty freely, with little risk of its secret being discovered by anyone. The plug box may be used in a variety of different ways. To vanish, reproduce or exchange. For the first purpose, the coin to be got rid of is dropped into A. When the plug is inserted and pressed home, the coin falls with B into the hand of the performer. And on the plug being again withdrawn, nothing is seen but the interior of D which is of course empty. Where it is desired to use the box for the purpose of reproducing a coin, such coin is placed beforehand within D. The box is first shown empty, but has only to be closed and reopened, and the coin is found within it. For exchanges, the substitute is placed in D, and the genuine coin in A. This latter falls out with the bottom, and the substitute is in due course discovered. A half-crown may thus be changed to a penny or a sovereign to a shilling, but the chief use of the plug-box is as an auxiliary in those more important tricks in which the coin, apparently remaining up to the last moment in the spectator's own possession, is suddenly made to appear in some quarter to which, if it had really so remained, it could not possibly have been transported by natural means. The performer in this case places a similar coin beforehand in D. Dropping or allowing the owner to drop the marked coin into A, he closes the box, which he shakes to prove that the coin is really there. Giving the box to someone to hold, he is then enabled, without exciting the smallest suspicion, to retire and make what disposition he pleases of the marked coin, which he has thus got into his own possession. When he has completed his arrangements, he again takes the box and, opening it, takes out the substitute which the audience naturally to believe to be the genuine coin, and getting rid of this by sleight of hand, or otherwise, passes the coin at that very moment, so far as the audiences can judge, to the place where it is ultimately destined to be found. A favourite mode of using the plug box is as follows. A coin, say a florin, is wrapped in a small piece of paper, after which the coin is taken out and the paper again folded in such a manner as to retain the impression of the coin, and so to look as far as possible, as if still containing it. The paper thus folded is placed beforehand, 
in D, and the performer, borrowing a florin, requests the owner to wrap it carefully in a piece of paper, which he hands him for the purpose, and which is similar in size and general appearance to the folded piece. The florin, thus wrapped up, is placed in A, and the box closed, the performer thus gaining possession of paper and coin. The box is then handed to the owner of the money, who is asked to open it and see for himself that his money is still there. Seeing the folded paper, which he takes to be the same in which his money was wrapped, he answers in the affirmative. The box is again closed, the coin meanwhile being disposed of according to the pleasure of the operator. The owner, finding on a closer examination that his money has departed from the box, though the paper in which it was wrapped, as he imagines, still remains. The handkerchief for vanishing money. This is another appliance for vanishing a coin. It is an ordinary handkerchief of silk or cotton, in one corner of which, in a little pocket, is sewn a coin, say a florin or a penny, or any substitute which felt through the substance of the handkerchief shall appear to be such a coin. The mode of using it is very simple. Holding the handkerchief by the corner in which is the coin and letting it hang loosely down, the performer borrows a similar coin and, after carelessly shaking out the handkerchief to show that all is fair, he places, to all appearance, the borrowed coin in the centre, underneath, and gives the handkerchief to someone to hold. In reality, he has only wrapped up the corner containing the substitute coin and retains the genuine one for his own purposes. When it is desirable to make it appear that the coin has left the handkerchief, he simply takes it from the person holding it and gives it a shake, at the same moment rapidly running the edges of the handkerchief through his hands till the corner containing the coin comes into one or the other of them. The Demon Handkerchief Le Moudrois du Diable. This is a recent improvement on the above and possesses a much wider range of utility inasmuch as it really does cause the disappearance of any article placed under it and is available to vanish not only coin but a card, an egg, a watch or any other article of moderate size. It consists of two handkerchiefs of the same pattern, stitched together all round the edges and with a slit of about four inches in length cut in the middle of one of them. The whole space between the two handkerchiefs thus forms a kind of pocket, of which the slit above mentioned is the only opening. In shaking or otherwise manipulating the handkerchief, the performer takes care always to keep the side with the slit away from the spectators, to whom the handkerchief appears to be merely the ordinary article of everyday use. When he desires by its means to cause the disappearance of anything, he carelessly throws the handkerchief over the article, at the same time secretly passing the latter through the slit in the underside and hands it thus covered to someone to hold. Then, taking the handkerchief by one corner, he requests him to let go when the object is retained in the space between the two handkerchiefs appearing to have vanished into empty air. This, like the plug box, is an appliance which no conjurer should be without. It may be purchased ready-made at any of the depots for magical apparatus, or may be of home manufacture, which in this case, contrary to the general rule, is not unlikely to produce the better article. The Davenport Cabinet. This little cabinet must by no means be confounded with the wardrobe in which the notorious brothers performed their mystic evolutions. The cabinet now in question is but four inches high and two and a half square and consists of two parts, an outer case or body covered at the top but otherwise open throughout and a drawer occupying the upper portion of its interior space. When the drawer is removed, the case, which has no bottom, may be examined throughout and will be found to be perfectly plain and unsophisticated, 
save that a keen examiner might observe a little brass pin a quarter of an inch long projecting from the back of the cabinet on the inside just on a level with the bottom of the drawer when replaced in its proper position the drawer may also be examined and will be found to be perfectly plain with the bottom which is so thin as to preclude any suspicion of a concealed space covered within and without with black cloth on turning the drawer round and examining the back, a minute hole may be discovered corresponding in situation with the brass pin already mentioned. If a pin be thrust into this hole, the purpose of the two is immediately manifest, for the pressure of the pin releases a tiny catch and allows the bottom of the drawer, which is in reality only supported by this catch at the back, and a cloth hinge in the front to drop into the position indicated in figure 90. This is precisely what takes place when the drawer, being restored to its proper position in the cabinet, is duly closed. The pressure of the brass pin at the back releases the catch and the bottom of the drawer falls as just described and allows any article which may have been placed therein to drop into the hand of the person holding the cabinet. The act of pulling out the drawer again presses the bottom up to its proper place, where it is secured by the catch until once more released by the pressure of the pin. The strong point of this ingenious little apparatus is that it is absolutely self-acting and its secret can only be detected by examining the cabinet from below at the moment when the drawer is pushed home. And this it is easy to prevent by the simple expedient of handing each portion separately for inspection. The performer begins by handing first the cabinet and then the drawer for examination. Then, placing the cabinet on the palm of his hand, he invites any one of the audience to deposit any small article, a coin, a ring, a watch, etc., in the drawer, and to replace the drawer in the cabinet. As soon as the drawer is closed, the article drops through into his hand. Taking hold of the cabinet with the other hand, lifting it by the top only, and with the very tips of his fingers, so as to preclude all apparent possibility of deception, he places it on the table, or elsewhere, in full view. Having thus gained possession of the borrowed article, he concludes the trick by reproducing it in any manner he thinks proper. We have thus far discussed pieces of apparatus more especially designed to cause the disappearance of a coin and thus adapted for use in the first stage of a trick. We shall next consider such as are intended to reproduce, under more or less surprising circumstances, the coin thus got rid of, such reproduction forming the second stage, or denouement. The nest of boxes. This consists of a number generally six, but sometimes more, of circular wooden boxes, one within the other, the largest or outer box having much the appearance, but being nearly double the size, of an ordinary tooth powder box, and the smallest being just large enough to contain a shilling. The series is so accurately made that by arranging the boxes in due order, one within the other, and the lids in like manner, you may, by simply putting on all the lids together, close all the boxes at once, though they can only be opened one by one. These are placed, the boxes together and the lids together, anywhere so as to be just out of sight of the audience. If on your table they may be hidden by any more bulky article. Having secretly obtained possession by either of the means before described of a coin which is ostensibly deposited in some other piece of apparatus e.g. the Davenport cabinet you seize your opportunity to drop it into the innermost box and to put it on the united lids you then bring forward the nest of boxes which the spectators naturally take to be one box only and announce that the shilling will at your command pass from the place in which it has been deposited into the box which you hold in your hand and which you forthwith deliver to one of the audience for safe-keeping. 
Touching both articles with the mystic wand, you invite inspection of the first to show that the money has departed, and then of the box wherein it is to be found. The holder opens the box and finds another and then another, and in the innermost of all the marked coin. Seeing how long the several boxes have taken to open, the spectators naturally infer that they must take as long to close, and, apart from the other mysteries of the trick, are utterly at a loss to imagine how, with the mere moment of time at your command, you could have managed to insert the coin and close so many boxes. If you desire to use the nest for a coin larger than a shilling, you can make it available for that purpose by removing beforehand the smallest box. Nests of square boxes with hinged lids and self-closing locks are made, both in wood and in tin, on the same principle. These are designed for larger articles and greatly vary in size and price. The Ball of Berlin Wool an easy and effective mode of terminating a money trick is to pass the marked coin into the centre of a large ball of Berlin wool or worsted, the whole of which has to be unwound before the coin can be reached. The modus operandi, though perplexing to the uninitiated, is absurdly simple when the secret is revealed. The only apparatus necessary over and above the wool, of which you must have enough for a good-sized ball, is a flat tin tube, three to four inches in length, and just large enough to allow a florin or shilling, whichever you intend to use for the trick, to slip through it easily. You prepare for the trick by winding the wool on one end of the tube, in such manner that when the whole is wound in a ball, an inch or so of the tube may project from it. This you place in your pocket, or anywhere out of sight of the audience. You commence the trick by requesting someone to mark a coin, which you forthwith exchange by one or other of the means already described for a substitute of your own, and leave the latter in the possession or in view of the spectators, while you retire to fetch your ball of wool or simply take it from your pocket. Before producing it, you drop the genuine coin down the tube into the centre of the ball and withdraw the tube, giving the ball a squeeze to remove all trace of an opening. You then bring it forward and place it in a glass goblet or tumbler, which you hand to a spectator to hold. Taking the substitute coin, you announce that you will make it pass invisibly into the very centre of the ball of wool, which you accordingly pretend to do, getting rid of it by means of one or other of the passes described in chapter 6. You then request a second spectator to take the loose end of the wool and to unwind the ball, which when he has done, the coin falls out into the goblet. The only drawback to the trick is the tediousness of the process of unwinding. To obviate this, some performers use a wheel made for the purpose, which materially shortens the length of the operation. The glass goblet and cover. This apparatus consists of an ordinary glass goblet of rather large size with a japanned tin cover in shape not unlike the lid of a coffee pot but of sufficient height to contain, in an upright position, a couple of florins or half-crowns. These are placed side by side in a flat tube, just large enough to admit to them, fixed in a slightly sloping position in the upper part of the cover and divided in two by a tin partition. Across the lower end of this tube is a tin slide, which in its normal condition is kept closed by the action of a spring, but is drawn back whenever a knob on the top of the cover is pressed down. If a slight pressure be applied, one coin only is released, but if the knob be still further pressed down, the second also falls. The mechanism of the cover is concealed by a flat plate or lining, also of tin, soldered just within it, with an oblong opening just large enough to admit of the passage of the coins. 
The inside of the cover is japanned black, the outside according to the taste of the maker. You take care not to bring on the goblet and cover until you have, by substitution, gained possession of the two marked coins which you have borrowed for the purpose of the trick. Retiring to fetch the glass and cover, you prepare the latter by inserting the marked coins. This you do by holding the cover upside down, pressing the knob, thus drawing back the spring slide and dropping the coins into their receptacle. On removing the pressure on the knob, the slide returns to its normal position. You then bring forward the goblet and cover and place them on the table. Holding the goblet upside down to show that it is empty, you place the cover over it, ostensibly to prevent anything being secretly passed into it and for still greater security throw a handkerchief, borrowed for that purpose, over the hole. You now announce that, notwithstanding the difficulties which you have voluntarily placed in the way, you will pass the two marked coins through the handkerchief and through the metal cover into the glass. Taking in your right hand one of the substitutes, which have all along remained in sight and which the audience take to be the genuine coins, you pretend by pass one to transfer it to your left and pressing gently on the knob with the last mentioned hand cause one of the marked coins to drop from the cover at the same moment opening the hand to show that the coin has left it the audience hear though they do not see the fall of the coin with the second coin it is well to introduce an element of variety and you may therefore offer to dispense with the handkerchief that all may see as well as hear the coin arrive as a further variation, you may use your wand as the conducting medium. Taking the substitute coin in the left hand, you apparently, by pass four, transfer it to your right. Then taking the wand in the left hand, you hold it perpendicularly, with its lower end resting upon the knob of the cover. Holding it with the thumb and second finger of the right hand, one on each side of it, you draw them smartly downwards, at the same time pressing with the wand on the knob, when the second coin will be seen and heard to fall into the glass. Taking off the cover and leaving it on the table, you bring forward the glass and allow the owners to take out and identify the coins. It is a great addition to have a second cover, similar in appearance to the first, but hollow throughout and without any mechanism. You are thus enabled to hand both goblet and cover for examination before performing the trick. As you return to your table, your back being toward the spectators, you have ample opportunity for substituting the mechanical cover, the plain one being dropped either into one of your profondes or onto the servant of your table. The glass without cover for money. This is of tumbler shape, without foot, and of green or other dark coloured glass, so that it is semi opaque. In this instance, no cover is used, and the borrowed coins are not seen, but merely heard to drop into the glass where they are found in due course. The secret of the glass lies in a false bottom of tin working on a hinge and held down by a catch worked by a pin through the bottom of the glass and flying up with a spring when released. The performer, having gained possession of three or four borrowed coins by either of the means before mentioned, retires to fetch the glass and takes the opportunity to place the coins beneath the false bottom. He then comes forward, glass in hand. He does not offer the glass for examination, but turns it upside down and rattles his wand inside it, showing, ostensibly, that it is empty. Having done this, he places it on his table, as near the back of the stage as possible, at the same time moving the catch and so releasing the false bottom, which naturally flies up and uncovers the concealed coins. Standing at a considerable distance from the glass, he takes one by one the substitutes which to the eye of the audience represent the genuine coins and gets rid of them by one or other of the various passes, 
saying as each one apparently vanishes from his hand, one, two, three, pass. At the same moment the sound of a falling coin is heard, proceeding apparently from the glass, but really from behind the scenes or any other available spot out of sight where an assistant, placed as near to the glass as circumstances will admit, drops another coin into another glass. If the position of the assistant, with reference to the audience, is pretty nearly in a straight line, with the glass which they see, the illusion will be perfect. When all the coins are supposed to have passed in this manner, the performer, advancing to the glass, pours out, either upon a tray or upon his open palm, the borrowed coins, and leaving the glass upon the table, comes forward and requests the owners to identify them. End of section 22. Recording by Ashley Jane.